Chapter 19, Section 1 of J. B. Beery's The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2 by John Buniel Beery. Chapter 19 The Principate of Galba and the Year of the Four Emperors. Section 1 galba and piso it has been already explained that with the death of a princeps the principate ceases until a successor is duly elected this constitutional principle was exhibited in an unusually clear light at the death of nero for the interval the interprincipate so to speak lasted seven days and the circumstances were unprecedented hitherto the state had been practically though not theoretically, the inheritance, as it were, of one family. But Nero had neither begotten nor adopted a son, and at his death there was no one belonging to the Julian or Claudian family to claim the allegiance of the Praetorian guards and the suffrages of the Senate. Consequently, there arose many pretenders to the Principate, and there may have been even some thoughts of restoring the Republic though this was hardly seriously contemplated. It was a moment, at least, when people talked much of the Senate and the Roman people, but the actual decision lay in the hands of the armies. But the armies were not at one, and the result was a series of civil wars, in the course of which four emperors rapidly succeeded one another within the space of less than a year. The Praetorian soldiers had declared for Galba, and to him most eyes in Rome and probably in Italy looked. Having equipped himself for a contest of whose issue he despaired, Galba was waiting at Clunia in Terraconensis, supported by the councils of Otho, Titus Vinius, and Cornelius Laco. His freedman, Icelus, who was acting in his interests at Rome, arrived with the news of Nero's death, seven days after the event, and Galba assumed the title of Caesar. The creation of an emperor in the provinces was a new departure, and it served to give men a glimpse into the real conditions on which the empire depended. A secret of the empire was revealed, according to a famous saying of Tacitus, that a princeps could be made elsewhere than at Rome. The progress of the new princeps to Rome was slow and stained with bloodshed. He was recognized by the Senate, who sent a deputation which met him at Narbo Marshes, but rival candidates for the supreme powers sprang up on all sides, some formidable, others insignificant. The pretenders who arose in Spain and Gaul were easily disposed of, but more formidable were the pretensions of Fonteius Capito, the legatus of Lower Germany, and of Claudius Masser, the governor of Africa. Masser professedly aimed at restoring the Republic and issued coins with the inscription Pro Praetore in the Republican style. He was killed by the imperial procurator at Galba's instigation. Capito was slain by some of his officers who supported Galba, but without Galba's orders. The army of Upper Germany regarded with hostility the emperor who had been elevated in Spain and still desired to elevate their own general, Virginius Rufus, but he persisted in his refusal. Galba, however, fearing his popularity with the army, summoned him to his presence, and forced him to accompany him to Rome. Meanwhile, the Praetorian prefect, Nymphidius Sabinus, made an attempt to seize the empire for himself. He supported his claim by pretending to be an illegitimate son of the emperor Gaius but he miscalculated his influence with the Praetorians, who swore fidelity to Galba, and he was cut to pieces. The chief supporter of Nymphidius was the consul-designate, Syngonius Varro, and he was put to death by Galba's order. The slaughter of Petronius Terpilianus was also commended, without any form of trial, because Nero had appointed him commander of his forces. When Galba approached Rome in October, he was met at the Milvian Bridge by marine soldiers who had been enrolled by Nero. 
Galba seems to have regarded them as enemies, and ordered his soldiers to charge them, and enter the city over their bodies. Thus the path of the new emperor was stained with blood. Servius Sulpicius Galba was a man of family and wealth. The Senate had reason to see in his elevation the prospect of a return to constitutional government. There is evidence to show that he wished to model his policy on that of Augustus, but he was not strong enough to hold his own. His talents were of very mediocre quality, and he has been described as rather free from vices than distinguished by virtues. He cared little for fame, nor was he grasping, though he was parsimonious to a fault. He was much under the influence of his friends and freedmen, and in difficulties depended on the advice of others more than on himself. His apparent wisdom was often mere indolence, but he was not equal to the greatness which was perhaps thrust upon him. All, says Tacitus, would have agreed that he was fitted for empire if he had not been an emperor. His short principate is marked by a succession of blunders. In the first place, his policy in Gaul had been unwise. He identified his own cause with the abortive revolt of Vindex, and while he rewarded those cities which had joined in that movement, he punished Lugdunum, the Treveri, the Lingonis, and other communities which had remained faithful to Nero. This policy alienated the Germanic legions. In Rome, the severity of Galba, and especially his treatment of the marine soldiers, produced a bad impression, and his strict ideas of discipline were not popular. He alienated the Praetorian guards by refusing to give them the donative which Nymphidius had promised in his name. Nero had left an empty treasury, and the financial measures which Galba resorted to were very ill-advised. On the one hand, he remitted a tax of two and a half per cent, of which the nature is unknown. But on the other, he made an attempt to force those who had profited by Nero's liberality to disgorge their booty. He appointed a commission to exact from those who had received presents from Nero nine-tenths of the amount. But as most of these persons had spent their fortunes as lightly as they had gained them, the commission had very little result for its labors. Then Galba commanded that application should be made to those who had received any money from the favorites of Nero, an absurd measure which led to endless lawsuits. And besides being unprofitable, this policy was injurious, for it created many enemies to the emperor. Moreover, the parsimony of Galba verged on meanness, and was unfavorably contrasted with the open-handedness of his predecessor. It was rendered all the more glaring by the rapacity of the three men on whose counsels he leaned, Venius, Laco, and Icelus. He had appointed Laco Praetorian prefect, and he had raised his freedman Icelus to equestrian rank. Vinius was designated as his colleague in the consulship for the year 69. These three exerted such an influence over Galba that they were called his three pedagogues. Another circumstance which increased the dissatisfaction with Galba was that he spared Tigellinus, for whose slaughter Rome was clamoring. The freedmen, who had been the intimate advisers of Nero, were put to death, but Vinius who was betrothed to the daughter of Tigellinus, a widow with a large fortune, exerted his influence to save him. Soon after the 1st of January, 69 A.D., the disquieting news of a mutiny in the army of Upper Germany reached Rome. Galba had replaced Virginius by Hordionius Flaccus, an old general who was incapable of maintaining discipline. Galba was in a difficulty. He had no forces which he could trust to oppose this movement. The Praetorians were lukewarm. The Spanish legion, the 7th Galbiana, had been sent to Pannonia, and he had dismissed the German bodyguard of his predecessor. There were some divisions of Germanic and Illyric legions temporarily stationed at Rome, but they were small and uncertain. Galba was decided by his advisers to adopt a consort in the empire. 
this course might satisfy the wishes of the German army, who clamored for a new imperator. Two names were proposed as candidates for association in the Principate. Vinius supported the claims of Otto, but Laco, who always opposed Vinius, and Icellus, recommended Piso Licinianus. The consultations of this Comitia of the Imperium ended in the choice of Piso. He was of ancient lineage and high character, but he was unpopular, and under the circumstances his choice was a mistake. He was adopted under the name Servius Sulpicius Galba Caesar on January the 10th, but the measure did not in the least tend to conciliate the soldiery. When the old emperor announced his choice to the praetorians in a storm of rain and thunder, and appealed to the example of Augustus, who had in a like way associated with himself Agrippa and Tiberius, the soldiers maintained a sullen silence. Only the officers and the front ranks uttered the acclamations which made Piso an imperator. On this occasion, Galba might have retrieved his first mistake of not giving a donative, but on this point he was obstinate. In the Senate, Piso's election was received with approbation. But while this measure of Galba failed in its intended effect, it stirred up against him an active enemy in the person of Marcus Salvius Otto, who had supported Galba from the first, and was indignant that Piso was preferred to himself. He had been embittered by the long years of exile in Lusitania, to which Nero had condemned him. He was weary of restraint, he was deeply involved in debt, and was ready to risk his life unsparingly for the chance of sovereignty. Moreover, he was afraid of the jealousy of Piso, and his ambitious plans were fostered by soothsayers and astrologers to whose influence he was subject. The enterprise, too, seemed hopeful owing to the general dissatisfaction with the government of Galba. Those who were beginning to regret the golden days of Nero might hope for their revival under the rule of the luxurious Otho. The guards were easily corrupted by two of their number, who had embraced the cause of Otto. Two manipulators, says Tacitus, undertook to transfer the empire of the Roman people, and they did transfer it. The decisive moment came on the morning of the 15th of January. Galba was sacrificing before the temple of Apollo on the Palatine, and the omens were inauspicious, portending, the Arispic said, a foe in his own household. Otto was standing by, when a freedman announced to him, according to a preconcerted signal, that his engineer awaited him. The conspirator immediately descended through the house of Tiberius, on the northwest side of the Palatine, and made his way to the golden milestone in the Forum. Here he was met by twenty-three soldiers, who hailed him as imperator, placed him in a litter, and hurried him to the camp. Galba, meanwhile, was still importuning the gods of an empire no longer his, when the news of Otto's entry into the camp reached him. After much irresolution, it was decided that Piso should proceed Galba to the camp and attempt to quell the mutiny. Then a false report came that Otto had been slain, and the emperor no longer hesitated. Accompanied by a cohort and a large multitude of the populace, who had declared themselves on his side, he set out for the camp. Before he left the Palatine, a soldier ran up to him with a bloody sword, crying that he had killed Otto. Fellow soldier, said Galba, who ordered you? But there, in the meantime, Otto had been saluted imperator by the Praetorians, and the regiment of marine soldiers had also joined him. Otto armed the troops, and led them from the camp into the city to suppress the opposition of the populace and the senators. Galba and Piso had halted in the forum, uncertain whether to advance or to return to the palace. When the cohort which surrounded Galba perceived the advance of Otto's forces, the standard-bearer dashed the imago to the ground, thus showing that the soldiers sympathized with Otto. The people fled from the forum, the litter in which Galba was born was overturned near the pool of Curtius, and the emperor was hewn in pieces. 
the murder of Vinius followed, and Piso, who had sought refuge in the temple of Vesta, was dragged out and slain. The Senate did not delay to recognize the imperator whom the Praetorians had chosen. The title of Augustus was immediately conferred, and the tribunician power decreed. End of chapter 19, section 1《Chapter 19, Section 2 of J. B. Beery's The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2, by John Baniel Beery. Chapter 19, The Principate of Galba and the Year of the Four Emperors, Section 2. Otto and Vitellius. But a rival to Otto was already in the field. While these things were enacted at Rome, events of great moment were taking place in Germany. After the murder of Fonteius Capito, the legatus of Lower Germany, Galba had selected Aulus Vitellius to take his place. This Vitellius was the son of Lucius Vitellius, who had commanded in the east under Tiberius and been censored with Claudius. Aulus had gained the favor of Nero, had been proconsul and legatus in Africa, but was little fitted for the post for which Galba had chosen him. He was insignificant and good-natured, sensual and indolent. He had no ambition, but circumstances led him to the supreme power. The legions of both Lower and Upper Germany were discontented with the rule of Galba. They were jealous, because he had been created by the Spanish legion, and they did not see why they, too, should not make an imperator. The recall of Virginius had especially exasperated the troops of the upper province, and on the calends of January, the 4th and the 22nd legions at Mogontiacum had refused to take the oath of allegiance to Galba, and had placed themselves as Galba himself had done when he threw off the yoke of Nero at the disposal of the Senate and the Roman people. The governor, Gordionius, did not venture to interfere. But it was in the lower province that a candidate for the empire was found. On the same night, the news from Mogontiacum reached Vitellius, as he was supping at Colonia. He immediately sent messengers to the legions of his own province in their various quarters. First Germanica was stationed at Bona, fifth Alauda and fifteenth Primigenia at Vetera, and 16th Gallica at Novesium. On the next day, Fabius Valens, legatus of Legion I, arrived from Bona with some horse soldiers, and saluted Vitellius as imperator. On the following day, January the third, the upper army, which had not found a candidate of its own, abandoned the empty and high-sounding names of the Senate and the Roman people, and acknowledged Vitellius. The ardor of the troops was emulated by the provincials of Colonia, the Treveri, and the Lingones, whose city is now represented by Langres. Valerius Asiaticus, the legatus of Belgica, and Blessus, the governor of Gallia Lugdunensis, along with Legion I Italica, which properly belonged to Upper Germany, but was then stationed at Lugdunum, declared themselves for the new imperator. Vitellius himself was perhaps the least enthusiastic of all. He took little active part in the preparations for overthrowing Galba, and entrusted the conduct of his cause to his officers, especially to Aulus Cecina Alienus in the upper province, and Gaius Fabius Valens in the lower. Cecina was a young, strong, able, ambitious, and popular legatus. It was decided to advance upon Italy and Rome, and the armament was divided into three parts. Cecina, at the head of thirty-six thousand men, was to cross the Pennine Alps. Valens, with forty thousand, was to march through Gaul and penetrate by the Codian Pass, and both were to join their forces at Cremona. Vitalius, with the main body of the army, was to come slowly after. His presence was not required, for the troops were so excited that they needed no stimulus. The cause of Vitellius found great sympathy in those parts of Gaul which had declared against Vindex, 
and had been punished by Galba. The progress of Valens was marked by rapacity and military license. All the cities through which he passed were required to furnish a contribution to the expedition, and special severity was shown to places like Augustodunum and Vienna, which had found favor with Galba. Cecina's march lay through the highlands of the Helvetii, who resented the license of the soldiers. The natives were fierce, and the course of the army was marked by slaughter. The Helvetii were at length driven into their town Aventicum, and yielded only to the menace of a siege. But before the army of Vitellius reached Italy, the murder of Galba and accession of Otto had altered the position of affairs. Otto prepared to meet the armies of his rival, but he first made overtures to Vitellius, offering him a quiet and luxurious retreat if he retired from the field. If the decision had lain with Vitellius himself, this offer would probably have been accepted, but it really lay with the army, and the army had no intention of retreating. The question could only be decided by arms. Most of the western provinces declared for Vitellius, the three Gauls, Narbonensis, Rhetia, and Britain. Otto was recognized in Spain and Illyricum, but Spain soon deserted him, and then the west was entirely on the side of his rival. Thus Otto had the Praetorians and the four legions of Pannonia, Dalmatia, and Mysia to oppose to the forces of Vitellius. Besides this, he obtained the recognition of the eastern provinces of Egypt and Africa, though he could look for no active support from those quarters. It is highly probable that he would have come off victorious in the conflict which followed if he had acted with promptitude and entrusted the supreme military command to one competent general. He was no soldier himself, but he had at his disposal several able officers, such as Suetonius Paulinus, Maria Celsus, Vestricius Spirina. Instead of trusting them, he listened to the counsels of Licinius Proculus, the Praetorian prefect, who was inexperienced in warfare. And instead of hastening to occupy the passes of the Alps before the enemy reached the frontiers of Italy, he delayed in Rome. The position of Otto was a difficult one for a man who, like him, had little talent for ruling men. He was embarrassed by the veiled hostility of the senators, who regretted Galba, a man after their own heart, and while they were obliged to accept Otto, would have been pleased at his fall. Otto endeavored to conciliate them, and strictly observe their privileges, but in vain. And the difficulty was aggravated by the hostility of the Praetorians to the senators. On one occasion, a party of nobles, whom Otto was entertaining, were almost murdered by the soldiers who suspected them of a conspiracy against the emperor. The remarkable circumstance that no copper coinage was issued by the senate under Otto may be partly explained by the fact that he was not made Pontifex Maximus until March the ninth. The senate may have delayed until he received the full number of the imperial titles. The enthusiasm of the populace who greeted Otto as Nero and looked for a revival of Nero's liberal policy, did not tend to conciliate the senators. Otto even adopted the name Nero officially, but gave it up again in deference to the feelings of the senate. He sacrificed to Gelinus, whom Galba had spared, to the public hatred. The Praetorian soldiers were also a difficulty. They were conscious that Otto owed his position to them, and depended on their support as his best arm in the coming struggle. It was therefore impossible to oppose them or maintain strict discipline. He had placed himself in a false position at the beginning by allowing them to choose their own prefects. In the two months which elapsed between the accession of Otto and his departure from the city, there are few acts of general policy to record. Occupied with preparations for the war, he had little time for government. In Spain, the colonies of Hispalis and Emerita were strengthened. The province of Betica was increased in extent by the addition of some districts in the land beyond the strait. African Cappadocia received various privileges. 
an invasion of Mysia by the Roxolani, a Sarmatian tribe, was repelled, and the victorious officers were rewarded by Otto with high distinctions. In these measures, we can see the aim of Otto to strengthen his political position. The civil war began in March. The Republic had not been rent by domestic struggles. Italy had not been exposed to the disasters of warfare since the terrible years which followed the great Caesar's death. Men remembered Philippi, Mutina, and Perugia, and looked with horror to a repetition of such scenes. And the prospect was all the worse, as neither of the chiefs, for whom so much blood was to be shed, was worth fighting for. As candidates for the government of the Republic, both the dissolute Otto and the glutinous Vitalius were contemptible. They were instruments, it seemed, chosen by fate for the ruin of the state. But while Vitalius was torpid, Otto at least was active. When the time for action came, he threw off luxury, marched on foot, rough and unkempt, at the head of his troops, quite unlike himself. He set out from the city on the 14th of March, leaving his brother Titianus in charge at Rome, and forcing a number of senators, whom he feared to leave behind, to accompany him. The object of the Vitalians was to gain possession of Rome. Until their chief was recognized there by the people in the Senate, it was felt that he was only a pretender. The object of Otto was to prevent his enemy from crossing the Padus, the second defense of Italy, for the Alps, its first defense, had already been passed by Cecina. For this purpose, Anius Gallus and Vestricius Spirina had been sent on in advance, with a force consistent of five Praetorian courts, and the remainder of the Legio Classica, numbered first, which had escaped the sword of Galba, besides a corpse of two thousand gladiators. They expected to be reinforced by eight thousand men, sent forward from the four legions of Pannonia and Dalmatia, which were themselves following at leisure. Otto followed with the rest of the Praetorians, and a large number of marines. By his fleet, he commanded the west coast of Italy, and was assured of the adhesion of Corsica and Sardinia. A division of troops was sent to seize the district of the Maritime Alps and attack the province of Narbonensis. The procurator of the Maritime District attempted resistance, and the irritated soldiers vented their wrath on the town of Albentimillum, Ventimiglia. The cities of Narbonensis, especially Forum Julii, sent for aid to Valens, who was advancing to join Cecina. In the battles which ensued, the Vitellian party was worsted, but the Euthonians retreated to Albingonum, Albenga, an inland city of Liguria. The beginnings of the war in this quarter were prosperous for Otto. When Cecina entered Cisalpine Gaul, he had won the adhesion of a squadron of cavalry which was stationed in that region and known as the Alla Siliana. Along with it, the municipal towns of Mediolanum, Eporedia, Novaria, and Vercelli embraced the cause of Vitalius, and the invaders held most of the land between the Padus and the Alps. The communication between Rome and Illyricum, however, was uninterrupted. One of those corps of the Pannonian army, which had been sent on in advance, was captured by the Vitalians at Cremona, and some other divisions of the Ottonians were discomfited near to Sinem. But the first serious engagement took place at Placentia, which was defended by Vestricius Spirina. Cecina himself had crossed the river to capture it, but the assault, in the course of which a large amphitheatre outside the town was consumed by fire, was unsuccessful. Cecina was forced to retire to his camp near Cremona. Meanwhile, Anias Gallus was hastening to relieve Placentia, but on hearing that the enemy had been repelled, he took up a position at Betriacum, a place lying between Cremona and Mantua, and distant about two days' march from Verona. About the same time, the Ottonian corps of gladiators, under Marcius Masser, crossed over to the north bank of the Padus, near Cremona, and defeated a body of Italian auxiliaries. It was thought that this success should have been followed up. The commanders, Gallus, Suetonians, and Celsus, 
were severely criticized by their own party, and their fidelity to Otto was questioned. In consequence of these suspicions, the emperor was led to summon his brother Titianus from Rome and make him commander-in-chief. But before he arrived, the Ottonians achieved another success, which might have decided the war in their favor, but for the ill judgment or treachery of Suetonius Paulinus. This general, in Marius Celsus, had joined forces with Gaulus at Betriacum. Cicina, disgusted with his failure at Placentia, and anxious to gain a victory before the arrival of his colleague Valens, determined to bring on an action, and with this intent placed an ambush of picked auxiliaries in woods overhanging the Postumian Way, at a place called Locus Castorum, from a temple of Castor and Pollux, twelve miles from Cremona. Some cavalry were detached to events along the road, and lure the enemy to the spot. But the Ottonian generals got intelligence of this stratagem, and skillfully arranged a counter-stratagem. Gallus had been hurt by a fall from his horse. Accordingly, Celsus and Paulinus divided the command, Paulinus taking the infantry, and Celsus the cavalry. They drew up their army on this wise. Three Praetorian corps were placed in columns on the road itself, and formed the center of the array. On the left were posted the advanced body, two thousand strong, of the thirteenth legion from Pannonia, with five auxiliary cords and five hundred cavalry. On the right stood the first classica, with two auxiliary cords, and likewise five hundred cavalry. A body of a thousand picked horsemen was placed in reserve. When the Vitalians, according to their plan, pretended to retreat, in order to draw their opponents into the ambuscade, Celsus kept his men from advancing too far, and when the ambushed troops, sure of success, rushed out, he gradually retreated and drew them on into the snare which had been prepared for them. When Celsus and his cavalry, hotly pursued by the enemy, reached the three Praetorian courts stationed on the Via Postumia, the legionary soldiers, who were right and left of the via, advanced and closed up in front, so as to oppose a continuous line to the pursuers. At the same time, the auxiliary corps on both sides were pushed forward, so as to take the battalions in the flanks. Finally, the reserve body of cavalry was dispatched to ride round and come on them in the rear, so that they were completely enclosed in the well-contrived snare. But Suetonius, for whatever reason, did not act with sufficient promptitude. He wasted time in preliminaries, and did not give the signal to the infantry to attack, until many of the battalions had time to seek refuge in the vineyards adjacent to the road, where it was impossible to use the pila freely. But when the infantry of Suetonius at length attacked, they carried all before them. Cecina brought up his cords one by one, and each by itself was too weak to withstand the assault of the Ottonians. Cecina and his whole army, it was said, might have been annihilated, if Suetonius had not sounded a retreat, and hindered his troops from attempting to carry the enemy's camp at Cremona. Some suspected him of treachery. Valens had already arrived at Ticinum, and soon after this defeat pushed on to join forces with Cecina at Cremona. Meanwhile, Otto came himself to Betriacum and held a council of war. Suetonius, Gallus, and Marius Celsus were of opinion that a general engagement should not be risked until the arrival of the Illyric legions, which, in discipline and valor, were a match for the troops of the Rhine. But Otto could not endure to wait longer for the decision of his fate, and Titianus and Proculus, who perhaps thought more of his wishes than his interests, voted for immediate action. Otto then retired to Brixellum, Reselo, and the army, which was now commanded nominally by Titianus, but really by Proculus, advanced westward from Betriacum and encamped four miles near Cremona. The ultimate strategical object seems to have been to reach the confluence of the Padus and the Adua, two hours west of Cremona, so as to sever the communication between that city and Ticinum. Yet it is hardly credible 
that even Titianus would have conceived anything so rash as a flank march past the enemy stationed at Cremona. The messages of Otto, who was growing more and more impatient, induced his brother, notwithstanding the remonstrances of the more experienced generals, to advance further in the direction of the enemy. Meanwhile, the Vitalians had been occupied in building a bridge across the Padus, near the mouth of the Adua. Marcius Masser, with his gladiators, had endeavored to prevent them, and a struggle had taken place for the possession of an island in midstream, in which the gladiators were worsened by Batavian troops. They blamed Masser for this discomfigure, and he was with difficulty rescued from their vengeance. Flavius Sabinus was appointed in his steed, with a general command over the Ottonian forces south of the river. On the 15th of April, Cecina, who had been hurrying on the building of the bridge, returned to Cremona, to find that the Ottonian forces had arrived within four miles of the place, that a body of their cavalry had attacked the camp, and that Valens had given the signal to march forth to fight. The battle which ensued, generally called the Battle of Betriacum, though more correctly the Battle of Cremona, is far less interesting from a military point of view than that of Locus Castorum, although, as things turned out, it decided the war. A report was spread that the Vitalians had abandoned their cause, and the Ottonians grounded their arms and hailed them as friends. But they were soon undeceived. The fighting took place on the high road and in the groves and vineyards on either side. The contending parties were equally matched, and on Otto's side the Legio Classica displayed conspicuous bravery. But there was no general action. The battle consisted of a series of desultory conflicts. The result was undecided until Otto's generals fled, and at the same moment reinforcements arrived for the Vitalians in the shape of the Batavian cords, which had recently routed the gladiators. Their flank attack was decisive. The defeated army fled along the high road to their camp, and next morning capitulated. Otto awaited the result at Brixellum, guarded by some divisions of the Praetorians. The defeat at Cremona was not in itself necessarily decisive of the war. He had still every chance of retrieving his fortunes with the help of the approaching legions from Illyricum. But he was weary of the uncertainty, and when the news of defeat came, he made up his mind to die. He did not think of his obligations to the troops which fought for him. Perhaps he felt unable to trust his generals. In the evening, he called for two daggers, of which he chose the sharper, and placed it beneath his pillow. Having slept for some hours, he drew forth the weapon at daybreak and fell upon it. His dying groan was heard, and when his slaves rushed in, they found their master dead, on April the 17th. If in the effeminacy of his life he was supposed to resemble Nero, the resolution which he displayed in his death contrasted with Nero's ignoble end. His body was immediately placed on a pyre, and some of the Praetorians slew themselves on the spot. The ashes were buried under a humble monument. The Praetorians at Brixellum then offered the empire to Virginius Rufus, who was in attendance on Otto, and he declined their offer, as he had before refused that of the legions of Germany. No course remained but submission to Vitalius. The victorious armies plundered and desolated the Italian cities, which had already been exhausted by the soldiers of Otto, and Valens and Cecina did not attempt to hinder the rapine. In Rome, the news of Otto's death was received with joy. The Senate met and decreed to Vitalius all the imperial titles by a single act on April the 19th. Just as Otto had been regarded as the successor of Nero, Vitalius was considered the successor of Galba. The images of Galba were born, crowned with flowers, to the spot in the forum where he had fallen. Everything was done to conciliate the Germanic legions to whose approach Rome looked forward with dread. End of chapter 19, section 2.
Chapter 19, Section 3 of J. B. Beery's The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2, by John Baniel Beery. Chapter 19 The Principate of Galba and the Year of the Four Emperors, Section 3. Vitellius and Vespasian. Vitellius himself, meanwhile, had been moving, with characteristic torpor, through Gaul. He had with him about sixty thousand men, including the strength of the Germanic armies, and some divisions which had been sent from Britain. The tidings of victory reached him at the same time as the announcement that the Mauritanian provinces had declared for him. Lysaeus Albinus had been appointed procurator of Caesariensis by Nero, and the Tingitane province had been added to his sway by Galba. On Galba's death he embraced the cause of Otto, and threatened Spain. But Clavius Rufus, the legatus of Terraconensis, on whom it devolved to provide for the military protection of Betica, succeeded in slaying Albinus and his chief supporters. It was said that Albinus had some thought of reviving for himself the royal title which had expired with King Juba. The imperator descended the river Arar in a barge, and at Lugdunum was met by his victorious generals, Valens and Cicina. Here he conferred his own title of Germanicus upon his infant son. The vengeance of Italius chiefly fell upon subordinate officers, especially those of the Illyrian legions, which were sent back to their stations. His rival's brother, Titianus, Suetonius, Proculus, and Marius Celsus, were all spared. Vitalius, perhaps, did not forget that his own wife and children had been spared by Otto. The fourteenth legion, which had been removed from Britain by Nero, was now sent back there. The Legio Classica was dispatched to Spain. The Praetorian Guard was disbanded, and a new guard formed from the Germanic soldiers, who demanded this promotion in return for their services. Thus the principle that the Praetorians should consist only of Italian levies was transgressed. The new guard consisted of sixteen cords of one thousand men each, instead of nine as before. The four urban cords were also organized anew. Rome was overrun by soldiers. Besides the new guards, there were four legions, four divisions of other legions, thirty-four corps of auxilia, and twelve squadrons of cavalry, all of which had entered Rome with the victor and treated it as a captured city. The administration of Italius was better than might have been expected from the license of his subordinates. He filled the offices of his household with knights, not with freedmen. He respected the independence of the Senate and attended its meetings. When he was opposed in the Curia, he observed that it was not strange that two senators should differ, that he himself had sometimes dissented from Thracea. He forbade processes for maestas and confirmed the privileges which had been granted by his predecessors. He also made laws against the practice of Roman knights degrading themselves by fighting in the arena, and banished astrologers from Italy. Whereas Galba and Otto had adopted the cognomen Caesar as part of their imperial style, Vitalius refused to affiliate himself thus to the Julian dynasty. He had postponed the assumption of the title Augustus, but it was pressed on him when he arrived in Rome. On the other hand, he permitted a perpetual consulship to be decreed to him. In regard to his attitude to the Senate, it is important to remark that he dated his accession, dies imperii, not from the day on which the army had saluted him imperator, but from the decree of the Senate after Otto's death. But the real power lay with Valens and Cecina. They encouraged the emperor in the coarse sensuality to which he was naturally addicted, while they enriched themselves and made all the state appointments. 
the cost of increasing the number of praetorians and the extravagant expenditure of the glutinous princeps on the pleasures of the table led soon to a deficit to meet which the coinage was depreciated while western europe was rent with civil wars and emperors rose and fell in rapid succession the legions of the east looked on with surprise and indifference galba and otto were acknowledged in syria and judea even vitellius was accepted for a moment but when it was fully grasped that vitellius had been elevated by the germanic army a dormant spirit of jealousy began to awake in the legions of the east just as the germanic legions themselves had been excited at the elevation of galba in spain if a princeps could be made out of italy why should he not be made in the east as well as in the north if the army of the rhine created an emperor if the army of the danube supported another why should not the army of the euphrates have their candidate too this feeling spread among both officers and men and the east determined to assert itself in the comitia of the empire the only question was who should be the candidate the most natural person to select was gaius licinius mucianus the legatus of syria a man of noble birth an experienced and able diplomatist popular with the soldiers but he refused perhaps because he had no children and thought it vain to attempt to found a permanent monarchy except as a dynasty then all eyes turned to titus flavius vespasianus the legatus of judea he was not a man of high descent like mucianus he was born of obscure family at phalacrine near Riati, the town of aro we have already met him doing good service in the conquest of britain as the commander of a legion he had afterwards held the consulship on fifty one a d but the fall of narcissus his patron interrupted his career and it was not till after the death of agrippina that he again took part in public life as the proconsul of africa in sixty three a d which he administered with integrity he followed in nero's train to greece and was appointed by that monarch governor of judea in sixty six a d to suppress a formidable rebellion which had broken out there he was slowly and surely carrying this task to a successful issue when the news of nero's death came upon which he withdrew his troops from the field of action and ceased hostilities this act does not imply any ulterior motives on the part of vespasian his office was delegated to him by nero and his authority expired with the death of the imperator who delegated it so that he had no legal position to act until his powers were delegated to him anew by another imperator on july the first vespasian was proclaimed imperator at alexandria by titus julius alexander the augustal prefect of egypt and from this day vespasian dated the beginning of his reign a few days later the judean legions followed with enthusiasm at caesarea and mucianus who zealously assumed the role of a king-maker secure the adhesion of both soldiers and citizens at antioch a probably forged letter of otto was produced calling upon the east to avenge his death and mucianus inflamed the soldiers by stating that vitellius intended to recall them from their luxurious quarters in syria and replace them by the legions of gaul and germany the choice of the armies was supported by the vassal kings sohemus of sophini antiochus of comagena and agrippa the second lord of batania trachonites and other districts negotiations were made with the king of parthia to ensure the safety of the eastern provinces during the absence of the legions in the west and he even offered to place at vespasian's disposal a force of mounted cavalry but this offer was refused a council of war was held at the colony of Berytus, where mucianus and vespasian concerted measures for the campaign against vitellius it was decided that mucianus should lead the expedition to the west and that vespasian himself should occupy egypt whose possession was very important in a war against italy 
as Rome depended for her corn supply chiefly on Egypt. Titus, the son of Vespasian, took his father's place in Judea. Messianus marched westward through Cappadocia and Phrygia. The number of his troops was not large, only about 20,000 or 25,000 men, but he relied upon the accession of the armies of the Illyric provinces, which burned to avenge the death of Otto. The unanimity of the eastern and Illyric armies was expressed on coins, issued at this period with the word consensus exercitum. In Mesia, three legions were stationed, the third Gallica, the eighth Augusta, and the seventh Claudiana. Of these, the third had been originally in Syria, and was transferred to Mesia by Nero. Mucianus relied on its adhesion, and it did not fail him. The other two followed its example. The two legions in Pannonia, the thirteenth Gemina and the seventh Galbiana, eagerly embraced the cause of Vespasian. They were smarting under the defeat which their contingents had experienced at Betriacum, and the treatment which they received from Vitellius. The thirteenth had been employed by Cecina and Valens in the construction of amphitheatres at Bononia and Cremona, and had then been sent back to their winter station at Petovio. Antonius Primus, a native of Tolosa and legatus of the Spanish legion of Galba, threw himself ardently into the cause. The legion in Dalmatia, the eleventh Claudiana, follow the example of the others, but with less zeal. Emissaries of Vespasian won the addition of the 14th legion, which was returning to Britain. The march of Mucianus was slow, like that of Valens through Gaul. He collected money as he went, on the principle that money is the sinews of civil war. He was fully aware of the difficulty of the enterprise. He had a high idea of the valor of the Germanic legions, and his wish was, if possible, to avoid bloodshed and reduce Italy by a blockade. The stoppage of corn supplies from Egypt might, it was expected, produce a revolution in Rome. But the Illyric legions, under the influence of Antonius Primus, took matters into their own hands and did not wait for the arrival of the eastern forces. At a council of war held at Petovio, Primus urged the expediency of surprising Italy while it was still unprepared, and his counsels were adopted, in spite of the letters from Mucianus and the opposition of the governor of Pannonia, Tempius Flavianus. The latter was suspected by the soldiers of sympathy with Vitalius, and had little influence. A message was sent to Oponius Saturninus, governor of Mesia, to hurry on with his army, the Jazyges, who dwelled between the Danube and the Thies, were engaged to undertake the defense of the Danube during the absence of the legions, and two Suavian kings, Sido and Italicus, joined the expedition against Italy. The procurator of Rhaetia was faithful to Vitalius, and in order to prevent him from intervening, troops were sent to the river Inus, in, which divided Rhaetia from Noricum. Primus advanced in front of the main body, with some detachments of horse and foot. He occupied Aquileia and the passes of the Julian Alps, but instead of waiting on the confines of Italy, as Mucianus desired, he proceeded to Opertergium, Oderzo, and Altinum, in which places he was gladly welcomed. Patavium declared for his cause, and likewise Atesti, east, where he heard that some Vitalian troops were stationed at Forum Elianae, which is perhaps the modern Nenago on the adage. He surprised them, and thus the beginning of the war declared in favor of the Flavians, as the party of Flavius Vespasianus was called. On the news of this small success, the two Pannonic legions marched rapidly to Patavium, and it was decided to make Verona the basis of further operations. Vicetia, Vicenza, was taken on the march to Verona, which city they prepared to besiege. The third and the eighth legion soon arrived from Mesia. Outside Verona, the governor of Pannonia, Flavianus, and the governor of Mesia, Aponius, were set upon by the soldiers, who suspected them of treachery to the cause, and escaped with difficulty. 
their flight left the conduct of the campaign entirely in the hands of primus meanwhile vitellius was ill prepared to oppose the forces which had approached to wrest the empire from his hands the breaking up of the old legions for the sake of the reorganization of the praetorians had been under the circumstances a fatal mistake they were weakened not only by the decrease of numbers but by the relaxation of discipline in their italian quarters and there was no bond between the veterans and the new recruits who were raised to fill up the maniples vitalius formed a new legion from the marines of the fleet of misenum he expected reinforcements from the provinces but the governors of germany britain and spain made excuses for delay africa alone where vitalius had formerly won popularity as proconsul showed some alacrity when the news of the approach of the enemy came cecina was sent on to defend the north of italy valens was detained at rome by illness the army which cecina led against the illyric legions wore a very different appearance from that which it presented when it descended from the alps to play the part which the illyric legions were now about to play against it the germanic troops had lost their vigor and their enthusiasm they were enervated by the climate their arms were in bad order their horses lazy the vigor of cecina himself had suffered from the pleasures of success and perhaps he meditated treachery before he left the city under the influence of flavius sabinus the prefect of the city vespasian's elder brother the plan of cecina was to make the river a thesis the line of defence cavalry were sent in advance to occupy cremona which played an important part in this as in the former war the fifth elauda and the twenty-second primigenia with the divisions of four other legions followed last of all the twenty-first rapex and the first italica with the divisions of the britannic legions which had been sent to support vitalius against otto marched to the north the two last-named legions were sent to cremona the other forces to hostilia a village still existing as ostilia on the lower course of the padus cecina himself turned aside to ravenna in order to concert with lucilius bassus the commander of the fleet the treacherous desertion of vitalius bassus was discontented because he had not been appointed praetorian prefect it was soon known that the fleet had gone over to the enemy this was the first blow to the cause of vitalius cecina's army had encamped between hostilia and the marshes of the river tartarus which flows into the adriatic between the padus and the Athesis. it was a good position the camp was covered by the river on the rear and flanked by the marsh if cecina had been in earnest he should have been able to crush the two pannonic legions before the mesian troops arrived but he delayed action on various pretexts allowed the five flavian legions to assemble at verona and finally tried to persuade his soldiers to desert to vespasian but his attempts were vain the troops restored the images of vitalius which he and a few officers whom he beguiled had thrown down and bound Cecina himself. They elected as their leaders Fabius Fabulus, the Gatus of the Fifth Legion, and Cassius Longus, prefect of the camp. Then they moved back to Hostilia, and proceeded to join the other legions at Cremona. When Primus learned what had happened, he determined that it was the favorable moment for action. The plans of the Vitalians had been thrown out by the desertion of Cecina, they had no leader of authority until Fabius Valens should arrive from Rome. Primus hastened to anticipate his arrival, and led his army in two days from Verona to Betriacum, in order to intercept the legions coming from Hostilia. Encamping at Betriacum, he advanced himself with some cavalry and corps of auxiliary foot towards Cremona, and falling in with some Italian troops, defeated them. The two legions stationed at Cremona, Italica and Rapex, then came up, and were beaten back by the Flavian legionaries, who had been summoned from Betriacum. In this conflict, Primus left nothing undone that devolved upon a good general and a brave soldier. 
as the evening was falling the whole body of the flavian army came up and the soldiers were eager to hurry on to cremona and take it by assault the efforts of primus himself who tried to expose the folly of such an attempt would hardly have been sufficient to restrain them but the news arrived that the six legions of hostilia had reached cremona they had crossed to the right bank of the padas and marched to cremona by parma and although they had accomplished thirty miles that day they were so excited by the news of the defeat that they hastened to attack the flavians the same night thus in the same place where the struggle had been decided between otto and vitalius was also to be decided the struggle between vitalius and vespasian primus made his dispositions for the battle as follows he placed the thirteenth legion in the centre on the via postumia next it on the left in the open plain was stationed the seventh galbiana and beyond it the seventh claudiana on the other side were placed in corresponding positions the eighth and the third of which the latter was protected by dense underwood the praetorians whom vitalius had disbanded had joined vespasian and they stood near the third the flanks and rear were fringed with cavalry the suavian auxiliaries were in front about nine o'clock in the evening the vitalian legions approached and drew up in disorder weary though they were with the long march with hunger and cold they pressed the flavians hard and the fierce and doubtful battle lasted the whole night through the seventh galbiana was especially hard pressed but it was sustained by primus who sent the praetorians to assist it the ballistae and engines of the vitalians which they planted on the causeway wrought great mischief among the flavian ranks till two brave soldiers lost their lives in cutting the cords which impelled the missiles fortune began to declare for the flavians when the moon rose in their rear at an advanced hour of the night and rendered the aim of the enemy more difficult primus rallied his flagging troops the third which had been originally stationed in syria saluted the rising sun and from this incident a report was spread that Mucianus had arrived with the eastern army. The Flavians, believing themselves reinforced, fought with confidence, and their foes, completely routed, fled to Cremona. Primus led on his victorious troops, excited with the prospect of plunder, against Cremona. In the war with Otto, the German soldiers had made their camp round the walls of the city, and surrounded the camp with a rampart the flavians stormed the camp with much labor and then the town capitulated but the soldiers who hated the place which had been twice the headquarters of the vitalians and burned with the desire of plundering the wealthy colony did not respect the capitulation primus had retired to refresh himself with a bath and when he complained that the water was not warm enough the attendant said it will soon be hotter the word was seized by some who heard it, and interpreted as a permission to burn the city. Forty thousand armed men, with crowds of camp followers, burst into the place, and the inhabitants experienced all the horrors of military license. The miserable Cremona burned for four days, and no edifice was left in it, except the temple of Mephitis, the deity of the marshes. If Valens had hurried northward, he might have reached Cremona in time to change the course of history, but his movements were slow. He sent three Praetorian cords which had followed him to Ariminum, went himself to Etruria, and having heard of the result of the battle of Cremona, took ship for Gaul, intending to rouse the northern provinces to retrieve the cause of Italius. But Valerius Paulinus, the procurator of Narbonensis, who had embraced his friend's Vespasian's cause, succeeded in capturing Valens. Then the legions of the western provinces, Spain, Gaul, and Britain, declared for Vespasian. Meanwhile, Umbria was occupied by the Flavians, and the courts at Ariminum were blockaded by land and sea. Italy was divided by the Apennines between Vespasian and Vitalius. The contest was not yet over, for the Praetorian guards, the pick of the Germanic army, had taken no part hitherto in the war, and were still to be dealt with. 
and Vitellius had still a strong natural defense in the Apennines. Primus, leaving most of his army at Verona, led a force consisting of auxiliary courts and chosen legionaries, along with the eleventh legion from Dalmatia, to Fanum Fortune. At this place, the present Fano, which lies between Ancona and Ariminum, the Flaminian road reaches the Adriatic Sea. Here Primus waited, expecting that the troops of Vitellius would desert the emperor. In the meantime, Vitellius had been burying his cares in sensual gratifications. At first, he could hardly believe the tidings from Cremona, but when he was at length wakened out of his sleep, he sent fourteen courts to defend the Apennine passes at Mevania, Bevania, near Fulginium, on the Flaminian road. To these forces was added a new marine legion, which he formed from the fleet of Misenum. The remaining cohorts were kept to defend the city under the command of his brother, Lucius Vitellius. The emperor himself visited the camp at Mevania, but on the news that the Misenum fleet had declared for the enemy, he returned to Rome. The next blow was a defection of Campania. The Semnites, Martians, and Polinians followed. Vitalius divided his forces. Some were stationed at Narnia, to oppose the advance of the Flavians. Others were sent to check the movement in Campania. Primus crossed the Apennines with great difficulty, owing to the heavy snow, and stationed himself at Carsule, north of Narnia, where he was presently joined by his legions. The Vitalian cohorts had little spirit to fight, but when the head of Fabius Valens, whom they believed to be in Germany collecting a new army, was exhibited to them, they no longer hesitated and submitted to the victor who treated them with clemency in December. Primus then offered terms to Vitellius. If he submitted, he and his children should have a safe retreat in Campania. Lucianus wrote to the same effect, and Vitellius readily agreed to the proposal. Such a torpor had seized upon his spirit that he would himself have forgotten that he was princeps if the rest had not remembered it. The transference of the empire took place in the temple of Apollo. Vitellius came forth from the palace, clad in black, with his family around him, and proceeding to the forum, offered his dagger to the consul Cecilius, who refused to accept it. He then turned towards the Temple of Concord, to deposit there the insignia of empire, but a number of the Praetorian soldiers prevented him, and compelled him to return to the palace on December 17th. These adherents would not permit him to carry out the agreement. Senators and knights, the urban soldiery, and the courts of the watch, Vigilis, had gathered to the house of Vespasian's brother, Flavius Sabinus, who had acted as a mediator. They urged Sabinus to occupy the palace in his brother's interest. But as they conveyed him thither, on December 18th, they were attacked by the Vitalians at a place called the Pool of Fundanius. Sabinus and a few others fled to the Capitoline Hill and shut themselves up in the Temple of Jupiter. The Vitalians guarded the approaches, but during a violent storm of rain, Sabinus communicated with his friends and received into the place of refuge both his own children and his nephew Domitian, the son of Vespasian. The next morning the Vitalians assaulted the capital. From the forum they rushed up the clivus, but the Flavians, issuing on the roof of the portico, which reached from the temple of Saturn to the capital, hurled down stones and tiles. The assailants then set fire to the portico, and would have passed through the burnt door into the court of the temple, if Sabinus had not torn down the statues and monuments which filled the place, and thus constructed a barrier. Foiled here, the Vitalians attempted other ways of ascent. One of these rose from the shoulder of the hill, another was close to the Tarpeian rock, and known as the Hundred Stairs. By the former especially, they forced their way along the tops of houses and with the help of fire. At length, the conflagration broke out on the summit of the hill, and the temple of Jupiter was consumed. The mission escaped and hid himself in a porter's hut, 
but Sabinus was seized and carried to the palace, where, in spite of the attempts of Vitellius to save him, he was slain, and his trunk dragged to the Gemonian stairs outside the carcer, on December 19th. Immediately after this, Cerealis, who had been sent on by Primus, arrived with one thousand horsemen and tried to force his way into Rome. But the Vitalians were prepared and drove him back. Primus was himself close at hand and had reached Saxa Rubra when he learned the destruction of the capital and the repulse of Cerealis. The slaughter of Sabinus rendered further negotiations impossible and the deputation of the Vestals, beseeching for a conference, was rejected. The Flavians attacked Rome in three divisions. One party approached the Colline Gate, another marched through fields along the bank of the Tiber, and a third band, between these, advanced along the Flaminian Way. The Vitalians, who had armed the rabble and the slaves, went forth to meet them, but were driven back with slaughter. Conquerors and conquered entered the city together, and the battle was renewed in the streets. Then the Praetorian camp was stormed. It is said that fifty thousand men were slain in this capture of Rome. Vitalius tried to make his escape to join his brother Lysias, who held Teresina, but he was discovered, dragged from his hiding place, and amid the mockery of the soldiers was hailed to the Gemonian stairs and slain with insults, December 20th or 21st. His last words were perhaps the only he had ever uttered worth recording, yet I was your imperator. Thus perished the first emperor who had been set up by the Germanic legions. His brother, Lucius Vitalius, who had occupied Terracina, soon afterwards surrendered and was put to death. For a second time in the same year, Rome was occupied by a victorious army, and citizens were exposed to the license of soldiers, greedy for plunder, whom their leader, Primus, did not keep in check. The mission, the second son of Vespasian, was installed in the palace, and received the name of Caesar, but the power was in the hands of Primus, a soldier whom Vespasian had no intention of placing in such a position but he did not enjoy the pleasures of power long. Messianus presently arrived, and his entry into the city was felt as a relief. He acted as a semi-official representative of Vespasian until Vespasian came himself. He sternly suppressed the license of the soldiers, dismissed the Illyric legions from Rome, and taught Primus his place. He put to death Glerianus, the son of Piso, whom Galba had made his colleague, and Asiaticus, a freedman of Vitalius. The Senate hastened to make the victorious imperator a legitimate emperor by the usual decrees, conferring on him the proconsular power, the title Augustus, and other prerogatives. The tribunician power, however, does not seem to have been conferred upon him until a considerably later time. The emperor and his elder son Titus were designated consuls for the year 70. The praetorship and consular power were decreed to the mission. The triumphal ornaments were voted to Mucianus for his defense of Mysia against the Dacian invasion, which had taken place as he passed through that province. Antonius Primus and Arius Varus, who was made Praetorian prefect, received the lesser distinctions of the consular and Praetorian insignia, respectively. Thus the remarkable year of the four emperors came to an end. The events between the death of Nero and the victory of Vespasian throw instructive light on the conditions of the empire. The following points deserve notice. 1. The most striking motive which determined the course of the civil wars was the exclusive and jealous esprit de corps which was growing up among the different armies. The Germanic army was hostile to Galba because he was proclaimed by the Spanish legion, and the eastern and Illyric armies were jealous of the Germanic troops because they proclaimed Vitalius. 2. Galba, however, 
cannot be considered so strictly a candidate set up by the soldiers as Vitalius and Vespasian. He posed as a senatorial candidate, and was not forced upon the Senate in the same way as the emperors who came from Germany and Syria. 3. Each successive emperor professed to represent the cause of him whom his rival had overthrown. Vespasian came to avenge Otto, and Otto came to avenge Nero, and Vitellius, though when first proclaimed he was the rival of Galba, afterwards posed as his successor. 4. Although the legions arrogated the right of creating emperors, they recognized that their candidates were only pretenders until they possessed Rome, and were acknowledged by the Senate. 5. The dilemma in which the empire was placed in regard to the question of dynastic succession is clearly shown. While the hereditary principle was followed, weak or bad rulers, like Gaius and Nero, were an inevitable result. On the other hand, when there was no candidate with an hereditary claim to the principate, the state was exposed to the dangers of civil war, such as followed on the death of Nero. 6. Dynastic succession, however, was considered the least evil. The fact that he had no children deterred Mycianus from accepting the empire, and perhaps the same motive influenced Virginius. Both Otto and Vitalius destined their children as their successors, and Vespasian founded a new dynasty. Galba, who had no children, resorted to the principle of adoption, following the example of Augustus. Each of the emperors, with the exception of Italius, attached himself in a certain manner to the house of the Julii and Claudii by adopting the name Caesar, and even Vitalius assumed it in his last crisis. End of chapter 19, section 3「Chapter twenty, section one of J. B. Biori's The Students' Roman Empire, Part two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Students' Roman Empire, Part two by John Bagnall Biori. Chapter twenty, Rebellions in Germany and Judea. 69 to 70 A.D. Section 1. First Stage of the Revolt of Civilis. While the legions were contending for the right of electing a princeps, and Italy was devastated with civil war, the empire was threatened in two opposite quarters, in the southeast and in the southwest, with serious danger from rebellious provincials, and to meet these dangers was the first task that devolved upon Vespasian. We shall see presently how the insurrection in Judea was suppressed. There he had merely to finish a work which was already half accomplished. We must follow the curious and terrible rebellion which, breaking out among auxiliary troops of the Germanic army, extended to the free Germans beyond the Rhine, and led to the foundation of a transitory Gallic empire. In the province of Lower Germany, the Batavians, who occupied the delta of the Rhine, the district enclosed between the Valhallis while, and the Rhine proper, held a peculiar position. Their fidelity to the empire had been conspicuous. They had taken no part in that movement of their countrymen which led to the defeat of Varus. They paid no tribute, but on the other hand they were required to supply a very large contingent of recruits to the army. They did not grumble at the burden of this conscription. They were brave and daring soldiers, skilful in riding and swimming. Eight Batavian cohorts, associated with the 14th legion in Upper Germany, had been sent with that legion to take part in the conquest of Britain, where they had distinguished themselves conspicuously by their valour. Both the legion and its auxiliaries were recalled by Nero to aid in the eastern expedition which he planned at the end of his reign, but the revolt of Vindex, which had just then broken out in Gaul, led to a discord between the legionaries and the cohorts. While the legions hastened to Italy to defend their master, the 8,000 Batavians refused to follow. This was probably due to the fact that two Batavian officers, Julius Civilis and Claudius Paulus, had been accused falsely of treason, 
and while Paulus was put to death by Fonteius Capito, governor of Lower Germany, Civilis had been sent to Nero and thrown into prison. After Nero's fall, Galba released Civilis and ordered the Batavian cohorts to return to Britain. But when they had reached the city of the Ligones, the insurrection of the Germanic army in favour of Vitellius took place, and after long hesitation the Batavians embraced his cause. They did him good service in the battle of Betriacum, where they measured swords with their former comrades of the 14th, which was fighting for Otho. After the victory, the Batavians were commanded to accompany the 14th to Britain, but the legion and the cohorts came to blows at Augusta Torinorum, Turin, and separated, the legionaries proceeding to Britain and the Batavians to Morguntiacum. The latter was soon summoned back by Vitellius, when he was threatened by Vespasian. But Antonius Primus sent a messenger to hinder their complying with this summons, and immediately afterwards a revolt broke out in Germany, which prevented the troops in the north from taking part in the conflict in Italy. The organiser of this revolt was Julius Civilis. He was looked up to by his Batavian countrymen on account of his high descent, and he was a man of more brains, says Tacitus, than barbarians are usually endowed with. He had only one eye, and he liked to compare himself to Hannibal and Sertorius, who were disfigured in a like way. The idea of the revolt is said to have been suggested by Primus, who thought in that way to keep the Germanic legions at a distance. The plan served his immediate purpose, but the revolt assumed far larger proportions than he could have anticipated. The unfairness of the Roman levies was a sufficient grievance. If Civilis began by playing for Vespasian, he ended by playing for himself. It is impossible to say whether he had matured the deeper game of a rebellion against Rome from the very beginning. He first roused the inhabitants of his native country to rebel. Calling the chiefs of the Batavians to a nocturnal banquet in a sacred grove, he revealed the scheme of his revolt. The Caninifates, the northern neighbours of the Batavians, were next gained over, and then the Frisians, and messengers were sent to Morguntiacum to secure the adhesion of the eight Batavian cohorts. Somewhere near the mouth of the Rhine was a winter camp of two Roman cohorts. It was seized and destroyed. This was the first act of the revolt. The other garrisons in the territory were soon dislodged from their castella, and a cohort of Tungarian auxiliaries went over to the rebels, and part of the Rhine fleet, numbering twenty-four ships, fell into their hands. These successes supplied the insurgents with arms and ships, and Civilis invoked both Germany and Gaul to join him in supporting the cause of Vespasian. At this time, both Lower and Upper Germany were under the single command of Hordionis Flaccus, an old and utterly incompetent man, decrepit with gout, who was inclined secretly to Vespasian's cause, and was suspected by his soldiers of treachery to Vitellius. The remnant of the legions which had accompanied Vitellius and his generals to Italy may have been partly supplemented by new recruits, but in no case can they have consisted of more than about half the usual number. In Lower Germany, the 5th and 15th were stationed at Castro Vetera under the legatus Munius Lupercus, the 16th under Numisius Rufus at Novaecium, Neus, between Vetera and Colonia, the 1st under Herennius Gallus in the southern extremity of the province at Bonna. The boundary between the two Germanies was at the river Abrinca, south of Rigomagus, Remagen. Thus Confluentes, Coblenz, belonged to the upper province. In it two legions, 4th Macedonica and 12th, lay at Moguntiacum. It is possible that part of the 21st was also left in garrison at Vindonissa, Windisch, but it took no part in the earlier events of the rebellion. By the command of Flaccus, the two legions of Vetera marched against the rebels, who were now receiving promises of help from the German tribes beyond the Rhine. Both legions together hardly amounted to five thousand men, but Munius Lupercus obtained reinforcements from the Ubians and cavalry from the Treveri. He had also a squadron of Batavians, who feigned fidelity in order to desert him in the action. The battle was fought north of Vetera, and was decided by the desertion of the Batavian horse, who suddenly turned upon the Romans. The Ubians and Treveri fled, and while the Germans pursued them, the legions retreated to Vetera. Meanwhile, the messengers of Civilis had moved the eight Batavian cohorts at Moguntiacum to rebel. They made large demands from Flaccus, 
and when he had made considerable concessions, they insisted on further demands which they knew could not and would not be granted. Then they left the camp and set out to Lower Germany to join Civilis. The general, instead of ordering his legions to cut the mutineers to pieces, allowed them to depart, but presently, changing his mind, sent a letter to Herennius Gallus at Bonner, bidding him prevent the Batavians from passing, and promising to follow with his own army in the rear. Then, changing his mind once more, he wrote again to Gallus, ordering him to allow them to jam. This shuffling conduct of Flaccus gives good ground for suspecting him of treachery. The Batavians reached Bonner by the road on the left bank of the Rhine, and sent a message to Gallus, demanding that they should be allowed to pass in peace. The legatus was almost disposed to comply, but his soldiers compelled him to try the fortune of a battle. The first legion was completely defeated and driven back to the camp. The victors, taking no further advantage of their success, continued their northward march, and turning aside to avoid Colonna Agrippinensis, joined the army of the insurgents. Cyrillus was now in command of a regular army, and German tribes from beyond the Rhine, such as the Bructeri and the Tencteri, had flocked to his standard. He made an attempt to induce the two legions which had retreated to Vetera after the defeat to embrace the cause of Vespasian, but they were obdurate in their loyalty to Vitellius. He resolved to blockade the camp and ranged his troops on both banks of the Rhine. Vetera was not a strong position, either by nature or by art. On the west side there was a level approach to the Praetorian Gate. Augustus had regarded it as a winter station from which the legions should go forth to attack the Germans, not as a place in which they might have to defend themselves against German assailants. Lupercus and Rufus had to repair the fortifications, which had suffered from the effects of a long peace. The attempts of the Germans to storm the place were unsuccessful, and they were obliged to blockade it. Flaccus, in the meantime, had sent messengers throughout Gaul to obtain auxiliaries, and, on learning the danger of Vetera, dispatched Dilius Vocula, the legatus of the 22nd, with chosen legionaries, to march to its relief with the utmost speed. Flaccus himself followed by ship. The troops, when they heard of the successes of Civilis, murmured loudly that Flaccus was playing them false, and in order to appease them, Flaccus read aloud a letter which had arrived from Vespasian, and sent the bearer in chains to Vitellius. When he reached Bonner he was assailed by the reproaches of the First Legion, who attributed their defeat by the Batavian cohorts to his false promises but he reassured them of his good faith in some measure by reading copies of the letters which he had sent to Gaul, Britain, and Spain for assistance. Auxiliary troops from Gaul were already arriving, and the army advanced by Colonia to Novasium, where they picked up the 16th legion and proceeded to Gelduba, Gelb, a little lower down the river. Here the leaders, Bocula and Gallus, to whom the conduct of the warfare was entrusted, made a camp and practised the soldiers in the operations of war. Apparently the demoralisation of the troops was such that the officers did not feel prepared to risk an action at Vetera until the discipline was confirmed. The temper of the soldiers is shown by an incident at Gelduba. A corn ship had run into the shallows of the river, and Germans on the right bank were trying to capture it. Gallus sent a cohort to prevent them, but the Romans were defeated. The soldiers accused their officer of treachery, dragged him out of his tent, beat him, and kept him bound until the arrival of Vocula, who was absent on an excursion against the Kugani, a tribe which dwelled north of the Ubii. Vocula executed the ringleaders. Civilis did not confine his operations to Vetera. He sent troops beyond the river Mosa to stir up the Menapii, Morini, and other tribes of northeastern Gaul. Another band ravaged the lands of the Treveri and the Ubii. The Ubii were made the mark of special hatred, because under their new name of Agrippinenses they seemed to have renounced their German origin, and their cohorts were defeated at Marcordurum, Durin. A third band threatened Morguntiacum. Such was the state of affairs at the end of October, 69 AD, when the news of the great defeat of Vitellius at Cremona arrived. The Gallic auxiliaries immediately declared for Vespasian. At Novicium and Gelduba the legions took the military oath to the new emperor, but without enthusiasm. 
it was now necessary for Sibyllus to declare himself, and show whether the sole object of his revolt was the elevation of Vespasian. His mask could no longer deceive anyone. It was clear that the deliverance of the Germans of northern Gaul from the Roman yoke was the aim of the war. He sent a force, including the eight veteran Batavian cohorts, against the army at Gelduba. In their rapid march from Vetera they seized Ascibergium, Asberg, and swooped down upon the Roman camp so suddenly that Vocula had no time to spread out his line. He placed the legions in the centre, and the auxiliaries surrounded them in irregular order. The battle almost proved a defeat for the Romans. The cavalry advanced, but turned and fled before the firm array of the Germans, and brought confusion into the ranks of the cohorts, who were then easily cut down by the foe. The auxiliary Nervii deserted, and the legions were being discomfited, when the tide of battle was turned by an unexpected reinforcement. Cohorts of the Vascones of the Pyrenees, supposed to be the forefathers of the Basques, enrolled by Gala when he was governor of Taraconensis, happened to arrive at this moment, and attacked the enemy in the rear. The Germans, believing that forces had arrived from Novesium or Morgantiacum, were disconcerted and utterly routed. After this victory, Vocula at length advanced to the relief of Vetera, which was suffering severely from want of supplies, and succeeded in entering the place after a hard fight with the besiegers. The beasts of burden and the camp followers were sent to Novasium, to bring provisions by land, as the enemy commanded the river. The first supply was conveyed safely, but on the second occasion Civilis attacked the cohorts which escorted the train of wagons, and compelled them to retreat to Gelduba. Vocula, having added to his own army a thousand chosen men of the legions of Vetera, marched to Gelduba, and, as the cohorts refused to return to Vetera, proceeded to Novasium, the headquarters of Flaccus. Here a mutiny broke out. A donative for the soldiers had arrived from Vitellius, and Flaccus distributed it in the name of Vespasian. The soldiers, excited by the carouses which followed, revived their anger against Flaccus, dragged him out of his tent, and slew him. Vocula would have experienced the same fate had he not escaped from the camp in disguise. The army proclaimed Vitellius emperor, although he was already dead. These events seemed to have taken place in the last days of December, but the legions of Upper Germany soon dissociated their cause from that of the others. Along with Legion I, they placed themselves under the command of Vocula, renewed their allegiance to Vespasian, and marched up the Rhine to deliver Morgantiacum, which was threatened by the Chatri, the Usipi, and the Matiaki. But on their arrival the enemy was already departing. Vocula remained during the rest of the winter at Morgantiacum. Civilis renewed the blockade of Vetera, and occupied the camp of Gelduba, which the Romans had abandoned. End of chapter 20, section 1《ャプター20セクション2 of J.B. Bury's The Student's Roman Empire Part 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion The Student's Roman Empire Part 2 by John Bagnall Bury Chapter 20 Rebellions in Germany and Judea Section 2. Second stage of the revolt, the Imperium Galliarum. On the news of the death of Vitellius, the mask of Civilis was finally thrown off, and he acknowledged that he was fighting against the Roman people. The destruction of the capital by fire produced a profound impression upon the superstitious minds of the Gauls, who believed that it betokened the approaching end of the Roman Empire. The remnant of the Druids interpreted it as a sign of heavenly wrath, and prophesied that the nations north of the Alps were soon to become the lords of the world. A conspiracy had been organized by Julius Classicus, a distinguished nobleman of the Treveri, and prefect of a squadron of cavalry which had fought under Valens against Otho. He renewed the design of forming a Gallic kingdom, which had been tried in vain by Sacrovir, and perhaps contemplated more recently by Vindex. His chief associates were his countrymen, Julius Tutor, and Julius Sabinus, who pretended to be descended from a bastard of Julius Caesar. 
The conspirators met in Colonia, and maintained secret communications with Civilis. Their first object was to get rid of Vocula, and they accomplished it by a similar deceit to that which Arminius practised on Varus. They induced Vocula to leave Moguntiacum, and descend the Rhine to relieve Vetera, which was hard-pressed. On the march from Novesum to Vetera, the troops of Classicus and Tutor rode forward on the pretext of reconnoitring, and entrenched themselves at a distance. Vocula was unable to persuade them to return, and could not enforce obedience. He was compelled to fall back on Novesium, the Gauls encamped at a distance of two miles. Vetera could not hold out much longer, and when it fell, the whole army of the Germans would be free to attack Novesium. Under these circumstances, the legions determined to desert the cause of Rome and declare for the Imperium Galliarum, which was being proclaimed by Classicus. Vocula appealed in vain to their better feelings, and when he found they were determined to join the standards of Classicus and Civilis, he decided that nothing was left for himself but to die. Before he had time to make arrangements for a voluntary death, he was slain by an emissary of Classicus, a legionary soldier who had deserted. The other legati, Gallus and Numisius, were thrown in chains. Then Classicus, assuming the insignia of a Roman emperor, entered the camp of Novatium. Bold though he was, he found no words to express or defend his assumption of such a dignity. He merely read out the oath of allegiance. The Roman soldiers swore fidelity to the empire of the Gauls. The dream of Sacrovir and Vindex was at last accomplished, if only for a moment. Classicus and Tutor divided between them the work of reducing the two Rhine provinces under the new empire which was thus inaugurated. Tutor undertook to secure the adhesion of the fourth and twenty-second legions at Moguntiacum. The officers were slain, and the soldiers took the same oath as their comrades at Novatium. Classicus himself proceeded to Vetera, where the wretched garrison, reduced to the last extremities of hunger, were supporting life on the herbs that grew among the stones. They sent envoys to the Batavian chief, asking to be permitted to leave the place alive, and their prayers were granted when they took the oath of loyalty to the new empire. But five miles from Vetera they were treacherously attacked by the escort of Germans whom Civilis had ordered to accompany them, and many were slain. Vetera was dismantled and burned, and in like manner all the other winter stations of the legions, including Bonna and Novatium, were destroyed except Roguntiacum and Vindonissa. The latter place was at such a distance that it was quite unaffected by the rebellion. The 16th legion and the auxiliaries, which had surrendered at Novatium and the 1st legion from Bonna, were commanded to repair to Augusta Trevororum, which Classicus and Tutor doubtless intended to make the capital of the new empire, within a given time. On their march thither they had to endure the mocking of the inhabitants through whose country they passed, and one squadron of cavalry, the Aela Picentina, unable to endure the shame of the position, left the procession and went to Moguntiacum. On their way they fell in with the murderer of Vocula, and dealt with him as he deserved. Munius Lupercus, who had commanded the garrison of Vetera during the long blockade, was sent among other gifts to Veleda, a German prophetess who played a part in this rebellion, and exercised great influence over her countrymen. This maiden belonged to the tribe of the Bructeri, and lived remote from the abodes of others in a solitary tower on the river Lupia. She had predicted the success of the Germans and the destruction of the legions, and the accomplishment of her prophecy confirmed her power. She was soon called upon to exert it for the purpose of hindering her countrymen from abusing their victory. The Ubii had been faithful to Rome throughout the rebellion, but when the legions yielded, nothing was left for them but to yield too. The question was then agitated by the Germans whether they should destroy Colonia or leave it standing. Jealousy of the privileged position of the Ubii and desire of plunder prompted the trans renamed tribes to counsel its destruction, but Civilis judged that clemency would be the better policy. The Tegteri set an embassy to the colony and demanded that the inhabitants should pull down their walls, slay all the Romans within their borders, and resume their German habits and institutions. But the Agrippinenses escaped from the fulfilment of these requisitions by appealing to the authority of Civilis and the prophetess Veleda. The Sunuki, who lived west of the Ubii on the Mosa, were then reduced, and the Nervii, 
Tungri and Vaitasii, who still maintained the cause of Rome under the leadership of Claudius Labio, a Batavian but a rival of Civilis, submitted. The new Gallic Empire had no firm foundation, and was not destined to prosper. It had sprung up by means of the Batavian rebellion, but Civilis and the Batavians, although they made common cause with Classicus in pulling down the Roman power, stood aloof from the Imperium Galliarum. The Germans had no intention of throwing off Roman for the sake of Celtic rule, but besides, the Gauls themselves were for the most part by no means favourable to the profit of the Treveri and the Lingones. Julius Sabinus cast down the bronze tables on which the treaties between Rome and the Lingones were inscribed, assumed the name of Caesar, and marched at the head of a disorderly band of his countrymen against the Sequani. But the Sequani were faithful to Rome, and beat back the spurious Caesar, who deserted in the middle of the battle, and by burning down the house to which he fled, caused it to be supposed that he had killed himself but he really remained hidden in a subterranean retreat for no less than five years kept alive by his wife eponina he was finally discovered and put to death along with his wife by vespasian's orders the declaration of the sequani against the gallic rebels was soon confirmed by the verdict of a common council summoned by the remi who took upon themselves the initiative in this crisis it was put to the states of Gaul whether they preferred liberty or peace. The Treveri were represented by Julius Valentinus, but the arguments of Julius Ospex, a noble of the Remi, carried the day, and a letter of the Treveri was composed, in the name of the Gauls, calling upon them to desist from war. The strongest motive of the Gallic states in adhering to Rome was perhaps mutual jealousy. The question presented itself. Supposing the empire of the Gauls to be established, what city will be the centre? The other states would certainly never have submitted to be ruled from the city of the Treveri or the city of the Lingones. It does not appear that the idea of a federal union, like that of the Achaean League, occurred to any of the Gallic patriots. In the meantime, Mucianus and the government of Vespasian were making preparations to suppress the rebels of the north, both Germans and Gauls. Quintus Petilius Cerealis was appointed to the command in Lower, Annius Gallus, the general of Otho, in Upper Germany. Two of the victorious legions, the 8th of Moesia and the 11th of Dalmatia, along with one of the Vitellian legions, the 21st, whose station was at Bindonissa, were chosen for the expedition, and marched northward by the Pennine, Cotian, and Grian Alps. Moreover, the 14th was summoned from Britain, and the sixth Victris and tenth Gemina from Spain. But the rebels did not realize, or at least took no steps to meet, the danger which was approaching. Civilis was engaged in pursuing his enemy Claudius Labeo in the wilds of Belgica. Classicus was enjoying his position as head of an empire. Tutor talked about occupying the Alpine passes, but omitted to do so. He had indeed increased the forces of the Treveri by the accession of the Vangiones and other small tribes, and some of the legionaries of Morgantiacum joined his army. Sextilius Felix, the officer who had been set by the leaders of Vespasian to watch Raetia, was the first to arrive on the scene of action with his auxiliary cohorts. One cohort which he sent on in advance was routed by the forces of Tutor, but on the approach of the rest and of the twenty-first legion, which had reached Vindonissa, the legionaries deserted, and the allies of the Treveri followed the example. Tutor, with his Treverans, retreated to Bingium, and took up a position on the left bank of the Nava, Naha, having broken down on the bridge. But the cohorts of Sextilius crossed by a ford, and routed the Treveri. The legions, who had been compelled to post themselves at Augusta Treverorum on the news of this defeat, took an oath of allegiance to Vespasian, and marched to the town of the Medio Matrici, called in older days Divudorum, in later days Metis, now Metz. The leaders Tutor and Valentinus roused the Treveri again to arms, and put to death the legati Herennius and Numisius, whom they had kept prisoners. Petilius Cerealis now arrived at Morgantiacum. His contempt for the enemy and his rejection of a Gallic levy inspired his troops with confidence and confirmed the Gauls in their obedience. He united the remnant of the legions of Morgantiacum with his own army 
and marched in three days at the rate of nine hours a day to Rigordulum, Rio, about ten miles from Augusta Trevorum, lower down the Mosella, protected on one side by the river, on the other by steep hills. This place had been occupied by a large band of Treveri under Valentinus, who had entrenched himself behind ditches and stone barricades. The troops of Cerealis boldly stormed the position, and Valentinus himself was captured. They then entered Augusta Trevorum, the soldiers burning to destroy the home of Classicus and Tutor, a city, they said, far more guilty than Cremona, which had paid so heavily for its part in the Vitellian War. But the august city, which was destined hereafter to become a capital of a Belgic province, and even a seat of Roman emperors, was spared by the decision of Cerealis. When Civilis and Classicus learned that the Romans held Augusta Trevorum, they tried to tempt the ambition of Cerealis by offering him the Imperium Galliarum. Cerealis did not deign to reply to the letter, which he sent to Rome, and the rebels prepared for decisive battle. Civilis counselled delay until they should receive reinforcements from the Transrhenane tribes, but Tutor urged that if they delayed, the Roman forces would be increased by the legions which had been summoned from Spain and Britain. The advice of Tutor was followed, and the forces of the insurgents unexpectedly attacked the Roman camp. Augusta Trevorum lies on the right bank of the Mosella. The Roman camp was pitched on the left bank, to protect the town against the foe coming from the north. On the night of the attack, Cerealis himself happened to be sleeping in the city, and he was awakened by the news that his troops were fighting and getting the worst of it. The enemy had made a way through the camp, routed the cavalry, and occupied the bridge which connected the town with the left bank. The boldness and presence of mind of the general retrieved the fortune of the legions. Placing himself at the head of those whom the foe had driven before them into the town, he recovered the bridge and, reaching the camp, rallied his men. Everything was in favour of the enemy, and the victory which the Romans secured seemed almost miraculous. The Agrippinenses gladly returned to their allegiance to Rome. They slew the Germans in their city, and destroyed a cohort of Chalki and Frisians, which were stationed at Tolbiacum, Zulpich, by making them intoxicated and then setting on fire the house in which they slumbered. The rebels in Belgica were suppressed by the 14th Legion, which arrived from Britain. On the other hand, the Britannic fleet was defeated by the Caninifates, who were more skilful in managing ships. But this success did not hinder the suppression of the rebellion. The next defeat of Civilis took place at Vetera, where, having gathered together his forces after the defeat at Augusta Trevorum, he had taken up a strong position. The army of Cerealis, doubled in number by the arrival of the legions from Spain and Britain, proceeded to Vetera, but the combat was delayed by the nature of the ground. The fields, always marshy, had been flooded by the art of Civilis, who had built a mole into the Rhine from the right bank, and so caused the river to overflow. Thus the Romans could not approach the camp, and when they attempted to fight in the deep marsh, the Batavians, skilful in swimming, had the advantage. On the following days, Cerealis drew out his line of battle. The cohorts and cavalry were placed in front, the legions in the centre, and a chosen band in the rear, in case of emergencies. Civilis arranged his forces in deep columns. The Cugerni and Batavians were on the right, the Transrhenanes on the left, and nearer the river. The Germans began the battle by missiles, but could not provoke the Romans to enter the marsh. When the missiles were spent, they drew nearer, and with long lances pierced the front ranks of the soldiers, who were slipping and tottering on the margin of the morass, and could not, with their shorter weapons, reach the assailants. Then a column of the Bructeri, who were stationed on the right bank of the river, swam across from the mole already mentioned, and fell upon the right wing of the Romans. The cohorts seemed to have had the worst of it all along the line, but the legions, when it came to their turn, stood their ground. The battle was decided by the interposition of a Batavian deserter, under whose guidance two squadrons of cavalry went round by the extremity of the marsh, where there were solid ground, and the Kugani were keeping careless watch, and attacked the enemy in the rear. The legions at the same time pressed on more vigorously in front, and the Germans fled to the river. The approach of night and the nature of the ground prevented a pursuit. After this defeat, Civilis could no longer hold his position on the Rhine. 
He made no attempt to defend the town of the Batavians, which is perhaps the modern Cleves, but retreated into the island. He destroyed the dam of the Rhine, begun by Drusus and finished in the reign of Nero, 55 AD, which was intended to divert the waters of the left arm of the river into the right or eastern channel. When it was broken down, the waters plunged into the left channel, called the Vahalis, and the right channel, or the Rhine proper, was rendered shallow. The result of this act of Civilis was that the island of the Batavians was made, as it were, part of Germany, a trans renamed land, instead of being as before, a part of Gaul. The remnant of the Empire of the Gauls, Tutor, Classicus, and more than a hundred Treveran senators, also found refuge in the home of Civilis, which was now beyond the Rhine. Cerealis led his forces down the river and occupied various posts. The tenth was stationed at Arenacum, the village of Rindern, near Cleves, the second at Batavodurum, near Nimugen, while cohorts and ally of the auxiliaries were sent to Gwynes and Vada, places close to each other on the Vahalis. Cerealis himself probably made the town of the Batavians his headquarters. Civilis divided his forces into four parts, to attack these posts of the Romans. The assault on Vada he undertook himself. Grinus was assigned to Classicus, while Tutor and Verax, a nephew of Civilis, marched against Arunacum and Batavadurum. The assault on Arunacum resulted in the slaughter of the prefect of the camp and some officers and soldiers. At Batavadurum, where the Romans were building a bridge across the river, there was an indecisive skirmish. On the Vahalis the fighting was more serious. Julius Briganticus, another nephew of Civilis, but his bitter foe and a faithful adherent of the Romans, was slain, and the Germans, reinforced by Tutor and Verax, were winning the day, when the arrival of Cerealis with a band of cavalry decided the battle in favour of the Romans. The enemy were driven into the river. Civilis and Verax escaped by swimming, and Tutor and Classicus were rescued by boats. They would have been captured if the Roman fleet had come in time. The conduct of the campaign by Cerealis had been marked by great want of caution and great good luck. He did not mature his plans, and yet they generally succeeded. Fortune favoured him when he ought to have failed. But his carelessness about details of discipline proved almost fatal to him, a few days after the victory of Vada. New camps were being constructed at Novasium and Bonna, as winter was approaching, and Cerealis sailed up the Rhine to inspect them. An escort of foot accompanied him, marching along the banks, and, as he was returning, the trans renamed Germans, Tancteri and Bructeri, doubtless, who were on the watch, observed that the soldiers did not keep together and were careless about their night encampments. Choosing a dark night, they entered the camp, cut the ropes of some of the tents, and massacred the soldiers who were unable to extricate themselves. They also dragged away the vessels, including the Praetorian ship of the commander, which was towed up the Lupus and presented as a gift to Veleda. The cause of this disaster was that the watch had fallen asleep, having been ordered not to sound the bucina or trumpet, lest they should disturb Cerealis, who was engaged in a love adventure somewhere in the neighbourhood. Civilis soon abandoned the defence of the Vahalis and retreated beyond the true Rhine into the country of the Frisians. The Romans then crossed the Vahalis and laid waste the Batavian island, sparing, however, the private possessions of Civilis in order to excite the suspicions of his countrymen, just as Archidamus had spared the property of Pericles in the Peloponnesian War and Hannibal that of Fabius Maximus. But the Batavians were ready to return to their allegiance. The Transrhenanes were ready to make peace, and Civilis, seeing the inclinations of his followers, resolved to save his own life by capitulation. He sought an interview with Cerealis. A bridge across the river Nabalis, perhaps the Issel or the Vect, was severed in the centre, and the two leaders conversed from the broken extremities and made their terms. No record remains as to the ultimate fate of Civilis or of his Gallic allies, Classicus and Tutor. The Batavians resumed the same position which they had held before. They paid no tribute but were largely employed as auxiliaries. The submission of the trans renamed Germans, who took part in the war, is shown by the fact that the prophetess Veleda was conveyed as a captive to Rome. We may take it for granted that Mucianus, who along with the emperor's son Domitian, 
Footnote. This circumstance gave the poet Silius an opportunity of addressing the emperor Domitian as Yam pure acrum Yam pure oricomo pre formidate batavo. Juvenal refers to the revolt of Civilis when he speaks of the Domitique batavi custodes aquilas. Had come to Lugdunum in order to be near the scene of operations had a decisive voice in making the final negotiations. The revolt of Civilis could never have taken place but for the strange position in which the Roman Empire was placed after the death of Nero. It was a direct consequence of the action of the Germanic legions, and is merely another act of the same drama to which the civil wars in Italy belonged. It exhibits the mistrust of officers and relaxation of discipline which generally prevailed. If the legions asserted at Betriacum their part in the empire, the auxiliary troops asserted themselves in the movement of Civilis. It was primarily a rebellion of the auxiliaries, but it involved in its train aggressions of the free Germans beyond the Rhine, and the attempt to set up a Gallic empire. Civilis has been called a successor of Arminius, and Arminius, like him, had been an officer in the Roman army but it must be remembered that the Cheruscans were only tributaries, and did not, like the Batavians, supply the army with recruits. The Batavian war was properly a revolt within the army itself, though it accidentally assumed larger proportions. Civilis has also been called a successor of Vindex, but this is due to a misconception. Civilis indeed used the name of Vespasian, as Vindex used the name of Galba, but the idea which, according to all appearance, Vindex cherished of making a Gallic kingdom was renewed not by Civilis, but by Classicus, Tutor, and Sabinus. The Batavians and the Gauls had a common interest in their hostility to Rome, and so far they cooperated. But Civilis had nothing to do with the Imperium Galliarum. It is remarkable, however, that the states which took the leading part in establishing the Gallic kingdom at which Vindex had aimed were the Treveri and Lingones, the very people who had refused to join his enterprise and had sided with Virginius Rufus against him. On the other hand, the Sequani, who had supported the cause of the Aquitanians, declined to move when the same cause was represented by Treverans and Lingons. The events of the rebellion show clearly that the Gauls in general, apart from a few disaffected tribes, had come to see that their true interests were best served by remaining faithful to Rome. They saw that to win freedom by the help of Germans beyond the Rhine would only bring upon them a new Ariovistus. It should also be remarked that the part played by the free Germans was a small one. The revolt only affected those tribes which dwelled close to the Roman Lermes, and did not call forth any movement in central Germany. Moreover, the motive which attracted the Bructeri and the Trenteri to the Batavian standard was rather the hope of immediate plunder than the expectation of any lasting success against the Roman power. When the revolt was quelled, Vespasian adopted the wise policy of letting bygones be bygones. It was of course impossible to ignore the conduct of the Germanic legionaries, who had failed so signally in meeting the responsibility which had fallen to their share who had taken the oath of allegiance to the Julius of Trier. The four legions of the lower province, 1st, 5th, 15th, and 16th, and one legion of the upper, 4th Macedonia, were broken up. The 22nd, the legion of Vocula, was pardoned. But Vespasian had learned a lesson from the rebellion, and he made a very important change in the organization of the auxilia. The cohorts and ally no longer consisted of men of the same nation. Batavians and Treverans, for example, were scattered among all the auxiliary regiments indifferently. Moreover, the command of the auxiliaries was no longer entrusted to natives, like Arminius and Civilis, but to men of Italian origin. And these troops were not employed in the neighbourhood of their homes. The result was that a rebellion like that of Civilis did not occur again. End of chapter 20, section 2《ハプテニスの歴史を読み解くことができます》Chapter 20, Section 3 of J. B. Bury's The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Student's Roman Empire, Part Two, by John Bagnall Bury, Chapter Two. Rebellions in Germany and Judea, sixty-nine to seventy A.D. Section Three. The Revolt of Judea and Destruction of Jerusalem. In regard to the Jews, Claudius followed the policy of Tiberius. Their worship was checked in Italy, but toleration was granted to them in their own land and in the east. Claudius went even further. He gave all the lands which had formed the kingdom of Herod to his friend Herod Agrippa, thus returning, as he loved to do, to the system of Augustus. By this means direct collision between the Romans and Jews was avoided. Agrippa acted as intermediate. But when he died in 44 AD, his son Agrippa, aged 17 years, was considered too young to take his father's place, and Judea was once more made a province of subordinate rank. From this moment a spirit of hatred and rebellion fermented in Judea. The Jews had not forgotten how Gaius had insisted upon receiving divine hours. They feared that another emperor might do the same, and regarded all Roman emperors as abominable. National sentiment and religious bigotry were inseparable for the Jews, and the fanatics burned to cast off the Roman yoke or die in the attempt. The insurrection did not break out till 66 AD, but it was prepared during twenty-two years. The great fault of the Romans was that, instead of stamping out the elements of opposition, they tried to humour an irreconcilable people and yielded, wherever it was possible, to the prejudices and absurd demands of the Jews. Thus a Roman soldier was executed, because he had torn a roll of the law. Another mistake was that too small a military force was kept in the province and was mainly recruited from the province itself. As for the Jews, they brought their destruction upon themselves. The high priests were worthless and violent, and took advantage of the yielding spirit of their rulers to make most unreasonable demands. During these twenty-two years the Romans were continually trying to suppress the brigands of the hills, whom the Jews called zealots. They combined the spirit of the robber with that of the religious fanatic. Cuspius Fidus, the first procurator under Claudius, routed them out of their strongholds and slew them. But the evil broke out again under his successor Tiberius Alexander, a nephew of the philosopher Philo, and he succeeded in capturing two noted leaders, Jacobus and Simon, son of Judas the Galilean, whom he crucified. There was the constant feud between Galilee and Samaria, and the latter district was subject to the incursions of armed bands of Galilean brigands. This led to a serious collision in the year 52 AD, in which Umidius Quadratus, the governor of Syria, was obliged to interfere. The affair was attributed to the rivalry of the two procurators, Cumanus of Galilee and Felix of Judea and Samaria, and Quadratus having held an investigation punished Cumanus and pleased the Jews by executing a tribune named Sella in Jerusalem. Felix, who was equally to blame, escaped because he was the brother of the powerful freedman Pallas, and the husband of Agrippa's sister Drusilla. The troubles continued under Festus and Albinus, the successors of Felix. War against Rome was preached in the streets, miracles and prophecies were the order of the day. The zealots of the hills were as violent as ever. There was no real grievance. It was not the case of an oppressed people rising against oppressors, or bondmen struggling for their freedom. The war was due to the fanaticism of short-sighted peasants. The authority over the temple and its treasures, and the nomination of the high priests, had been assigned in 44 AD, not to the procurator, but to Herod of Chalcis, and after his death in 48 AD had been transferred to his heir Agrippa. In 53 AD, Agrippa had received, instead of Chalcis, the districts of Batanea, Oranitis, Traconitis, Golanitis, and Abilene along with the title of king, and two years later he received from Nero Tiberius and Tarachia in Galilee, and Julius in Perea. Agrippa stood by the Romans faithfully throughout the Jewish war. The insurrection broke out under the procurator Gessius Florus, 64-66 to AD. Caesarea was inhabited by Greeks and Jews possessing the same civil rights, the Jews being the more numerous. But under Nero the Greeks disputed the rights of the Jews and appealed to the government at Rome. Burrus decided in favour of the Greeks, and, 
the citizenship was declared to be a privilege which did not belong to the Jews, 62 AD. This decision led to tumults in the town. Finally, the Jews left Caesarea, but were compelled by the governor to return, and then slaughtered in a street riot, August the 6th, 66 AD. In Jerusalem, things came to a crisis at the same time. The Jews were divided into two parties, the men of moderation, who, putting their trust in the Lord, were ready to endure Roman rule without resistance, and the men of action, who resolved to found the kingdom of heaven by the sword. The former were the Pharisees, the latter the Zealots, and the power of the Zealots was on the increase. To this party belonged Eleazar, son of the high priest Ananias. He was a young man of upright character, but it has been said of him that his virtues were more dangerous than his father's vices. He was the overseer of the temple, and he forbade those who did not belong to the Jewish faith to present offerings to Jehovah in the outer court, although this had always been permitted by tradition. He refused to listen to the remonstrances of the wiser Jews. The moderate party resolved to make an attempt to put down the fanatics. They asked the Romans and King Agrippa for help, and Agrippa sent some cavalry. But Jerusalem was filled with extreme patriots and desperados known as men of the dagger, who were ready to exterminate supporters of Roman rule. The Roman garrison in the citadel was surprised and cut to pieces. The greater number of the moderates, the soldiers of Agrippa, and some Romans, occupied the king's palace on Zion, but could not maintain their position against overwhelming numbers and capitulated. Free departure was refused to the Romans, but they were assured that their lives would be spared. But they were disarmed and cut to pieces. Ananias the high priest and other leaders of the moderate party were slain. After the victory a quarrel broke out between Eleazar, who seems to have felt remorse for the perfidy of his followers and his father's death, and Manahem, the most violent of the men of the dagger. It ended in the execution of Manahem. Thus, in Caesarea, the foes of the Jews had slaughtered the Jews. In Jerusalem the Jews had slaughtered their foes, and it was said that both events happened on the same day. Other Greek towns followed the example of Caesarea. The Jews in Damascus, Gadara, Scythopolis, Ascalon were massacred. The bitterness against them broke out too in Alexandria, and the street tumults required the interference of the Roman troops. As soon as Cestius Gallus, the governor of Syria, heard what had happened in Jerusalem, he set forth with his troops to put down the insurgents. His army consisted of about 20,000 Roman soldiers and 13,000 auxiliaries from the dependent kingdoms, along with forces of Syrian militia. Having taken Joppa and slain its inhabitants, he marched on Jerusalem and stood before its walls in September. But the strong fortifications defied him, and he was driven back with serious loss. The news of the failure of Gallus reached Nero in Greece, and he appointed Mucianus Legatus of Syria, and assigned to Vespasian the task of quelling the Jewish rebellion as an independent legatus. The three legions, which had been sent from the Illyric lands to carry on the war with Parthia, were perhaps already returning to their original stations. If so, they were now sent back on account of the rebellion. Two of them, 5th Macedonia and 15th Apollinaris, were given to Vespasian along with one of the Syrian legions, 10 Fratensis. The other additional legion, 4th Scythia, took the place of the 10th in Syria and remained there permanently. In addition to his three legions and their auxilia, Vespasian had large bodies of troops contributed by the dependent kings of Comagene, Emesa, and Nabatea, as well as by Agrippa. The whole army, amounting to more than 50,000 men, was mustered at Ptolemaeus in spring 67 AD and entered Palestine. The entire country, Galilee and Samaria, as well as Judea, was now in the hands of the insurgents, with the exception of the Greek towns. They had taken and destroyed Anthedon and Gaza, but after they had failed at Ascalon, they confined themselves to defensive measures, and did not meet the Romans in the open field. Vespasian's plan was slow but sure. He decided to make no attempt against Jerusalem until he had isolated it by reducing the surrounding districts. The first campaign was occupied with the reduction of Galilee and the coast as far as Ascalon. In this warfare, the historian Josephus played a considerable part. The siege of Jotapata, which he defended, lasted forty-five days. 
he was a member of the moderate party, but was appointed commander in Galilee. Josephus escaped with his life and found favor with Vespasian, whose client he became, adopting the name Titus Flavius. During the following winter, Vespasian kept two legions at Caesarea, and stationed a third at Scythopolis, so as to cut off communications between Judea and Galilee. In the spring of 68 AD, he proceeded to occupy the regions beyond the Jordan, including the important towns of Gadara and Gerasa. The fugitives, who were driven from their homes by the Roman soldiers, flocked to increase the multitude collected in Jerusalem. Vespasian then took up quarters at Jericho. Samaria was occupied in the north, Idumea in the south, and the legions were about to advance on Jerusalem when the news of Nero's death arrived. Vespasian was not disposed to put himself in a false position by continuing to act as legatus, until his powers should be renewed by Nero's successor. Military operations were therefore suspended, and before Galba could send his commands to Vespasian, winter had approached. The fall of Galba and the struggle between Otho and Vitellius gave the Jews a still longer respite, and when, after the proclamation of Vitellius, Vespasian began to resume operations, his own elevation again interrupted the warfare and it was not till the spring of 70 A.D. that his son Titus marched against Jerusalem to end the miserable episode. Jerusalem, in the meantime, was a scene of wild confusion. The leader of the moderate party had been slain, the zealots reigned supreme and quarrelled and fought among themselves. There were three main parties, one headed by Eleazar, son of Simon, and consisting of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, occupied the inner enclosure of the temple. The outer court of the temple was held by John of Giscala and his Galileans. Another party, under Simon, son of Joas of Gerasa, held the upper town, the hill of Zion. But when the Romans came, these factions composed their differences and fought side by side. Eleazar's party placed itself under John, and thus the rivalry was narrowed to two competitors, Simon in the city and John in the temple. Titus might have blockaded the city and starved the inhabitants out, but he wished to inaugurate the new Flavian dynasty and make his own reputation by a brilliant exploit. Jerusalem was defended on all sides by impregnable rocks except on the north, on which side it had been attacked by the Assyrians, and more recently by Pompeius. Herod Agrippa had attempted to strengthen the fortifications on this accessible side, but the Romans had prevented him. The walls which he had planned were hastily raised under the direction of the Sanhedrin during the insurrection. The task of Titus was not an easy one. When he had stormed the outer wall and penetrated into the new city, a second wall met him which he had to pass before he could reach the lower city on the hill of Acre. Then he had to storm the temple, surrounded by an inner and an outer wall, and the adjoining citadel, called Antonia. The strong defences of Zion, on which the upper city was built, and the palace of Herod still remained. The forces of Titus had been increased by another legion from Syria, twelfth Fulminata. The first wall resisted for a long time all the attempts of the assailants, but at length fell beneath the battering ram. Many of the besieged would then have been willing to submit, in fear of the famine which threatened them, and the Roman general sent Josephus to the wall to offer honourable terms. But the chiefs would not hear of surrender. Then Titus drew a wall of circumvallation around the city, and cut off all external supplies from the inhabitants, while they continued their attacks on the second wall. The sufferings of the Jews from famine became terrible. A woman was known to kill her child for food. At this time a half-witted fanatic, Joshua the son of Hanan, went about the public places shouting, A voice of ruin from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south, and... Woe to Jerusalem! None dared to hinder or punish him. One day he uttered a new cry, Woe to me also! And at the same moment he was killed by a stone from a catapult of the besiegers. All sorts of portents were said to have occurred. The doors of the temple burst open, and a voice more than human cried, Let us depart hence! And a great sound of departure was heard. At last, at the end of three months, the second wall was passed, and the citadel Antonia taken. This castle, close to the temple and overlooking it, was destroyed by the Romans except one wing which was left standing as a watchtower. 
Titus then allowed considerable numbers of the population to leave the town. But the zealots remained deaf to the expostulations of Josephus and the admonitions of the Jews who had been taken captive in the lower city. They refused to spare the temple by timely submission to the besiegers. They carried on the work of defence with no regard to the sacred character of the place, and even desecrated the Holy of Holies by their presence. For a long time they baffled the assaults of the Romans, but the defence of the outer temple wall gradually relaxed, and at length the burning missiles of the assailants set fire to the northern portion. The two leaders, John of Giscala and Simon, son of Joris, with some of their followers, escaped by the connecting causeway which they broke down behind them into the upper city. But the multitude and the priests stood firm in the inner enclosure. The Romans with difficulty passed the outer wall, making a path for themselves with the help of fire, which soon spread and consumed the royal porch of Herod. Many of the Jews perished in the flames, the rest were cut down in a final struggle. The temple and its treasures were burned to the ground, August. The chiefs still lay behind the defences of the upper city, hopeless yet resolved not to yield. But a discord raged among the garrison of the last stronghold, and a large number of Jews gave themselves up to the Romans. The rest were reduced by famine, and the chiefs at last abandoned the defence of the rampart, and sought refuge in the subterranean passages with which the hill was honeycombed, and by which they hoped to reach the valleys beyond. The Romans then entered and slew, plundered, and burned, September the 2nd. The siege had lasted over five months, but at length Jerusalem was laid in ruins. Simon and John, unable to escape in the underground galleries, and pressed by hunger, came forth from their holes, and surrendered. The life of John was spared, but Simon was reserved for the triumph, and put to death afterwards. Those of the insurgents who escaped, held out for years in the rock fortresses of Masada and Machaerus, near the Dead Sea. The captives were put to death or sold into slavery. Many died from starvation, refusing to accept food from their warders. Although Vespasian and Titus disdained to add to their names the title of Judaicus, drawn from a people whom they despised, they did not omit to celebrate a triumph in honour of the victory, and an arch was erected by the Senate to Titus after his death, on which may still be seen a sculpture of the golden candlestick with seven branches, which was rescued from the sanctuary of the temple. Another arch was erected during his lifetime in the circus, and the dedication celebrates his capture of Jerusalem, which all leaders kings and nations before him had either attacked in vain or left wholly unattempted. The statement is ludicrously false, and if we can excuse the Senate for ignorance of the Assyrian siege or even of that of Antiochus Epiphanes, we cannot understand their ignoring Pompeius. The demolition of Jerusalem, which lay in ruins as Carthage and Corinth had once lain, deprived the Jewish nation of a centre. The high priesthood and the Sanhedrin were abolished, and the Israelites were left without a head. The yearly tribute which every Jew, wherever he dwelled, used to send to the temple, was now, by a sort of bitter parody, to be sent to the temple of Capitoline Jupiter. It is a disputed question whether Titus really wished to destroy the temple with all its wonders, or whether its destruction was an accident which he deplored. It seems on the whole more likely that its destruction was part of the political scheme which the Roman government had devised to settle the petty, but troublesome Jewish question once for all. It should be taken in connection with the fact that Vespasian at the same time closed the temple of Onias near Memphis in Egypt, the chief sanctuary of the Egyptian Jews. The conflagration was a matter for praise to the Roman poet Valerius Flaccus, who in the invocation of his Argonautics celebrates Titus for scattering the torches in Solima. Solimic nigrantum pulvere fratum. Spargentemque faces et in omni torre furentum. Judea became a province of the empire, and the camp of the tenth legion, footnote, the twelfth legion was sent to Cappadocia, the fifth and fifteenth back to their quarters in Moesia and Pannonia, respectively. End of footnote, which was left as its garrison, was pitched on the ruins of the fallen capital. Henceforward the troops levied in Judea were employed elsewhere. A settlement of Roman veterans was made at Emmaus. In Samaria, the chief town, Sichem, was organized under the name Flavia Neapolis, as a Greek city. On the other hand, Caesarea, hitherto a Greek city, was made a Flavian colonia of the Roman type. 
King Agrippa, who had supported the Romans loyally, retained his possessions as long as he lived, but on his death about thirty years later, his kingdom was incorporated in the province of Syria. End of chapter 20, section 3《Chapter 21, Sections 1 to 2 of J. B. Bury's The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Penfold. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2, by John Bagnell Bury. Chapter 21, Vespasian Titus and Domitian, Sections 1-2 to two. Section 1. Vespasian The new ruler of the Roman world, Titus Flavius Vespasianus, has the distinction of having founded a new dynasty. Indeed, he might claim to be considered a second Augustus, somewhat as Augustus claimed to be a second Romulus. He was called upon to perform a task of the same kind as that which Augustus wrought, though on a far smaller scale. The conqueror of Vitellius, like the conqueror of Antonius, had to pacify the state and restore order after civil wars. The wars which followed the death of Nero were not as great in importance or duration as those which followed the death of Julius, but they were serious enough to put the state out of joint, and Vespasian has the glory of having set it right so effectively that the machine went smoothly for another century, during which the empire enjoyed peace and plenty. Vespasian was not a man of originality, he had not a spark of genius, but then no new ideas were required for his work. He merely confirmed the Augustan system and rectified it in some details. He was fully equal to the task which fell to his lot. It required strength of character, and he was strong. It required the plainest common sense, and he had no illusions of imagination. It required caution, and he was not rash. It required determination, and when he had made up his mind, nothing deterred him from carrying out his resolve. The elevation of a Sabine of humble birth to the Principate is a symptom of the leveling process which was gradually raising Italy to an equality with Rome. Hitherto no man who was not of high Roman descent was regarded as a possible candidate for the empire. In appearance, the homely Vespasian was very different from the aristocratic Augustus. He was square and firmly built his neck thick, his features coarse, his eyes small. As a soldier he was competent, but not brilliant. He had enjoyed a fair education, and could speak and write Greek with ease. He was careless of appearances, and was not ashamed of his humble origin. He laughed at the flattery of the poets who tried to discover a heroic origin for his municipal family. He had a sharp and homely wit, an anecdote is related of him that, having been criticized by Florus for pronouncing the word plaustrum, a wagon, in provincial fashion, plostrum, he addressed Florus on meeting him next day as O Flare. He was not perhaps naturally superstitious, but while he was at Alexandria, oriental flatterers practiced on his credulity. A blind man and a cripple alleged that the god Serapis had assured them that the new imperator possessed the divine power of healing their infirmities. Vespasian was persuaded to touch the eyes of the blind with his spittle and to place his foot on the lame man. Immediately the blind received his sight, and the lame walked. Vespasian was deceived by the imposture, and was filled with a deep respect for the oracles of Serapis. He married Flavia Domitila, and by her had three children. Titus, Domitian, and Domitilla. After her death he did not marry again, but formed a permanent connection known as Contubernium with a freedwoman named Sanus, with whom he had been intimate before his marriage. Vespasian did not arrive in Rome until the summer of 70 AD. Before he returned, the Senate had taken in hand the restoration of the capital, for while the temple of Jupiter Capitolinus lay in ruins, it was believed that the empire could not be prosperous. The work was entrusted to L. Vestinus, a knight of high reputation, although such works usually devolved upon senators. The ruins of the old temple were removed, by the orders of the Herospices, so that the new edifice might be erected on the foundations of the old. For the gods do not wish the old form to be changed. 
On the 21st June, being a fair day, soldiers whose names were auspicious, such as Valerius or Salvius, entered the arena, crowned with garlands. And the Vestal Virgins, along with boys and girls, both of whose parents were alive, sprinkled the site with the water of springs and running streams. The praetor, Helvidius Priscus, then purified it by the blood of a boar, a weather, and a bull, and having placed the entrails on an altar of turf, repeated after the pontifex a prayer to Jupiter, Juno, Minerva, and the patron gods of Rome, to prosper the undertaking, and by divine help raise the temple. Then he touched the fillets which bound the foundation stone, and it was dragged to the spot where it was destined to lie by the combined efforts of priests, senators, knights, and the people. Heaps of gold and silver coins, never used for profane purposes, and nuggets of unwrought metal, were then cast on the foundations. The new temple was built on the plan of the old one, but the haruspices permitted Vespasian to raise it to a greater height than the temple restored by Catullus. This striking ceremony and the rebuilding of the capital were a fitting inauguration of the era introduced by the accession of Vespasian, an era of peace and tranquillity. The temple of Janus was closed in the following year, 71 A.D., after the return of Titus from the conquest of Judea, and the peace which Vespasian bestowed upon the world was, like the Pax Augusta, appreciated by his contemporaries, celebrated by poets, and impressed on coins. Vespasian followed the example of Augustus, and the more recent example of Galba, in taking to himself a consort in the empire. Both the proconsular imperium and the tribunician power were conferred on his son Titus at the same time, and thus Titus held a position like that which Tiberius held in the last years of Augustus. The object of Vespasian was not to lighten his own labors, but to secure the succession for his son. Titus was allowed to assume more of the imperial privileges than had been conceded to any consort before. He wore the laurel wreath, and vota were offered in his name. He also styled himself Imperator, but while Vespasian used this title as a praenomen, Titus bore it as a cognomen, Titus Caesar Imperator Vespasianus. The position of Titus was also rendered unique in another way. The dangers which threatened the Principate from the power which was in the hands of the Praetorian Prefect had been clearly shown in the course of recent history. The appointment of two prefects was one solution of the difficulty but Vespasian found a more effective solution by entrusting it to his son and consort. Vespasian made no alteration in the constitution of the Principate, but he attempted to introduce some innovations in practice. He seems to have laid less stress than his predecessors on the Tribunitia Potestis, and to have even intended to discontinue the official counting of the years of his reign as Tribunitian years. He seems to have contemplated a return to the first system of Augustus, 27 to 23 B.C., which based the position of the princeps mainly on the consulate. He was ordinary consul himself in every year of his reign except two, 73 and 78 A.D., and his son and consort Titus was generally his colleague. But nothing came of this unusual series of imperial consulates. It was only tentative and did not affect the future development of the principate. Vespasian was respectful to the Senate, but he did not permit it such independence as it enjoyed under Augustus, Tiberius, Claudius, and in the early reign of Nero. By exercising an influence on its composition, he tried to render it dependent on the emperor. This influence he exercised in two ways. By frequent consular elections, which he was able to control, he increased the number of the consulares, and, in 73 A.D., he assumed the censorship along with Titus, and exercised the censorial power of adlection to the Senate. At the same time he created a number of patrician families to take the place of the old nobility which was exhausted. A new aristocracy dates from this reign. Vespasian abolished, chiefly in favor of Italians and provincials, trials for maestas, but, on the other hand, he did not permit processes to be instituted against delators, and this clemency displeased the aristocracy. There was a party of opposition in his reign, just as in the reigns of his predecessors, consisting of stoic and cynic philosophers, and discontented nobles full of vain and unpractical theories. Under Nero, their leader had been Thracia. Under Vespasian, it was Thracia's son-in-law, Helvetius Priscus. He was a man of no judgment. Infatuated with an idea of an impossible republic, dreaming still of Cato and Brutus, he had written a book entitled The Praise of Cato, 
he was unable to distinguish between the tyranny of a Nero and the good government of a Vespasian. He not only indulged in untimely opposition, but took part in conspiracies, and at length, like Thracia, he died a martyr to a vain aspiration. Vespasian caused a decree for his banishment to be passed, and then ordered his death. The sects of the Stoics and Cynics were banished from the city, and here popular opinion probably supported Vespasian. These philosophers kept up a constant agitation by their tracts against monarchy. The Stoic, Musonius Rufus, was honorably accepted from the decree of exile. He knew that the monarchy was a necessity, and he did not bark. The only other execution of note, besides that of Priscus, was that of Cecina, the general who betrayed Vitellius. He was put to death for implication in a conspiracy, in 79 AD, by the order of Titus. The most difficult and most ungrateful problem that Vespasian was called upon to solve was the ordering of the finances of the state. The treasuries were empty, and a large outlay was urgently demanded, both in the provinces and in Italy. The extravagance of Nero's reign, followed by a year of civil war, had plunged the state in bankruptcy. Vespasian required means not only for the ordinary expenses of administration, but for carrying out the work and repairs which had been neglected during the last years, owing to want of funds. He had to renew the fortifications of the Rhine frontier, which had been destroyed in the rebellion of the Batavians, and he had to help Rome and Italy to recover from the disasters of the recent wars. He calculated that a sum of forty billion sesterces, about 320 million lira, was required to raise the prostrate republic. The census was held, 73 AD, in order to set the revenue in order and adjust the taxation, and this was one of the emperor's chief objects in assuming the censorship. Like all rulers to whom the task has fallen of rescuing a state from pecuniary embarrassment, he was obliged to make the burdens severe and to practice strict economy, and like all such rulers he got little thanks. His fiscal strictness and policy of retrenching made him unpopular. He was called avaricious and parsimonious. He renewed imposts which had been remitted by Galba and instituted new taxes. He raised, in some cases even doubled, the tributes of the provinces. He exercised strict control over the fiscal officers, who under a careless princeps were in the habit of diverting the public money into their private chests. Some pieces of public land in Italy, destined for the occupation of veterans, but still unassigned, had been unlawfully occupied, and Vespasian endeavored to resume these for the state. He retrenched the expenses of the court, and by his own frugal life set the example of moderation. The extravagant luxury which had prevailed at the courts of Claudius and Nero seems to have gone out of fashion. The great public buildings which he erected show that he succeeded in filling the treasury. The fire of Nero's reign, as well as the fire which attended the fall of Vitellius and ushered in the Flavians, had given opportunity for the erection of new buildings. Rome rose again from her ashes. Roma resurgens is one of the mottoes on coins of Vespasian. Besides the temple of Jupiter, already mentioned, Vespasian built a temple to Peace, the goddess whom he preeminently revered, in 75 A.D. This temple was connected with an open place which resembled the fora of Caesar and Augustus, but was not called a forum, not being used for forensic purposes. It lay behind the Basilica Aemilia and east of the Forum Augusti, from which it was separated by the Argelitum. Domitian afterwards connected the Forum Augusti with the Templum Passis by the Forum Transitorium. Pliny counted the Temple of Peace among the finest works in the world. Vespasian deposited in it the golden treasures which Titus brought back from the temple of Jerusalem. On the southeast side of this place he erected a templum sacre orbis, which served for keeping the archives of the census. But the great work by which Vespasian will be remembered is the huge amphitheater which he built in the hollow between the Esquiline and the Salian to take the place of the amphitheater of Taurus in the campus, which had been burnt down in the great fire. This building, now popularly known as the Colosseum, rose almost as high as the capital itself and accommodated nearly 90,000 spectators. One of the most important cares of Vespasian was the organization of the Praetorian Guard. The cohorts formed by Vitellius out of the Germanic legions had in any case to be broken up, but Vespasian had to decide whether he would accept the innovation of his predecessor and form the new guard out of his own victorious legions and adopt the increased number of sixteen cohorts instead of nine. 
both political and financial considerations induced him to return to the system of Augustus. If he filled up the praetorian cohorts from certain legions and not from others, insolence on the one hand and jealousy on the other would be the necessary results, while the treasury could not afford to increase the number of highly paid troops. He therefore established again the old number of nine cohorts, and renewed the practice of recruiting them from Italians. In regard to the legionaries, he had to replace the Germanic troops who were dismissed in consequence of the part they played in the rebellion of Civilis by three new legions, second adjutrix, four, Flavia Felix, sixteenth, Flavia Firma. From this time forth, Italians do not seem to have been recruited as legionaries. This, however, was probably the natural result of their privilege, and not due to any enactment excluding them. In the provincial administration, which was marked by the appointment of good governors, several changes took place. Ius Latinum was conferred upon all the peregrine town communities of Spain, and the new citizens were enrolled in the tribus Quirinia, 74 A.D. The same privilege was probably bestowed upon the Helvetians. Achaia, which Nero in his Philhellenic enthusiasm had declared free, was made tributary again and restored to the Senate, while Sardinia and Corsica were transferred back to the Emperor. The two Cilicias, rough and smooth, were united as a single province under an imperial governor, 73 through 74 AD, and Lycia and Pamphylia were similarly united. The dependent kingdom of Commagene was incorporated in the province of Syria, 72 A.D., the governor of Syria, Cecinius Paetus, having accused King Antiochus of conspiring with Parthia. This change must have been an advantage for the inhabitants, who must have been more severely taxed to keep up a small sovereignty than as tributaries of Rome. The Parthian king tried ineffectually to procure the restoration of King Antiochus, and it is possible that these negotiations, as well as the refusal of Rome to help Parthia against the Alans, may have led to a breach between the two powers, which resulted in hostilities in 77 A.D., when M. Ulpius Trajanus was governor of Syria. Vologeses invaded the province, but was compelled to retire by Trajan, the future emperor, who received for his services the triumphal insignia, and was appointed proconsul of Asia two years later. The eastern frontier was now protected not only by the four legions of Syria, but by a legion in the newly organized province of Galatia and Cappadocia, which was entrusted to a legatus Augusti pro praetore. Vespasian's measures for the protection of the Danube frontier and the wars of his lieutenant in Britain will be more conveniently told in subsequent chapters. Vespasian died on June 23, 79 A.D., at the age of 70. During his last illness he carried on his public business as usual, and said that an imperator ought to die standing. He was consecrated by a decree of the Senate, like Claudius and Augustus. Section 2. Titus. Titus, already imperator, already endowed with a tribunician power, was elected princeps, and Augustus without a demurring voice. Born in the first year of Claudius, he had been educated along with Britannicus. He accompanied his father to Judea, and had been sent to announce to Galba the adhesion of the eastern army. He was well educated, eloquent and accomplished, and of great personal beauty. His conquest of Jerusalem established his military reputation. He was fond of pleasure and dissipation. While he was in the east, he became the lover of Berenice, sister of Agrippa, and during his father's reign she lived with him at Rome as his mistress. But to the Romans, who might have tolerated a Greek concubine, this open connection of the consort of the emperor with a Jewess was a scandal, and Titus yielded to their prejudices, much against his will. Berenice returned to her country, but visited Rome once more after the death of Vespasian. Titus, however, was firm, and refused to sacrifice his influence to her seductions. He had been married twice, and by his second wife, Marcia Fernilla, had a daughter, Julia, on whom he conferred the title Augusta, after the example set by Nero in the case of Claudia. The great aim of Titus was to make himself popular. He was already the darling of the soldiers, and when he became princeps he courted favor with the aristocracy as well as with the populace. 
thus his short reign bears in several respects the character of a reaction against his father's policy he ingratiated himself with the senate by punishing delators who were scourged in the amphitheatre and deported to islands he did not like his father exercise control over the public officials and he allowed peculation to go on unchecked he was lavish in giving away and said that no one ought to leave the presence of the princeps disappointed an anecdote is told that one evening at supper he remembered that he had bestowed no gift on any one during the day and said to his friends i have lost this day he built magnificent baths the thermae of titus for the people and on the occasion of the dedication of the great amphitheatre eighty a d he exhibited shows which lasted for a hundred days there were combats of gladiators in which women took part and five thousand animals were slain the arena was then filled with water and a sea fight took place representing the battle of the corinthians and corsarians recorded by thucydides there was also a representation of the siege of syracuse in the naumatia of augustus at the end of the exhibitions tickets for a distribution of eatables were thrown to the populace by acts like these he wasted the funds accumulated by the economy of his father just as gaius had wasted the treasury of tiberius the reign of titus was marked by public misfortunes at rome and in campania a fire broke out in the city eighty a d and consumed the new temple of jupiter capitolinus not yet quite completed it also injured the pantheon and thermae of agrippa the theatres of pompeius and balbus and the portico of octavia in seventy nine a d august twenty third twenty fourth the great eruption of vesuvius took place which overwhelmed the cities of pompeii and herculaneum owing to this disaster a picture of the greek civilization of campania was safely preserved under the lava for the benefit of the present century a description of the eruption has been preserved by an eyewitness the younger pliny whose uncle the elder pliny perished by approaching too nearly the volcanic eruption which was also fatal to the lyric poet cassius basis the health of titus was seriously undermined before he became princeps and no remedies availed to cure him he died in his father's native district at riate on september thirteenth eighty one a d his short term of power was not stained by a single execution of a senator and the romans regretted his death but it is impossible to know what he might have turned out if he had lived longer he began somewhat like nero and gaius and it is possible that when he had exhausted the treasury he might have ended like nero and gaius too he was popular the darling of the world but his popularity rested on a false foundation and he bequeathed to his successor the invidious task of replenishing the fiscus which his extravagance had well nigh emptied the brevity of his reign was indeed fortunate for titus who like his father was enrolled among the gods end of chapter twenty one sections one and two recording by mark penfold chapter twenty one section three of j b bury's the student's roman empire part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by mark penfold the student's roman empire part two by john bagnell bury chapter twenty one vespasian titus and domitian sixty nine to ninety six a d section three domitian titus was succeeded by his brother domitian who had just reached the age of thirty it has been already mentioned how he escaped from the sack of the capital by the fetellians and was saluted as caesar after the flavian victory but mucianus did not allow him to exercise political power he was eager to win military fame like his brother and wished to take part in the batavian war but mucianus urged that it would be enough to exhibit the pomp of the principate at lugdunum as cerealis had nearly finished the war domitian yielded but was so disgusted at his want of influence that when he returned to rome he refused any longer to act as a figurehead in public matters and retired to a via on the alban mount 
where he lived with his mistress Domitia, daughter of Corbulo, the hero of the Armenian Wars. But in the few months during which he had represented his father, he had tasted the pleasures of power and sovereignty, and he felt bitter when, after his father's return, he was kept strictly in the background. He lived with his father, and it was thus clearly shown that he was under the patria potestas. He was jealous of his brother who had been made consort in the empire. While Vespasian and Titus were born in the cella, Domitian had to follow in the lectica. He was six times consul, but only once at the beginning of the year, 73 A.D., and then because Titus retired in his favor. He still yearned to distinguish himself in warfare, and when the Parthian king asked for Roman help against an invasion of the Alans, Domitian left nothing undone to induce Vespasian to send him, and when Vespasian refused, he tried by gifts to induce other eastern potentates to make similar requests for help. Outwardly, indeed, Domitian received all the honors which an emperor's son might expect. He was allowed to wear the laurel wreath, his image was represented on coins, and his superscription along with those of his father and brother on public buildings. He was made a member of all the sacred colleges. But he had no political influence, he was given no opportunity of winning military renown, and no mere outward marks of honor could reconcile him to his position. It was said that on his father's death he formed the plan of bribing the praetorians to make him imperator by a double donative. He seems at all events to have hoped that he would occupy the same place under Titus which Titus himself had occupied under Vespasian. But though Titus recognized him in an unofficial way as his consort and successor, the proconsular imperium and tribunician power were not conferred upon him. This was a new and bitter disappointment, and there is no doubt that jealousy and suspicion prevailed between the brothers. Titus, however, really regarded Domitian as his successor, for he had no male children, and in order to avoid any question about the succession, he actually proposed a marriage between his daughter Julia and Domitian. Unions between uncles and nieces had been legitimized by Claudius, but they were a gross defiance of old Roman prejudices, and Domitian was a strong upholder of Roman religion. Besides this, he was passionately fond of his mistress Domitia, whom he married, and the idea of Titus fell through. Julia was united to her cousin Flavius Sabinus, the son of Vespasian's brother, who perished in the Vitellian catastrophe. Domitian had ridden at full speed to Rome from his brother's bedside, and was greeted imperator by the praetorians, and he counted September 13th as the Dies Imperii, from which he also dated his tribunician year, although the tribunicia potestas was not conferred upon him till September 30th. He assumed the chief pontificate immediately, and also the title Pater Patriae, which his predecessors had been accustomed not to accept for some time after the accession. This trait is characteristic of the autocratic and imperious nature of Domitian. The reign of Domitian was marked by a new and distinct departure in autocratic policy, forming, it is hardly too much to say, an epoch in the growth of the Principate towards absolute monarchy. By important wars against Dacians and Germans on the Danube frontier, and by the advance of Roman arms in Britain. These wars will be described in the following chapter. Here must be mentioned a small campaign on the Rhine, by which Domitian secured the military distinction which he had desired and which befitted the position of an imperator. In 83 AD the emperor proceeded to Gaul on the plea of a census in that country, but his real object was to cross the Rhine and invade the country of the Chatai. What the Chatai had done to provoke this attack is not known. The chastisement of their plundering bands, which often troubled the upper province, hardly required an imperial expedition. In any case a victory was gained over the Chatai, and Domitian celebrated a splendid triumph, and assumed the name Germanicus, by which he is constantly called in contemporary literature. His enemies ridiculed this victory as a mere farce, and it was maliciously whispered that in the triumphal procession slaves wearing wigs of fair hair and dressed in German fashion acted the part of Chattic captives. On the other hand, the poets seeking for imperial favor exaggerated the imperial exploit. The victory, of whatever nature it was, must have been of some importance, though this is not always recognized, and it was connected with a new plan of frontier defense, which will be described in the following chapter. 
in the beginning of his reign domitian was gracious to the senate as the senators themselves admitted like Titus, he put down delation and punished delators on the principle that unless a delator is chastised, he is encouraged. But when the emperor had established his power securely and felt himself after his Germanic triumph a true imperator, he soon began to let the nobles see that they were greatly mistaken if they expected him to adhere to the constitution of Augustus. Naturally endowed with a capacity for governing, and imbued with an autocratic spirit, he was determined to rule the state himself. The joint rule of the Senate, the diarchy which Augustus had framed so tenderly, seemed to Domitian intolerable, and he aimed at reducing it to a nullity. Other emperors had indeed assumed more than their own share of the government, and made the Senate fill its dependent position. But they had done so only by fits and starts. Tiberius and Nero had been autocratic in their last years, but they had made no constitutional innovation vitally affecting the relation between princeps and senate. But Domitian worked towards the political annihilation of the senate, systematically and in cold blood, and that is why the senatorial party regarded him with such intense hatred. 1. It has been already explained that the princeps exercised influence on the constitution of the senate by his right of commendation in the case of those magistracies which conferred admission to that body, but he had no right of directly appointing senators. Such right of adlection, as it was called, could only be exercised by the censor, and the censorial power did not belong to the competence of the princeps, according to the Augustan constitution. Claudius had assumed the censorship, and more recently Vespasian had assumed it, but in each case only to lay it down again at the end of a year. In fact, the maintenance of the censorship as an independent magistracy, not connected with the principate as such, but which the princeps or any other eligible citizen might fill when required, was an essential feature of the principate, and Domitian saw this clearly. He saw that the censorship was the means by which he could reduce the position of the Senate to insignificance. Once the princeps possessed the powers of a censor perpetually, the control of the senate was entirely in his hands, and the system of Augustus was undermined. Domitian did not hesitate. He first caused the censoria protestas to be conferred on him, end of 84 or early in 85 AD, but a few months later assumed the office of censor for life. With this power of electing and ejecting whomsoever he chose, he made the senate completely dependent on his own will. The Principate thus received a permanent shock, for his successors, though they did not assume the title of censor, silently retained the censorial powers. The Senate continued, indeed, to share the cares of government. Its nominal position in the Constitution remained unchanged, but virtually the Principate had become a monarchy without disguise. In connection with this important innovation, it is probable that the Census Office, a Censibus Populus Romanus, which was under the control of the Senate, was made an imperial office over which a knight presided. 2. Domitian was consul ten times during his principate, seven times in succession from 82 to 88 AD, then again in 90, 92, and 95 AD. He never continued in office beyond the 1st of May, sometimes not beyond the Ides of January, but it looks as if he intended to assert for the princeps the right of giving the name to the year. In this he was following the example of his father, who throughout his reign generally assumed the consulship. But Domitian went further than Vespasian. In 84 AD he caused himself to be designated consul for ten years. He had precedents for this in the case of Tiberius, who, along with Sejanus, had been designated consul for five years, 29 AD, and in that of Nero, who had been designated for ten years, 58 AD. Neither Tiberius nor Nero had cared to carry out their designations, and Domitian did not fully carry out his, but he went nearer to a continuous consulship than any of his predecessors since the consulships of Augustus himself from 30 to 23 BC. 3. The Senate was very anxious, for its own safety, to have the principle laid down that the emperor was incompetent to condemn a senator to death. Titus had acted on this principle, but he had not formally admitted it. Domitian, a strong asserter of the higher power of the princeps, refused to recognize a decree of this kind which the Senate wished to pass. And what made matters worse was that Domitian formed his concilium out of knights as well as senators, so that when a senator was tried before the imperial court, a knight might be one of his judges. 
4. Practically, Domitian treated the Senate as of no account. He only asked its opinion on matters of no consequence, and he constantly used his right of voting first in order to force the rest to vote as he willed. The senators were completely cowed. 5. In outward forms, too, Domitian displayed his autocratic spirit. The procurators were permitted to designate the emperor as Dominus ac Deus, and the same expression was used by the poets, but it was not recognized as an official title. The citizens, however, always spoke of him as Dominus. Domitian was regarded by the people as something very different from a first citizen. Further, he regularly wore the purple garment of triumph, even when he appeared in the Senate. He was attended by twenty-four instead of twelve lictors, and he allowed only statues of gold and silver to be set up in his honor. If Vespasian had made Augustus his model, Domitian derived precepts of government from the memoirs of Tiberius, a book which he constantly studied. Like Tiberius, he was an able and clear-headed ruler. He controlled with a strong hand the officials both in the provinces and in the city. Only those were appointed of whose personal devotion the emperor was secure, and this principle was applied even to senatorial provinces. Candidates whom Domitian mistrusted were induced to withdraw, and received in compensation the proconsular salary of a million sesterces. But Domitian, unlike Tiberius, did not suffer the praetorian prefects to gain any political influence, like that which Sejanus and Tigalius had possessed. In this he was following the example of his father. Domitian was fully conscious that the independent position of the emperor in regard to the senate necessarily rested on the support of the army. The Flavian dynasty had been set up by the soldiers. Both Vespasian and Titus had maintained its military character. But Domitian went even further than they in displaying the importance of the legions and in emphasizing his own character as imperator. His breach with the senate rendered him more dependent on the favor of the army. He added a very large item to the yearly expenditure by increasing the pay of the legionary soldiers by one-third, from nine to twelve arai, and that of the praetorians in a similar proportion. The ordering of the finances was one of the most difficult problems for Domitian, as for his father. The extravagance of Titus had diminished the full treasury of Vespasian, and Domitian had no intention of resuming Vespasian's policy of parsimony. On the contrary, Domitian was a most open-handed sovereign. His liberality to his friends was profuse, and like Titus, he entertained the populace with frequent games and shows on a magnificent scale. On these occasions he distributed congiaria, or bread money, among the poorer citizens, at the rate of three hundred sesterces each. He tried to diminish the burdens of the people, and cancelled arrears due to the errarium of longer standing than five years. He abandoned the claim of the state, which had been enforced by Vespasian, to the unallotted strips of land in Italy. In his financial measures he was assisted by the advice of Claudius Etruscus, who had been a minister of Nero. But a policy of this kind could not be permanent. The wars in Britain and on the Danube were costly, while the buildings which he undertook and the spectacles which he exhibited demanded immense sums. To increase the tribute and oppress the mass of the population was against the traditions of the empire, and especially opposed to the principles of Domitian. He was thus placed in the same circumstances which had driven Gaius and Nero into a systematic course of plundering the nobility. But other motives, along with these financial necessities, contributed to make the last days of Domitian a reign of terror for the aristocracy. His wife Domitia had borne him one son, who had died in childhood, and without an heir Domitian did not feel secure. He saw in every distinguished man a possible successor, a possible assassin. His suspicions and fears were confirmed and increased by the rebellion of L. Antonius Saturninus, probably early in 88 A.D., the governor of Upper Germany. He was a man of noble family, and had accomplices in the senatorial ranks. He induced the two legions which were stationed in his headquarters, eleven Claudia and twenty-one Rapax, to proclaim him imperator, and he relied for the success of his enterprise on the assistance of the free Germans beyond the Rhine, doubtless the Chatai. The revolt, however, was promptly and unexpectedly suppressed by L. Apius Maximus Nurbanus, who arrived with the Eighth Legion and defeated the forces of Saturninus who had not received the aid of his German allies, because the ice on the Rhine had suddenly thawed and prevented their crossing. It is not known for certain where Nurbanus and his legion came from, 
but it seems probable that he was the legatus of the legion stationed at mogentiacum and thus a subordinate of saturninus who was doubtless stationed at vindonissa the battle took place perhaps in the neighborhood of basilia the news of the revolt caused great consternation at rome and domitian himself went forth to suppress the pretender but heard on the march that nurbanus had anticipated him domitian left nothing undone to discover the fellow-conspirators of saturninus and roman senators are said to have been subjected to horrible tortures in the investigations which followed many were put to death and almost all the officers in the rebellious army were executed from this time forth domitian developed into a suspicious tyrant somewhat like tiberius in his later years he hated and feared the aristocracy and the aristocracy hated and feared him his niece julia whom he had refused to marry but whom he afterwards seduced from her husband flavius sabinus had exercised upon him a softening influence and after her death in eighty nine a d he felt that he had no one whom he could trust he still devoted his time to public business with unwearying diligence but he lived solitary inaccessible and misanthropic at a later period he made some provision for the succession to the principate he had two cousins flavius sabinus the husband of julia and flavius clemens husband of flavia domitilla domitian let it be understood that he destined the two infant sons of clemens to be his successors he changed their names to vespasian and domitian and entrusted their education to the learned quintilian another cause which operated in converting domitian into a tyrant was the continuance of that irritating and obstinate stoic opposition which we have seen at work under nero and again under vespasian in ninety three a d a number of these worshippers of cato fell under suspicion and were punished herennius senecio had composed a panegyric on helvetius priscus who had perished under vespasian he was accused of maestas by the delator metius carus and was condemned to death fania the widow of priscus and daughter of thracia had supplied herennius with the materials for this work she was therefore banished and her property confiscated the composition was publicly burned in the comitium l junius arelinus rusticus the ape of the stoics stoicorum simia as an opponent called him was condemned to death on a similar charge of having published laudations of thracia and priscus the emperor's wife domitia had been suspected of an intrigue with paris a celebrated and popular actor domitian consequently divorced his wife and caused paris to be stabbed in the street to the great grief of the populace many brought perfumes and flowers to his tomb the younger helvetius priscus composed an atellane farce on the subject of paris and Aenone, and he was accused of disguising under this form unfavorable criticisms on the emperor he was arrested in the senate house and condemned to death other members of the same clique were sent into banishment including aria the mother of fania gratilla the wife of rusticus and junius maricus his brother at the same time a decree of the senate was passed by which philosophers mathematici astrologers and soothsayers were banished from italy just as in the reign of vespasian this decree affected among others the stoic epictetus and dion called chrysostomus golden-mouthed a native of prusa whose interesting rhetorical essays are still extant domitian's suspicious hatred of the aristocracy caused by his childlessness and strengthened and increased by conspiracies and by the opposition of the party of priscus cooperated with the financial straits to which he was reduced to bring about a repetition of the unjust executions and confiscations which had stained the last years of nero the system of delation which gaius nero and domitian had each in the opening years of his reign sternly and honestly rejected was called into requisition by domitian as well as by the other two among the most prominent delators were catullus messalinus and metius carus m aquilius regulus an able orator who was regarded with jealousy by pliny and massa babius who having been proconsul of baetica was accused of extortion by pliny and senecio and was condemned perhaps the part which senecio played in the trial had something to do with his own condemnation shortly afterwards another prominent favorite at the court of domitian was a man of low birth named crispinus a native of egypt who coming to rome at first dealt in salt fish but was presently exalted to the rank of praetorian prefect 
he affected the airs and dress of a dandy and seems to have been detested as an insolent upstart domitian knew that conspiracies were formed against him and as he could not lay his finger on them innocent victims often perished his cousin flavius sabinus perished on suspicion of treason the two whose death excited most indignation were flavius clemens and epaphroditus clemens was his cousin and father of the presumptive heirs of the empire he and his wife flavia domitilla had been converted to a foreign religion and this was made a charge against them he was put to death and domitilla banished epaphroditus was the freedman who had helped nero to commit suicide and although twenty-eight years had passed since then domitian punished him for meistas such examples of cruelty alarmed the emperor's household and it was from this quarter where he felt himself safe not from the senate which he feared that vengeance came the Augusta, Domitia, whom he had divorced on the suspicion of an intrigue with an actor, as already mentioned, he afterwards recalled. But she did not feel secure, and she organized a conspiracy along with the freedmen of the palace, Parthenius, Antellus, and Stephanus. The two praetorian prefects, Norbanus and Petronius Secundus, were privy to it, and the conspirators fixed on M. Cosius Nerva as the successor of their victim. Stephanus, a man of great bodily strength, undertook to do the deed. Pretending to have hurt his left arm, he carried it for some days in a sling, and on the appointed day, September 18, 96 A.D., hid a dagger in the cloths which bound it. Obtaining an audience of the emperor to give information touching a conspiracy, he presented a document to Domitian, and as he was hastily reading it, drew the dagger and stabbed him in the loins domitian threw himself on the assassin and called a page to bring him his sword and summon the attendants but the sword which lay under a pillow was useless for it had been tampered with by the precautions of the conspirators as domitian wrestled with stephanus the other conspirators rushed in and dispatched their victim the attendants arrived too late to save their master but in time to slay stephanus the senate rejoiced at the death of the tyrant whom it detested and the senators hastened to the curia to express their long-concealed hatred without restraint his statues and busts were torn down and it was resolved to destroy everything that suggested his memory a decree was passed that the name domitian should everywhere be erased the consequences of the hatred of the senate can be felt by us at the present day for there remain extraordinarily few inscriptions dating from the reign of domitian a decent burial was not accorded to him he was carried out on a common bier such as was used by poor people but his nurse phyllis contrived to deposit his ashes in the temple of the gens flavia a sepulchre for the flavian dynasty which he had built and placed them in the same urn in which reposed the ashes of his beloved niece the divine julia the soldiers did not share in the jubilation of the senate they loved domitian and if they had had a capable leader they would have probably insisted by force on the consecration of their imperator the populace neither rejoiced nor lamented they had no reason to hate him for he had been generous to them but his haughty inaccessible manner hindered them from feeling personal affection for him in his youth domitian was noted for his beauty but in later years he showed a tendency to corpulence and became bald his enemies called him bald nero his eyes were large and languid, but the expression of his face was intense. The family resemblance to Vespasian and Titus comes out in his busts. He was not fond of physical exercise, but was a good archer. Though he gave luxurious banquets, he was moderate in eating. He has been accused of gross licentiousness, but such charges must be judged in relation to the practice of the times. There is no reason to suppose that he was either better or worse in this respect than his contemporaries of noble rank he was an unusually strict defender of the national religion and he protected morality from a religious if not from an ethical point of view in this he followed the example of augustus who regarded religion as conducive to the welfare of the state and his reign contrasts with the indifference of his predecessors in eighty three a d three vestal virgins were charged with unchastity and condemned they were allowed to choose the mode of their death and their seducers were banished but some time later the chief vestal cornelia was accused of a criminal intrigue with a knight named seller and was found guilty domitian as pontifex maximus revived in her case the ancient punishment which was generally regarded as obsolete 
and Cornelia, in spite of her protestations of innocence, was buried alive in the campus Scelleratus. It is worth noting that Pliny, in speaking of this case, feels less indignation at the cruelty of the sentence than at the circumstance that Domitian judged the case in his Alban villa, and not in the Regia, the office of the Pontifex. Celer was scourged to death in the Comitium. In maintaining the national religion, Domitian tried to hinder the spread of Oriental cults. The Jews did not specifically suffer, although the tribute of two drachmas to Jupiter of the capital was strictly exacted. There was a Jewish rising in Judea, 85 to 86 A.D., which was easily put down. Some Christians suffered death for refusing to worship the emperor's image, but there is no evidence of a general persecution. The tale of the martyrdom of St. John the Evangelist is universally recognized to be a fable. It has been supposed that Flavius Clemens and Domitilla, who are said to have been accused of impiety, were Christians, and this is not improbable. He encouraged, however, one oriental cult, that of Isis, the Egyptian goddess, and built a splendid temple to her and Serapis, the Isium et Serapeum. In 88 AD he celebrated the Ludi Seculares, reckoning the hundred years from the celebration held by Augustus. If Domitian was severe as Pontifex Maximus, he was also severe as censor. He strictly enforced the Lex Scantinia against unnatural crimes, and the Lex Iulia against adultery. Many senators and knights were condemned by these laws, and his strictness increased the hatred with which he was regarded. He deprived women, who had been condemned under the Julian law, of the right of using a litter, lectica, or accepting legacies. He tried to suppress the licentiousness of the theatres, and forbade pantomimes to appear in public, while he allowed them to hold performances in private houses. He put down the oriental practice of mutilating boys in order to sell them as eunuchs, and endeavored to diminish the trade in eunuchs by lowering the prices. It devolved upon Domitian to restore the buildings which had been consumed by the fire in the reign of Titus. The temple of Jupiter Capitolinus had to be rebuilt once more, and it rose under his auspices in greater magnificence than ever. He also erected on the capital a temple to Jupiter Custos, in thanksgiving for his own rescue from the hands of the Vitellians. The temple of the divine Vespasian and the divine Titus was built at the western extremity of the forum, between the Clivus Capitolinus and the temple of Concord. Three Corinthian pillars of this small building still stand. Several temples were erected to Minerva, the goddess whom Domitian specially revered. For the purpose of games he built a stone stadium in the campus, and also an odium for musical performances. The former of these buildings accommodated thirty thousand, the latter ten thousand people. Domitian also completed the palace begun by Nero, but confined it to the limits of the Palatine. On all buildings, whether first built by him or only restored, Domitian inscribed his own name. Our records of Domitian are very scanty, and come almost entirely from prejudiced witnesses, so that it is difficult to get a clear and fair view of his acts and policy. On the one hand we have the flatteries of the poets who courted his favor, on the other the venomous invectives written by members of the senatorial party, like Pliny and Tacitus, after his death. Marshall and Statius generally speak of him as a god, and all that appertains to him as divine. Capitoline, the epithet of Jupiter, is applied to him. He is the Ausonian Jupiter, and Domitia the Roman Juno. To Tacitus he is a tyrant without a redeeming virtue, and so the aristocracy in general regarded him. His contemptuous treatment of the Senate, as far as it was represented in the Emperor's Concilium, is cleverly travestied by the satirist Juvenal. The scene is placed in the end of 85 A.D. The members of the council, such is this true history, were suddenly summoned in haste to the Emperor's Alban Citadel. They were, it seems, eleven in number, and in twice or thrice as many verses their crimes are succinctly traced for us with a pen of cynical sincerity. One after another passed before us, Pegasus the prefect, say rather the bailiff of the city, for what is Rome but the emperor's farm, and the prefect of Rome but his manciple? Fuscus, brave and voluptuous, soon to leave his limbs a prey to the Dacian vultures. 
Crispus, a mild and genial greybeard, who has long owed his life to the meekness with which he has yielded to the current, and shrunk from the vain assertion of independence. The Glabrios, father and son, of whom the elder slunk through an inglorious existence in pusillanimous security, the younger was doomed to perish innocently, condemned to fight with beasts in the arena. The blind Catullus, deadliest of delators, with whom Domitian, as with a blind and aimless weapon, aimed at his destined victims. To these were added the sly Viento, the fat old sycophant, Montanus, Crispinus, redolent with the perfumes of his native east, the vile spy Pompeius, who slit men's throats with a whisper, and Rubrius, the perpetrator of some crime too bad, it seems, to be specified even in that day of evil deeds and shameless scandals. Such were the men who now hurried in the darkness along the Appian Way, and met at midnight in the vestibule of the imperial villa, or the tyrant's fortress, which crowned the long hill of the ascent to Alba, Anxiously they asked each other, What news? What the purport of their unexpected summons? What foes of Rome had broken the prince's slumbers, the Chatai or the Sicambri, the Britons or the Dacians? While they were yet waiting for admission, the menials of the palace entered, bearing aloft a huge torpet, a present to the emperor, which they had the mortification of seeing introduced into his presence, while the doors were still shut against themselves. A humble fisherman of the upper coast had found the monster stranded on the beach, beneath the fane of Venus at Ancona, and had hurried with his prize across the Apennines, to receive a reward for so rare an offering to the imperial table. When at last the counsellors were admitted, the question reserved for their deliberations was no other than this, whether the big fish should be cut in pieces, or served up whole on some enormous platter constructed in its honour. The cabinet was no doubt sensibly persuaded that the question allowed at least of no delay, and with due expressions of surprise and admiration voted the dish and set the potter's wheel in motion. End of chapter 21, section 3. Recording by Mark Penfold. Chapter 22 of J. B. Bury's The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2 by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 22 Britain and Germany under the Flavians. Dacian War. Section 1. Agricola in Britain. Under the Flavian emperors, no important addition was made to the Roman Empire, such as had been made under Claudius by the conquest of Britain. But in two quarters the boundaries were pushed forward. The eastern boundary of Upper Germany advanced considerably into trans Rhenane territory, and the province of Britain was enlarged by a further advance northward. The legatus of Britain, Petronius Terpilianus, 62 to 64 A.D., had been succeeded by Trebellius Maximus, 64 to 69 A.D., and Vettius Bolanus, 69 to 70 A.D. These governors seem to have contented themselves with administering the province as they found it, without attempting to enlarge it. Bolanus seems to have founded forts against the natives. His successor, Petilius Cerealis who had commanded the Ninth Legion when it was nearly exterminated in the great revolt of the Iceni, and who had recently distinguished himself by the suppression of the rebellion of Civilis, was not satisfied with the inaction of his predecessors. He made war upon the Brigantes, the most powerful of all the British tribes, whose name was sometimes used as synonymous with Britons. The Fourteenth Legion, which had been sent from Britain to his assistance in Germany, did not return to its old station but Vespasian sent him second adjectrix in its place. After many battles with the Brigantes, whose territory extended from the Solway to the Wash, Cerealis reduced part of their land under Roman sway, including the town of Lindum, Lincoln, where he established the second adjectrix. This legion was removed to Pannonia at the beginning of the Domitian's reign, but some tombstones found at Lincoln show that its station was there during the few intervening years. 
Thus, the result of the War of Cerealis was that the northern boundary line of the province was no longer drawn from Glavum to Camelodunum, with an advance post at Deva in the west, but from Deva to Lindum. But south of this frontier, the western highlands, Wales, could not yet be considered part of the province. The subjugation of the tribes in this quarter devolved upon the two successors of Cerealis, Sextus Julius Frontinus, whose name is well known as an authority on the art of war, and who was capable of applying his theory, reduced the Silores in the south, while his successor, Gnaeus Julius Agricola, 78-85 to A.D., conquered the Ordovices and occupied the island of Mona, which Suetonius Paulinus had been compelled to abandon in the first year of his governorship. In the conquest of Mona he was, like Paulinus, assisted by the skill of the Batavians in swimming. Agricola, whom Vespasian thus called to be governor of Britain, had already, like Cerealis, served his time in that country in subordinate posts. He had served under Suetonius Paulinus as military tribune, and again under Vettius Bolanus as legatus of the twentieth legion. On this occasion, 70 A.D., he had the difficult task of restoring discipline among the troops, who had been demoralized by a quarrel between his predecessor Rosius Callius and the governor Trebellius Maximus. He had then been appointed legatus pro praetore of Aquitania, had been recalled to Rome to fill the consulship, and then sent to succeed Frontinus in Britain. A governor of Britain might engage in one or both of two enterprises at this period. He might devote his attention either to intensive conquest, that is, the civilization and consolidation of the province as he found it, or to extensive conquest, that is, to carrying its boundaries further north by conquering new tribes. Agricola professed to do both, but really sacrificed the intensive conquest to the extensive. The confidence which the emperors reposed in him was shown by the unusually long period during which he was suffered to remain in his command. The second year, 79 A.D., of Agricola's legateship was spent in completing the reduction of the recently conquered tribes, probably in Wales, by building forts and making roads through woods and marshes. During the winter the troops remained in their quarters, and Agricola occupied himself with the Romanization of the natives. In the third summer, 80 A.D., he advanced against new tribes in the north, laying the land waste as far as an estuary called Tanaus. It has been thought that this unknown name may represent the North Tyne at Dunbar. The Britons did not attempt to oppose the legions, and they had time to establish some castella, in which they remained during the winter. The following summer, 81 A.D., was spent in completing the occupation of the land which had been traversed, and the army advanced as far as the estuaries of Clota and Bodotria, the Clyde and the Forth. The narrow strip of land between these friths was fortified and occupied by garrisons, and it seemed as if the enemy, who retreated into the northern highlands, had been removed to another island. In this expedition Agricola had probably about thirty thousand men with him, counting both legions and auxiliaries, and his operations were supported by a fleet perhaps on the east coast. At this time, the Britannic legions were reduced to three by the recall of the second Adjutrix, whose removal left Lindum without a garrison. A new station more northerly than Lindum was probably established. It seems certain that Agricola did not venture to push so far into the unknown regions of the north without securing the territory north of the Humber, and we may take it for granted that he occupied Eberacum, the chief town of the Brigantes, the modern York. This position took the place of Lindum, and was perhaps garrisoned by the Ninth Legion. In later times, Eberacum became the chief center in Britain. In the next year, Agricola sailed across the estuary of Clota to the western districts of Caledonia, probably Arran and Cantir. He had conceived the project of conquering Hibernia, which he thought might be best approached from this point. The conquest, he imagined, could be easily accomplished with one legion and a small number of auxiliaries, and he held that it would prove important to the complete subjection and pacification of Britain, for Hibernia occupied much the same relation to Britain as Britain itself occupied to Gaul. One of the chief reasons for occupying Britain was that as long as the Gauls saw a free land beyond the Channel, a land into which they could themselves flee for refuge, they were restless under Roman rule. In the same way, the sight of free Hibernia had a disturbing effect on the spirits of enslaved Britannia. In addition to these considerations, a false geographical notion recommended the policy of including Hibernia in the empire. 
It was supposed that Hibernia lay between Britain and Spain, and thus formed a natural connection between the western provinces of the empire. But Agricola could not carry out his project without additional forces. The three legions in Britain were little enough for the security of the province, extended as it was by his new acquisitions. He applied to Domitian for another legion, but the request was refused, and the enterprising governor was obliged to abandon his project. Domitian acted in accordance with the cautious precept of Augustus, not to undertake new conquests, and the project was never revived. Hibernia never became part of the empire. But if Agricola was not permitted to attack the island of the Scots, he was resolved to carry his arms into Caledonia. In his sixth year, 83 A.D., in spite of the dissuasions of his officers, he penetrated into the land north of the estuary of Bodotria, aided by his fleet. The appearance of the Romans excited consternation and fury among the Caledonian folk. Agricola had divided his army into three divisions, and one of them, consisting of the Ninth Legion, which was especially weak, suffered serious losses from a night attack of the native tribes. The quick arrival of Agricola and other divisions of the army prevented a disastrous defeat, and the affair resulted in a Roman victory. The Caledonians, under the chief Calgacus, utilized the ensuing winter in organizing a great army to resist the invaders in the following season. In 84 A.D. Agricola took the field again, and a great battle was fought at an unknown place called the Grampian Hill. Agricola's army probably numbered from twenty-five to thirty thousand men. He placed his eight thousand auxiliary foot in the center, and three thousand horse on the wings. The legions were arranged in the rear, in front of the rampart of their camp. The enemy, who far outnumbered the Romans, had drawn up part of their forces on the plain, the rest on the hill behind. The best plan for the Britons was to use their advantage in numbers by attacking the Romans in front and on the flanks at the same time, and this was now the movement which Agricola most feared. But Calgacus did not adopt that strategy at the beginning of the battle. In close quarters the Britons, with their long clumsy swords and short shields, were no match for the long pilum and short sword of the Romans. The Batavian and Tungrian cohorts beat the enemy back, and matters were not mended by the intervention of the war chariots, which could not move freely on the uneven ground and amid the dense ranks of the Caledonians. The cavalry of the enemy were also routed. The Britons who were stationed on the hills behind had hitherto taken no part in the fighting, but when they saw their companions worsted, they began to descend from the heights and make a movement to approach the Romans in the rear. Agricola had foreseen this, and detached four allay, or horse, which he retained in reserve to meet them. The Britons, coming up in disorder, were scattered, and their plan was turned against themselves, for the Roman cavalry rode on to attack the rear of the enemy's line. This decided the battle. It is said that ten thousand Caledonians fell, and only three hundred sixty Romans. The year was too far advanced to undertake further operations. Agricola led his army into the maritime district of the Boresti, an unknown people, where he received hostages and gave directions to the prefect of the fleet to circumnavigate Britain. This undertaking was successfully accomplished, and Roman ports sang of the captured Orkneys. Agricola retired into winter quarters, probably to Eberacum. No Roman army ever again penetrated as far north as he. In the following year, 85 A.D., Agricola was recalled. He received the triumphal ornaments and a laureate statue in recognition of what he had done, but this did not compensate him for the disappointment of not being able to complete the northern conquests which he had begun. Yet he had really no reason to complain of the decision of Domitian. He had been allowed to remain in his post far longer than any previous legatus, and to carry on expensive campaigns. Financial considerations alone may have been sufficient to influence Domitian in discontinuing the policy of aggression in Britain. The results of Agricola were certainly not an adequate return for the enormous cost. It must especially be remembered that at the moment of Agricola's recall, a most serious war was breaking out on the Danube against the formidable kingdom of the Dacians. We can readily believe that the cost of supporting two wars simultaneously in Britain and on the Danube was quite beyond the means of the fiscus at the time. The enemies of Domitian, of course, set down Agricola's recall to the petty jealousy of the emperor. Agricola himself naturally felt sore about it. But the best justification of Domitian is that his two successors, Nerva and Trajan, abode by his decision and did not attempt to renew the designs of Agricola. 
the case of Agricola recalled by Domitian closely resembled that of Germanicus recalled by Tiberius. In both cases the ambition of a general was sacrificed to the prudent policy of the imperator, who saw that the outlay was not repaid by the result. In both cases the imperator was said by his adversaries to be actuated only by jealousy of a possible rival. Agricola has often received a higher place than rightly belongs to him in the history of Britain, because he was fortunate enough to have a brilliant historian for his son-in-law. Tacitus married Agricola's daughter and wrote his biography. This work, concerning the life and character of Julius Agricola, gives an artistic but superficial account of Britain, and a brief description of Agricola's campaigns, culminating in the battle of Mons Grapius, which is described at length. The author's neglect of almost all topographical details, which should not interest him, but would interest us very deeply, detracts greatly from the historical value of the book. Tacitus says that from Agricola's countenance you would readily believe him good, you would gladly believe him great. This epigram suggests the truth. Agricola was in no sense a great man, but he was an officer of respectable ability, and ambitious enough to grasp at glory when the chances were offered to him. His son-in-law and his contemporaries overrated what he had done. Ill-advised friends at Rome doubtless sounded his praises too loudly, and Domitian was not sorry when the time came to remove him from Britain. He refused the offer of a proconsulate of Asia or Africa, and lived in retirement until his death, which occurred a few years later. Some maliciously whispered that he was taken off by poison. The conquests he had made were only transient. The country he had occupied was immediately abandoned, and after all his warfare he left to his successor nearly the same northern boundary line which had been established by Cerealis, from Deva to Lindum. Perhaps the chief part of Agricola's work that survived was the occupation of Eburacum, which now formed an advanced post in the east, somewhat as Deva in the west, before the conquest of Cerealis. Eburacum now stood to Lindum in somewhat the relation in which Deva then stood to Clavum. But Agricola's contemporaries could not appreciate the importance of Eburacum, and Tacitus passes it over in silence. Section 2. The Limus Germanicus As there were some Germans on the left bank of the Rhine, so there were some Gauls on the right. The valley of the river Nicer, Neckar, had been cleared of the Germans who had possessed it and the Romans had permitted poor and adventurous Gauls to cross the Rhine and take possession of the lands where they were constantly exposed to the incursions of the neighboring German tribes. These Gauls paid a tithe of the produce of their fields, and hence the whole district was called the Tithe Lands, Agri Decumani, or Decumates, but they were exempt from other burdens, and no Roman garrison was quartered in the land, which thus was loosely included in the empire, but was neither a province nor part of a province. The Flavian emperors placed this doubtful territory on a clearer footing. Vespasian built roads in it, and it was probably he who protected it by an elaborate system of fortification. The eastern frontier was marked by a rampart of earth, and a ditch in front of it, constructed just as in a Roman camp. Behind the rampart were placed castella at nine or ten miles' distance from one another. Between the castella occur watch-towers. This line of defense stretched from Seiopum, Miltenburg, on the Mernus, in a due southward direction to the neighborhood of Loriacum, Loch. It can still be traced, and the sites of many of the castella have been identified. Behind this there was a second system of defense. From Vindanissa, the chief camp of Upper Germany, a road led northward to a place on the Nicer which is now called Rottweil. This place was selected to be a center for the trans territory in the same sense in which Lugodunum and Camelodunum were centers in Gaul and Britain. Here altars were set up for the worship of the Flavian house, and the place was called Aere Flaviae. From here northwards a number of castella were constructed along the course of the river Nicer, which was in itself a defense. As soon as the Nicer turns westward to join the Rhine, the line of forts leaves the river and continues in a northerly direction, passing over the Odenwald, and reaching the Mernus at a point near the modern Wurt, northwest of Seiopum. This second line, connecting the Mernus and the Nicer, is known as the necker mümling line, because it cuts the valley of the Mümling stream. It is impossible to determine how much of this defensive system is due to Vespasian and how much to his son Domitian. 
The forts connected with this line from Loriacum to Seiopum may be due to Domitian's successors. The object of these defences was probably not so much military as to give the people settled habits and prevent nomads entering the empire at will. But if the main credit for the enclosure of the Agri Decumates is due to Vespasian, the occupation of the Taunus district north of the Main was probably the work of Domitian. This land was inhabited by the Matiazzi, a tribe of the Cati, who gave their name to the Aque Matiazzi, the springs of Wiesbaden. Drusus had tried to establish the Roman power in this region by founding the fort Arianum on Mount Taunus, and Germanicus had restored it. Since his time, desultory hostilities had continued with the Cati, and at length Domitian determined to take the decisive step of annexing the territory of Mount Taunus to the province of Upper Germany, and continuing the line of defense between Mernus and Nicer, so as to connect the Mernus and the Rhine. His campaign against the Cati in 83 A.D., which was so ridiculed by his enemies, was connected with his important undertaking. He was assisted by the skill of Sextus Frontinus, whom we have already met as governor of Britain. From Wirt to Hanau, the course of the mine is northerly, and at Großkrotzenberg, near Hanau, the earthen rampart of Domitian begins. It does not follow a straight course, but takes advantage of the nature of the ground. Crossing the Lahn near Ems, it reaches the Rhine at Rheinbrohl, opposite the stream which formed the boundary between the provinces of Lower and Upper Germany. Forts occurred at intervals close to the rampart, and were connected by a military road. Near most of these castella have been found the remains of villas, with bath arrangements meant for the use of officers. Thus the limes of Upper Germany was an earthen wall, reaching from that point on the Rhine which marks the northern extremity of the province all the way to Loriacum, except where, between the points of Grosskrotzenburg and Miltenburg, the Mernus takes its place. It was protected all the way by castella and watch-towers, and between the Mernus and Nicer was covered in the rear by a line of forts, not connected by a rampart, reaching from the Mernus to Ere Flaviae on the Nicer. It is thought probable that Domitian also built the first great permanent bridge over the Rhine at Moguntiacum. The Limes Germanicus is only part of the gigantic scheme of defense, of a line reaching from the mouth of the Rhine to the mouth of the Danube. These two rivers formed a natural defense, which merely required the erection of forts on their banks. But where the line left the rivers, an artificial defense, a wall of earth or stone, took the place of the water. Thus the Limes Germanicus was not complete without another line running from west to east and connecting its southern point at Loriacum with the Danube fortresses. This was the Limes Reticus, forming part of the northern boundary of the province of Raetia. It is not certain whether the Flavian emperors began its construction, but it certainly did not assume its final form until the reign of Hadrian or possibly even later. But it is so closely connected with the Limes Germanicus that it may be mentioned in this place. Beginning at Loriacum, it runs due east through Württemberg and Bavaria, and reaches the Danube, near Kelheim, where the river Alcimona, Altmü, flows in. The Retian Limes is not like the Germanic, a rampart of earth. It is formed by a wall of stones, on the top of which palisades were planted, such as the soldiers used in their camps, and with the usual ditch in front. It seems probable that this line was protected by an earth wall in the time of the Flavians, but that, at a somewhat later period, when the empire was threatened by German invaders, the Devil's Wall, Teufelsmauer, as it was called in the Middle Ages, was erected. Section 3. Dacian and Suevian Wars Soon after his campaign on the Rhine, Domitian's attention was demanded by a more pressing and formidable danger on the Easter, the Dacians had invaded Moesia. The country of the Dacians was comprised between Theus and Pruth from the west to the east, the Carpathian mountains and the Danube from north to south. Thus Dacia corresponded to the modern kingdom of Romania, along with Siebenbergen and the Banat of Temesvar. Beyond the Dacians, in the modern Moldavia and Bessarabia, were the Bastarne, a German people. Beyond them again were the Roxolani, a Sarmatian tribe. The land between the Danube and the Thace was held by the Yazigis. 
it was easy enough for the Romans to repel the occasional invasions of their trans-Danubian neighbors, as long as they were not united and organized under an able leader. They had been conquered more than once in the reign of Augustus, and in the last years of that emperor fifty thousand barbarians had been transported into Moesia and settled on Roman territory by Elias Catus. The same experiment had, as we have seen, been repeated under Nero, when Tiberius Plautius Elenius settled one hundred thousand Dacians with their wives and children in the same province. The same governor of Moesia checked a threatened movement of the Sarmatians before it broke out, and compelled a number of unknown or hostile princes to do obeisance before the Roman standards on Roman soil. But though Dacians and Sarmatians were thus kept in check under the Julian and Claudian emperors, the defense of the Danube was wholly insufficient, a fact which became clearly apparent during the civil wars after the death of Nero. The two legions quartered in Moesia were supposed to defend the whole line from Singidunum, Belgrade, to the mouth of the river, but the defense of the lower stream was left almost altogether to the Thracians, and as the Thracians were kinsfolk of the Dacians, their help was in itself a danger. When the legions marched to Italy to overthrow Vitellius, the province was invaded by Roxolani, then by Dacians, and then by Yazigis. The opportune arrival of Mucianus with his Syrian legions repelled some of these incursions, but the governor of Moesia, Fontius Agrippa, perished in the invasion of the Yazigis. Vespasian did not actually increase the army of Illyricum, but he made some changes with a view to the defense of the Danube. He seems to have moved the two legions, which were stationed in Dalmatia, to Moesia, so that the governor of that province had four legions under his command. This reinforcement was the more necessary since Thrace had been made a province, for when the native princes of Thrace were superseded, the native army on which the defense of the Danube partly relied was dissolved. But the danger which the Roman government had especially to fear was a coalition of the Dacians with their German neighbors. A joint invasion of the empire by the Dacians and Suavians would have been very formidable. The Suavian peoples, consisting chiefly of the Marcomanni and Cadi, were still in the same seats which they had held under King Maraboduus, in the modern Bohemia and Moravia, and since his death, they had been in a sort of dependent relationship to Rome. Thus they had sent auxiliaries to the army of Vespasian in the civil war with Vitellius, but their fidelity could not be trusted very far, and Vespasian thought it prudent to move the two Pannonian legions forward to the Danube frontier. Thirteenth Gemina was stationed at Vindabona, Vienna, and fifteenth Apollinaris, a little lower down, at Carnuntum, he also reorganized the Danube fleet, which was hence called the Flavian fleet. If things in Dacia had remained as they had been for a century past, these measures of defense might have been sufficient. But the aspect of affairs in those regions were changed by the sudden appearance of a leader of men, endowed with military genius. This was Decebalus. His conspicuous talents had attracted the attention of King Doris who generously resigned the government in favor of one who seemed likely to regenerate his country. The idea of Decebalus was to form a great military state which might hold its own as a power of first-rate importance on the northern frontier of the Roman Empire, somewhat as Parthia itself on the eastern. This had been attempted before by Berebistus in the time of Julius Caesar, who was making preparations for a great Dacian expedition when he was assassinated. Fortunately for Rome, Berebistus perished in a sedition about the same time, and after his death the Dacian power collapsed and fell to pieces. Maraboduus, the Marcoman, attempted to form a great German realm, as has been related in an earlier chapter, and it too collapsed. Like Maraboduus, Decebalus aimed at introducing into his country Greek and Roman civilization, and especially, in order to cope on equal terms with Rome, he set himself to learn the Roman art of war. From deserters he learned the Roman methods of entrenchment and the construction of military engines. How far-reaching his designs were, and how wide his political view, may be guessed from the fact that he entered into negotiations with Parthia, the natural enemy of Rome in the east. For a Roman war he also relied on the help of the neighboring Sarmatians, the Yaziges on one side and the Roxolani on the other, but above all on the Dacian, Getic, and Thracian population of the provinces south of the Danube. He hoped doubtless to conquer Moesia, and possibly even Thrace. 
and thus erect a great Dacian kingdom of homogeneous population, reaching from the Carpathians to the boundary of Asia. Dacia, at this time, was to the province south of the Danube what Britain, before the conquest, had been to the subject Celts of Gaul, a refuge and an attraction for all restless spirits. At length, when he had organized a well-disciplined army, the Dacian king descended from the Ister and dealt his first blow, 85 A.D. The legatus of Mosia, Opius Sabinus, opposed him with insufficient forces and was slain. Fortresses were seized by Decebalus, and the land harried. Rome was threatened by the loss of the province. When the news of the disaster reached Rome, Domitian entrusted Cornelius Fuscus, the praetorian prefect, with the conduct of the war, and himself repaired to the scene of the action. The Pannonian legions were summoned in haste, and the Marcomanni promised to bring aid. It seems that the Dacians had made some overtures for peace, which were rejected, and Decebalus then insolently told the Romans that he would grant them peace at the price of two asses for every soldier's head. Fuscus drove the enemy out of Moesia, and then, throwing a bridge of boats across the Danube, boldly penetrated into Dacia. But the Marcomannic confederates did not come with the succor which they had promised, and the Roman forces suffered a terrible defeat, perhaps owing to the rash confidence of their general in an unknown country. He was himself, like Sabinus, slain on the field of battle. The Romans, with difficulty, found their way back, having left in the hands of the enemy a large number of captives and booty, including war engines and an eagle of one of the legions, 86 A.D. But the next general, Julianus, avenged his predecessor. He invaded Dacia and gained a great victory at Tape. The slaughter of the barbarians was immense, and Vizinus, the chief who held second rank after Decebalus, only escaped by hiding himself among the dead. Julianus followed up his victory by marching upon Sarmizagathusa, Varheli, the chief town of Dacia. But some unknown circumstance hindered him from attacking it, probably a message from the emperor, who had in the meantime determined to make peace. According to an incredible story, however, Julian was driven back from the Dacian capital by a stratagem of the wily king. A large number of trees near the city were cut down so that the trunks were not higher than a man's stature. Arms were attached to them, and Julian, imagining that he was opposed by an immense army, hastily retreated. What disposed Domitian to treat with the Dacians was a defeat which the Romans had experienced in another quarter. While Julian was operating in Dacia, the emperor himself had proceeded to Carnundum, and taken the field against the Marcomanni and Cadi, who had tried to play the Romans false. They sent two embassies to Domitian to excuse their conduct in failing to send help against the Dacians, but he, regarding them as rebels rather than foes, put to death the second set of ambassadors. This infuriated the Suevians, and the Pannonic army under the emperor suffered a defeat. Accordingly, when Decebalus sent an embassy to Moesia, headed by a noble Dacian named Dagus, Domitian accepted his submission and placed a diadem on the head of Dagus as the representative of Decebalus, in token that Dacia was dependent on the empire, and Roman poets could sing that the victorious shade of Fuscus might now haunt the vassal grove in which he had been buried. On the other hand, the emperor sent to Decebalus workmen and engineers and gifts of money, which the Romans, dissatisfied with their prince, professed to regard as a shameful tribute. It was really a timely concession which involved no manner of humiliation for Rome. A tributary relation of Rome to Decebalus was out of the question after the victory of Julianus, and of all emperors, the proud Domitian was least likely to assume such a humiliating position. After his return to Rome, Domitian celebrated a splendid triumph, 89 A.D. A great triumphal arc was erected near the temple of Fortuna Redux, and in the forum a colossal equestrian bronze statue of the emperor was set up. The city was filled with arches and statues in his honor. The nobility of Rome were entertained at a great banquet, and the provinces were forced to send contributions under the name of Aurum Coronarium to defray the celebrations in the city. Domitian did not officially assume the title Dasicus, though flatterers often gave it to him. An important administrative change was introduced in Moesia as a result of the Dacian War. The province was divided into two smaller provinces, Upper and Lower Moesia, each under a legatus, with two legions at his disposal. Meanwhile, hostilities were continued with the Suevic nations and their Sarmatian allies, the Yazigis. 
the Romans suffered severe reverses. Not only were they defeated on their own ground in Pannonia, but a whole legion was annihilated. In May, 92 A.D., the emperor again repaired to the scene of the war and remained there eight months. Successes seemed to have been gained by the Romans, for Domitian sent to the Senate dispatches wreathed in laurel, according to the practice of victorious generals, and on his return in January 93 A.D., he celebrated an ovation over the Sarmatians. This war, in which the eastern Sarmatians beyond the lower Danube were involved, as well as the Aziges, was called the Suevian and Sarmatian War, and it was protracted into the reign of Domitian's successor, Nerva. On the other hand, the peace with Dacia was preserved for ten years, and during that period Decebalus had time to mature his plans and prepare his country for a struggle with a greater adversary than either Julian or Domitian. End of chapter 22chapter 23 sections 1 and 2 of j b beery's the student's roman empire part 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by Lenny. the student's roman empire part 2 by john bunyell beery chapter 23 Nerva and Trajan and the conquest of Dacia, 96 to 117 A.D. Sections 1 and 2 Section 1. Nerva With the death of Domitian, the second imperial dynasty came to an end. But no disturbances took place like those which had followed the death of Nero. The new princeps, M. Cosseus Nerva, who acceded on October 1st, A.D. 96, was not, like Galba, set up in the provinces or chosen by the soldiers. He was the elect of the Senate. He had no claim to the Principate, either by lineage or by proeminent personal qualities. He was a clever jurist, an accomplished writer, and had been twice consul, but he owed his elevation to the fact that he was colorless. The senators, most of whom were doubtless privy to the conspiracy which overthrew the Flavian house, wanted an emperor who would be ready to concede a due share of government to themselves, but who at the same time would not be obnoxious to the army. Such a one they found in the inoffensive Nerva. He had never stood in the ranks of the senatorial opposition. On the contrary, he had taken part in suppressing the conspiracy of Piso, and had kept in favor with the Flavian emperors. Over sixty years of age, he was self-indulgent, tolerant, and mild, and the Senate expected to find him subservient to their guidance. His reign was greeted by the aristocrats as a new epoch. Coins were issued with the inscription Libertas Publica and Roma Renascens, at length, it seemed to the most bitter adversaries of Caesarism that liberty and the principate, things formerly irreconcilable, had been happily blended. If Cato himself were restored to life, says an epigrammatist, he would be a Caesarian. It is to be observed that Nerva, like Vespasian, adopted, as a matter of course, the name Caesar, which by this time had become as necessary a part of the imperial nomenclature as imperator itself. From Nerva, the Senate obtained the guarantee which they had sought in vain from the Flavians. The new princeps took a solemn oath that he would put no member of that order to death. The Senate had good reason to be satisfied with his administration, for he consulted it on every matter. The measures taken against the instruments of Domitian's cruelty were mild, owing to the moderate character of Nerva, who would not satisfy the general outcry for revenge. The exiles, including the philosophers, were recalled, and the sufferers and their friends were eager to punish the delators who had been the cause of their wrongs. Gaius Plinius Secundus, the younger Pliny, as he is generally called, 
thought it a good opportunity to assail the guilty, avenge the unfortunate, and advance himself. Accordingly, he attacked Sirtis, one of the mission's ministers in the Senate. Sirtis had laid hands on Helvidius Priscus in the Curia, and Helvidius was a friend of Pliny. But Nerva did not permit a process to be instituted against Sirtis, though he went so far as to refuse him the consulship and supersede him in the praetorship. The suits which the injured were bringing against the delators were stopped at the instance of a senator named Fronto, who proposed a general act of pardon. He said to have used words which, epigrammatically, expressed the weakness of Nerva. It is bad to have a princeps under whom no one may do anything. It is worse to have one under whom everyone may do anything. The oath of security which Nerva gave to the Senate implied the abolition of processes for maestas. Moreover, slaves were forbidden to accuse their masters of impiety or of leading a Jewish life, which seems to have been a frequent charge in the reign of Domitian. But though the Senate had condemned the memory of Domitian, Nerva did not allow all his acts to be abolished. That, for example, against mutilation was confirmed, and the marriage of uncles and nieces was forbidden, a principle acknowledged by Domitian when he refused to marry Julia. Moreover, the beneficia granted by him were confirmed. In the public finances, Nerva, like Vespasian, had difficulties to contend with. The tyranny of Domitian's later years was, as we have seen, partly due to the needs of an exhausted treasury. Nerva was obliged to suspend temporarily the celebration of games and the distributions of corn in Rome. A senatorial commission was appointed for considering the question of ways and means and the best manner of economizing. The emperor sacrificed a large amount of imperial property, and the crisis was, at length, tided over. Then Nerva set himself to relieve his subjects of some of the most unpopular taxes. He abolished the tax which Vespasian had levied on the Jews, and which had called forth bitter discontent. He relieved Italy of the cost of supporting the imperial post, the cursus publicus, within her own borders, and transferred the burden to the fiscus. This tax was called vehiculatio, and it continued to remain in force for the provinces. He also reduced the 5% duty on inheritances. From an economical point of view, the short reign of Nerva was retrogressive. It was characterized by an exclusive and narrow attention to the interests of Italy. This was to be expected from a government which was so much under the influence of the Senate. The ideal of the Senate was to maintain the supremacy of Rome and Italy, and to keep the provinces in a subordinate place, whereas one of the chief tendencies of imperial policy, the policy inaugurated by Caesar himself, was to raise the provinces to the position of importance which they had a right to claim. But Italy, perhaps, had been too much neglected by previous rulers, and it was only fair that she should have her turn now. The decline of Italian agriculture was a serious disaster which had attracted the attention of Domitian, and he had sought to remedy it by forbidding land to be drawn from the cultivation of corn inappropriated to the produce of wine. Nervous plan was to send out colonies of agriculturists, but he had not enough money at his disposal to make this remedy really effective. He bought up large lots of land, and appointed a commission of senators, quatuorwiri agro dividundo, to divide it. It is important to observe that the agrarian law of Nerva was a true lex, passed at the commissia of the people. Nerva, like Claudius, revived the old republican form for the last time. More effectual and important for the welfare of Italy than his attempt to heal the irremediable agrarian evil, was Nerva's system of elementary institutions. These were designed to help the education of the children of poor parents. For each town, which received the benefit of this endowment, 
a certain sum of money was set aside at once and lent to landed proprietors and the annual interest which it produced formed the support of the elementary institution as the investment rested on land it was secure and the state on its part undertook not to withdraw the loan the control of the administration of this charity was probably placed in the hands of men of senatorial rank the curatores viarum nervous successors carried out the organization of the institution more thoroughly the brevity of nervous reign gave him little time for executing public works but he completed the forum transitorium which the mission had left unfinished connecting the templum pacis with the forum of augustus this new forum was marked by the temple of minerva and was called the forum of nerva the policy of nerva was marked by mildness even by weakness he boasted that he had done no act which could prevent him from resigning the principate if he chose with perfect security his clemency however was the one feature which did not satisfy the senatorial party a story is told that Moricus, who had returned from exile was supping one evening with nerva and the prudent veiento a notorious creature of the mission was also present reclining in a place of honor next the emperor the conversation chanced to turn on the blind dilator catullus who had lately died if he were still living said nerva what would his fate be he would be supping with us replied Moricus, glancing at veiento but though nerva was mild perhaps because he was so mild conspiracies were formed against him that of calpurnius crassus a descendant of the triumvir was easily put down and crassus was banished not to an island but to the pleasant city of tarentum a more dangerous movement originated in the praetorian camp casperius ilianus one of the praetorian prefects under domitian and retained in the post by nerva excited the soldiers to demand the execution of the murderers of domitian especially the freedman parthenius and the other prefect petronius secundus although more than a year had passed since the event nerva indeed bared his own neck and offered to die himself instead of the victims but he was forced to comply about october ninety seven a d this experience decided nerva who was weak in health and felt himself unable to cope with the difficulties of government or manage the soldiers to follow the example of augustus galba and vespasian and chose a consort who should also be his presumptive successor he had kinsfolk of his own but he passed them over and regarded the interests of the state not those of his own family his choice guided by his adviser lucius licinius sura fell on marcus ulpius trajanus the legatus of upper germany and the result proved that it could not have fallen upon any one better fitted for the post trajan was a spaniard of italica a municipium close to hispolis in betica his father had served with distinction in the jewish war and held the proconsulate of asia the son born on September 18, 52 A.D., had been brought up as a soldier and seen ten years' active service as a military tribune. He then went through the Cursus Honorum and obtained the praetorship in 85 A.D. We next meet him in Spain, when, on the outbreak of the revolt of Antonius Saturninus, he was ordered by the mission to lead one of the Spanish legions, first Adiutrix, of which he was clearly legatus to upper germany but the rising was suppressed before his arrival his promptitude was rewarded by an eponymous or ordinary consulship in ninety one a d a great honor coming from domitian who was usually first consul of the year himself he was afterwards appointed legatus of upper germany he was probably at vindenissa when nerva addressed a letter to him offering him a share in the imperium explaining his own difficulties and calling upon him to take vengeance on those who had tormented him with a homeric line may the donny pay for my tears beneath thy shafts but without waiting for the consent of trajan 
Nerva proceeded without delay to perform the ceremony of adoption in his absence. The Pannonian legions had gained a victory over the Savians, who were still hostile, and to celebrate it, the citizens had assembled on the summit of the capital, in front of the temple of Jove. There, Nerva declared the adoption of his son and consort in these words, I adopt Marcus Olpius Nerva Trajanus, made prove fortunate to the Senate, the Roman people, and myself. Thus Trajan became the son of Nerva, and like Nerva himself, Caesar. It remained to confer upon him the proconsular power, and this was done in due form by a decree of the Senate. But he was not only made imperator, he also, like Titus, received the tribunician power at the same time. This probably means that the tribunician lex was proposed in the Senate at the same time, and then, after the due interval, brought before the Comitia. The elevation of Trajan to the second place in the empire took place on the 27th of October, 97 AD, and from this day Trajan dated his tribunician years. In consequence of the Pannonian victory mentioned above, both Nerva and Trajan assumed the name Germanicus. They were designated as colleagues in the consulship for the following year. Nerva died on January 27, 98 AD. His acts were confirmed, and he was enrolled among the gods as a matter of course. And Trajan, son of the divine Nerva, was elected princeps and Augustus. Section 2. Trajan on the Rhine. A new epoch in imperial history may be said to begin with the accession of Trajan. Hitherto, all the emperors had been of Roman or Italian origin. The elevation of the first Italian, the Sabine Vespasian, had been a novelty, but this was a small innovation compared with the raising of a provincial to be head of the Roman world, master of Rome herself. Not a murmur was heard at the election of Trajan, the Spaniard, though his birthplace, Italica by the Betis, was not even a colonia. How far Roman opinion had progressed during the past century in regard to the provinces may be estimated if we recollect that Augustus had hesitated to admit inhabitants of Transpadan Italy into the Praetorian Guards. Trajan was not required to return to Rome on his adoption by Nerva. He seems to have continued to hold the post of Legatus of Upper Germany, combining it as Titus combined the Praetorian Prefecture with his imperial position. But it is probable that by virtue of his proconsular power, perhaps by the special ordinance of Nerva, he exercised beyond his own province a control over Lower Germany as well. He would thus have held a position somewhat similar to that held by Drusus, Tiberius, and Germanicus. This will explain the fact that the news of Nerva's death reached him not in the upper, but in the lower province, at Colonia Agrippinensis. The new emperor did not immediately return to Rome. He saw that there was work to be done on the Rhine, and he stayed to do it. Some time before, intestine quarrels had broken out among the Bructeri. A chieftain was expelled from their land, and had returned with the help of neighboring tribes. The governor of Lower Germany, Bastricius Perina, also assisted in the restoration of the Bructerian king, who, after his victory, settled a large number of the Chamevi and Angriveriae in Bructerian territory, in order to maintain his position with their help against his own countrymen. Trajan seized the opportunity of these domestic dissensions to strengthen the fortifications of the Rhine, to complete and improve the work begun by the Flavians. Some ascribed to him the erection of the rampart and forts in the Agri Decumatis, which in the foregoing chapter was described as the work of the Flavians. In any case, Trajan went on with work which was begun by them. It is certain that a road on the right bank of the Rhine, leading from Moguntiacum southward, crossing the Neisser near the present Heidelberg, and passing Aquae in the direction of Offenburg, was constructed under the auspices of Trajan in a hundred A.D., to him also Aquae, Baden, may attribute the beginning of her prosperity, as well as other towns in the same region, such as Sumelokena, Rottenburg, on the Neisser, 
in Lopodunum, Vladenburg. On the Minas, not far from Moguntiacum, he constructed a castellum, called after himself, but its site cannot be identified. About a mile lower than the old Vetra, he founded a new fortress, which was afterwards called Colonia Traiana. Having spent the summer of 98 AD in the German provinces, Trajan proceeded to the Danube, and spent the ensuing winter in making preparations for a Dacian war, which, as he foresaw, was inevitable. At this time, a road on the right bank of the Danube was made in the neighborhood of Tierna, near the present Orsova. Public interest at Rome was awakened in the operations of Trajan by the timely appearance of the Germania of Tacitus, giving a picturesque account of the manners and customs of the Teutonic peoples with which Rome had been brought in contact. Tacitus, personally, had some local knowledge of the subject, as he had been either legatus of a legion in Germany or governor of Belgica from 90 to 94 AD. His interest in Germany was stimulated by an instinctive perception that Rome's greatest danger lay in that quarter. The liberty of the Germans is more active than the kingdom of the Atracids. Reviewing the past history of the relations between Roman and Teuton, he makes use of that pregnant expression, tam diu Germania vincitur, so long is Germany in the process of being conquered. The Germania contains an account of the Teutons in general, and also notices of the particular tribes. The Germans have now reached a more advanced stage of civilization, than that which Caesar described a hundred and twenty years before. The communities no longer migrate from one part of the territory to another, but each community of the tribe has a permanent village settlement and a certain area of arable land, although their wealth still consists chiefly in cattle, and there is a considerable advance in local organization. Agriculture has become general, and each man has a fixed home. The love of hunting has declined, perhaps owing to the decrease of beasts of chase, and the warriors, during times of peace, devote themselves to the wine-bowl and to gambling. The arrangement which formerly held for the communities or families now held for the individual freemen. Each freeman receives an allotment of land from the community, and his allotment is changed every year. As there is a large quantity of waste land available, the arable area is changed annually, and nothing is grown on it but corn. But though the freeman has no permanent landed property, he has a permanent right to a share in the land of the community, and he has complete ownership of his homestead. He has also a right to a share in the common pasturage. But though these facts testify to a considerable development since the days of Caesar and Ariovistus, there are many social features which still survive. They are still without cities, and their buildings are very rudely put together. They are still chaste, they are still plain and simple in dress, and they are still indifferent to merchandise. Differences in social rank and dignity seem to have been of three kinds. 1. Some were more wealthy, that is, possessed more cattle than others and those who were more wealthy must have had a larger share of pasture and arable land. It is true that all the allotments of land were equal, but then one man may have held more than one allotment. 2. Some were noble by race, or descendants of kings or gods or great chieftains, and others were not. Those tribes which adopted monarchy chose their kings on account of nobility. This distinction of nobilis and ingenui probably involved no inequality in political rights. 3. Besides the freeborn, including the nobles, who possessed political rights, were the freedmen and servi. There were two kinds of servi. a. The slaves, consisting of those who lost their freedom by gambling, and perhaps prisoners of war, and b. The cultivators of the land, corresponding to the Roman colonii. The second class was far the more important, and probably consisted of the original occupiers of the land who had been subdued by the German tribe when it took possession. The German colon, 
as we may call the slave of this class, possessed a home of his own, and was personally free, except in relation to his lord, whom he could not desert, and his land, which, like the medieval serf, he could not forsake. He paid to his lord a fixed quantity of corn, or cattle, or clothing. His lot was not hard, but his lord might kill him with impunity. The administration of the tribe resided in the tribe or cuitas itself, whether the tribe adopted monarchy or not. The national assembly, which met at the new or full moon, wielded the power. All the freeborn members of the community attended it in arms, without distinction of seat. In their assemblies, questions of war and peace were determined. The magistrates who administered justice were elected, and it acted as a court of justice itself. The magistrates, or principes, as Tacitus calls them, had the right of keeping a comitatus. This characteristic German institution was a body of warriors attached to a chieftain who provided them with their equipment and entertained them. They fought for him in war, and were bound to defend him and attribute to him their own brave deeds. Their chief employment was war, and the dignity and fame of the chieftain depended largely on the number and efficiency of his companions. The principes acted independently of each other, each in his district, in time of peace, but in war all obeyed a leader chosen by the common council. Royalty, in those tribes where it existed, was of a very limited nature, and involved rather honorary privileges than political power. The host or military force of the tribe consisted of both cavalry and infantry. The cavalry was composed of the comitatus of the principes. The infantry was of two kinds. Each district, pagus, sent a hundred chosen champions or fighting men who fought in front in battle, and besides these there was the mass of the freemen who were arranged in families. At the beginning of 99 AD, Trajan returned from the Danube to Rome, where he was received with warm and unfeigned enthusiasm, and became consul for the third time. He renewed the pledge which he had already given to the Senate in writing that he would not condemn a senator to death, and this oath he always respected. He had received from the fathers the title of Pater Patriae. He avenged the tears of Nerva by punishing the mutineers of the Praetorian Guard, and he was so confident in his own military authority that he restored by one half the usual donative to the soldiers, and no murmur was heard. In handing to the Praetorian prefect the dagger, which was a sign of his office, Trajan employed the celebrated words, Use this for me, if I do well, against me, if I do ill. His moderate demeanor conciliated the senators, and his wife, Plotina, conducted herself with the same modesty. As she entered the palace, she is reported to have turned to the multitude, and said that she entered it with a perfect equanimity, as she would wish to leave it, if fate required. General satisfaction was felt when Trajan punished the delators whom Nerva had spared. Some were executed, others banished. Trajan only remained two years at Rome, and then proceeded to deal with the Dacian question, which the mission had not settled. Of his work in administration and legislation during those two years, some account will be given in the following chapter. End of chapter 23, sections 1 and 2. Chapter 23, sections 3 and 4 of J. B. Beery's The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lenny. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2, by John Buniel Bury. Chapter 23, Nerva and Trajan, and the Conquest of Dacia, 96 to 117 A.D. Sections 3 and 4. Section 3. First Dacian War, 101-102 A.D. In making war against the Dacian king Decebalus, 
Trajan had no thought of extending the limits of the empire. Its natural border, in that quarter, was the Danube, just as its natural border in the east was the Euphrates. His object was to prevent the consolidation of a great rival power on the Roman frontier, by reducing the Dacian state to a position of dependence on Rome, somewhat like that of Armenia. Formerly, indeed, Domitian had been acknowledged overlord by the Sebelus when he set the diadem on the brow of Diages. But the gifts, which he had consented to send to the Dacian king at certain times, were too much like a tribute, and seemed dishonorable to the mistress of the world. Trajan was determined to ward down the proud and teach the Dacian his place. On the 25th of March of 101 A.D., sacrifices were offered at Rome for the success of Trajan's expedition, and perhaps on that very day, certainly soon after, he set out from the city for the Danube. Besides the eight legions stated in the Illyric provinces, three in Pannonia and five in Messia, the emperor brought the twenty-first Rapax from Lower Germany to take part in the war. It has been supposed that the forces which he led into Dacia amounted to about sixty thousand men. The German and Mauritanian cavalry, the latter led by Lucius Quietus, played a conspicuous part in the campaign. Tiberius Claudius Livianus, the Praetorian prefect, and Liberius Maximus, governor of Mysia, were the most prominent among the officers, but Trajan directed all the operations himself. The future emperor, Hadrian, who had married Trajan's niece, Julia Sabina, was among the imperial comites. The object of the invading army was Sarmizegethusa, the chief city of Dacia. It seems probable that the Sebelus first made this place the capital, and that previously Porolissum, in the northwest of the country, held that position. The policy of Beribistus had tended rather towards the west, whereas that of the Sebelus looked southwards. It is possible that the complete occupation of Pannonia by the Romans may have had something to do with this shifting in Dacia. The choice of the Sebelus was a happy one. Sarmizegetusa, now called Varheli by the Hungarians, Gredistie by the Slavs, is easy to get at from other parts of the land, and at the same time easy to defend. It is connected with the northern regions of the river Marissus, Maris, by the Strigi Valley, while westward the pass of the Iron Gate leads to the valleys of a river, whose ancient name is unknown, but which is now called the Bistra, and of the Tibiscus, Thames. The plains of the lower Danube can be reached either through the Vulcan Pass or by the defile of the Red Tower. Thus, three routes were open to Trajan. 1. He might cross the Danube at Viminacium, opposite to which, on the left bank, was the Dacian fortress of Lederata. From Lederata, a road led northwards, across the Bersava, to the valley of the Tibiscus, ascended this valley, and then, turning eastward, led up the valley of its tributary to the Bistra, and so reached the Iron Gate. 2. Lower down the river, the Roman fort of Saliatis was confronted by Tierna on the Dacian bank, from which a road led past Admedium, Mehadia, to the confluence of the Thames and the Bistra. 3. A third road led from Drobete, opposite to Egeta, near the modern Turnus Severin, and proceeded by the valley of the Alutus and by the pass of the Red Tower. The first of these routes was chosen by Trajan. Viminacium, Castolets, had two evident advantages as a starting point. Being equally distant from Pannonia and Mysia, it was a convenient center for gathering the troops together, and its strong fortifications made it a good base in the rear of the advancing army. It was also nearer Italy than the other possible starting points. Transport vessels were actively engaged in bringing corn, wine, vinegar, and other provisions to the place of assembling. The boats coming from Mysia had to pass through the iron gate of the Danube. Here the river, 
close towards Sova, is enclosed between two walls of rock, rising directly from the water, and of immense height. In the narrowest part, where the stream can hardly win its passage, there is an inscription of Trajan, cut in the rock, and recording how he made a path on the side of the steep mountain of stone. This path was for the purpose of towing the boats of provisions. At Viminasium, then a bridge of boats was thrown across the Danube, for the transit of the army, and on the other side Trajan performed the due sacrifices. Their march lay by Bersovia, on the river now called Bersava, and Axis on a more northerly river. As the Romans approached the Tibiscus, an embassy arrived from the Buri, a Suevian tribe who dwelled north of the Jaziges, in the neighborhood of the Quadi. Their errand, which, it is said, was in some manner inscribed on an enormous mushroom, was to counsel the emperor to abandon his project and make peace with the Dacians. This incident can hardly be regarded as anything but a piece of insolence. The Buri fought in the army of the Cebulus. In his advance, Trajan neglected no precautions in fortifying camps and sending forward scouts. But the enemy had retreated into the recesses of the country and left the road free. At length, when the Romans reached Tape, Tapia, on the Tibiscus, a place which commands the entrance to the Bistra Valley, they found the Dacians drawn up in a strong position between the river and wooded hills. This place had been the scene of Julian's great victory thirteen years before, and it proved auspicious again to the arms of Trajan. The Romans were assisted by a thunderstorm, which threw the ranks of the enemy into disorder. In this, the first battle, the infantry on both sides seemed to have been chiefly engaged. Though the legions conquered, the victory cost them dear. It is probable that one legion, the twenty-first Rapax, perished almost entirely in the battle. It is related that the emperor gave his own clothes for bandages to bind up the wounds of the injured. He built an altar to the manes of those who had fallen, and instituted a yearly sacrifice in their memory. Not far from Tape was the town of Tibiscum, which was taken and set on fire, and then the legions advanced up the Bistra Valley. A deputation from the Cebulus, suing for peace, soon arrived. It consisted of three men on horses without saddles, followed by a number of men on foot, all of inferior rank, not belonging to the nobility, whom the Romans called Pileatai, or men of the cap. Trajan refused to listen to such envoys. The war, however, was soon suspended, owing to the approach of winter, when the invaders had only penetrated halfway up the Bistra Valley. Trajan returned to winter in Pannonia, with the greater part of his army, but left all the fortresses he had occupied strongly garrisoned. In the following spring, 102 AD, Trajan and his legions descended by boat to Viminasium, the emperor himself rowing or steering along with the men and retraced the road which they had traversed the year before. They found all their posts safe. Two small encounters took place now, and resulted in Roman victories, which were followed by the submission of one of the Dacian tribes. Then Trajan continued his advance on the capital. The way was difficult. The soldiers had to hew their way through forests with the axe, and they were constantly hindered by ditches and precipices. The defense of the Dacians now became more active as the enemy was approaching the heart of their country. Their belief in immortality aided their bravery and made them unsparing of their lives. They were now assisted by reinforcements of Sarmatian mounted archers, whose steeds, as well as the riders, are represented on Trajan's column as clad completely in mail. The fury of the struggle may be measured by the horrible tortures which the Dacian women inflicted on Roman prisoners by burning parts of their bodies with lighted brands. At length, the last fortress, defending the approach to Sarmis Egethusa, fell before the attack of Trajan, while his general, Liberius Maximus, at the same time captured the sister of the Cebulus in another town. Some high mountain fastnesses were also taken, 
and the Roman eagle was recovered, which had been lost by the mission's general, Cornelius Fuscus. After these successes, the Cebalus once more sued for peace, but this time his messengers were Pileati. Their supplication was humbler, they bent the knee to Trajan, and implored pardon. They asked him to consent to meet their king, professing that he was ready to submit to any conditions, and if he would not agree to this, at least to send deputies to the Cebalus. Licinius Sura, Trajan's friend, and Lavianus, the prefect, were sent, but the negotiations came to nothing, and the struggle was resumed. A tract of forest still separated the Romans from the Dacian capital. The Mauritanian cavalry, with Lysias Quietus at their head, attacked several detachments of the enemy, and drove them into the recesses of the woods, where they barricaded themselves by trees, and their position had to be stormed like a regular fortress. The way was thus prepared for the main body of the Roman army, and on emerging on the other side of the forest, they found themselves in front of Sarmizegethusa. The Dacians did not wait to endure the slow course of a siege. They came forth to fight, and were conquered. Then, in order to save his capital from destruction, the Cebalus submitted to whatever terms the victor deemed fitting to impose, and came himself, along with two of his chief officers, into the presence of the Roman emperor, to implore mercy. He was required to surrender all his military engines, all Roman deserters, and the workmen who had been placed at his disposal by the mission. He undertook either to destroy or to hand over to the conquerors all his fortresses. Dacia became a dependent state, and the king was bound neither to make war nor to conclude peace without the consent of Rome. Having left garrisons in some of the Dacian fortresses, and especially in Sarmizegethusa itself, Trajan returned to Rome, accompanied by Dacian deputies, who went through the form of submitting themselves to the Senate, and the peace was not regarded as finally concluded until the Senate ratified the terms which the Emperor had imposed. Trajan had been proclaimed Imperator three times during this war, once in the first campaign after the Battle of Tape, and twice in the second campaign. The Senate decreed him the title of Dacicus, and he was designated consul for the following year. Out of the large booty, a congiarium was distributed to the people. Section 4 Second Dacian War, 105 to 106 A.D. It soon became evident that the Cebalus did not intend to carry out the terms which his conqueror had imposed upon him. He had accepted them in order to gain a respite and make preparations for another struggle for the liberty of Dacia. But in attempting to shake off the lesser yoke of federation, he was destined only to bring upon his country the heavier yoke of direct subjection to Rome. When the emperor learned that his vassal was playing false, was receiving deserters, building and renovating fortresses, collecting the instruments of warfare, and carrying on suspicious negotiations with the neighboring tribes, he determined to overthrow the Cebalus altogether and convert Dacia into a Roman province. In taking this resolve, he departed from the recognized policy of the Roman government to abstain from extending the borders of the empire. He transgressed the precept of Augustus, as Claudius had already done in the case of Britain. He has been accused of unwisdom in taking this step, of sacrificing the interests of the empire to the ambition of military conquest. But we do not know the full circumstances of the case, and it would be rash to say, that the continuance of the dependent Dacian kingdom would have been less dangerous to the empire than the creation of the Dacian province. If merely military ambition prompted Trajan in the second war, why did it not prompt him to the same policy in the first? In 104 AD, the Cebalus was decreed by the Senate to be an enemy of the Roman people, and Trajan set out for Mysia to superintend the preparations for invading Dacia in the following year. He chose a different route from that which he had followed in the former war. Instead of starting from Viminacium, he started from Egeta, 
at which place he caused a permanent stone bridge to be built across the Danube. The architect was Apollodorus of Damascus, and bricks used in the construction of the pillars have been found, which show that soldiers of the 13th legion were employed in the work. The construction of this solid bridge, a wonderful work of engineering, was a sign of Trajan's resolve to make Dacia a province of the empire. For the second war, more troops were mustered than for the first. To the eight Illyric legions, four were added from the two German provinces. The Sabellus on his side had also made great preparations, especially in building fortresses, which seemed to have played a greater part in the second than in the first war. But perhaps he did not fully believe in his own powers, ultimately, to resist the invader, for we find him, while Trajan was still in Mysia, suborning two deserters to take the life of the emperor by poison. One of the traitors was arrested on suspicion, and revealed under torture the name of his accomplice. This episode casts a slur on the career of the Dacian hero. From Drobete, Trajan might follow either of two routes to reach the Dacian capital. The shortest was by the pass of Vulcan, but shortness was not Trajan's aim, otherwise he would have gone as before by Viminacium and the Bistra Valley. His object seems to have been to cut off the retreat of the enemy towards the eastern parts of Dacia, and therefore he took the other route by the Red Tower. Marching eastward from Drobete, he reached the river Alutus at Pons Alutai, but, without crossing the river, moved up the valley on the right bank. During his march, several Dacian and Josigic tribes sent messages of submission. Of the details of the march, of the points at which the Dacians offered resistance, of the length of time which elapsed before Sarmizegetusa was reached, we know nothing certain. The pass of the Red Tower was, doubtless, staunchly defended. One instance of noble self-sacrifice has been preserved. A valuable officer of Trajan, Cassius Longinus, a camp prefect, had somehow been enticed into the power of the Sebelus, who kept him a prisoner, and sent a message to Trajan that he would not release his captive unless Dacia were evacuated and the expenses of the war paid. The emperor, unwilling to seal the doom of Longinus, did not flatly refuse, but the prisoner freed his imperator from the dilemma by swallowing poison. The movements of the Romans were slow, but sure. At length, probably in 106 AD, they approached the capital of the Sebelus from the eastern side and laid siege to it. A battle was fought, in which the Dacians were worsted, and then the Sebelus caused his followers to set fire to their city. A number of Dacian nobles, thinking further resistance useless and not wishing to fall alive into the hands of the victor, assembled for a last banquet and drank a poisoned cup. Most of the common people submitted to the Romans. The Sabellus himself, with a few devoted followers, fled, but was followed by Roman troops, and after a combat, dispatched himself with his sword. His head was brought to Trajan, and sent to Rome. His followers resisted to the last, and were not taken until the Romans set fire to the fortress in which they had shut themselves up. Trajan was saluted Imperator for the sixth time. Having arranged the organization of the new province, Trajan returned to Rome, end of 107 AD, and celebrated his triumph by a feast which lasted 123 days. Ten thousand gladiators fought in the spectacles. The people received a congiarium, and the emperor, as one who had extended the boundaries of Roman territory, extended also the pomerium of the city. The great memorial of these Dacian wars is the column of Trajan, erected by the senate in the new Forum Traiani, where it stands to this day. This column, one hundred feet high, is decorated by sculptures in low relief of scenes from both the wars. It is a picture book of the Dacian campaigns, but unluckily to most of the pictures we have no text.
the Caesar who conquered Dacia, like the Caesar who conquered Gaul, wrote an account of his conquest, but the commentaries of Trajan have not survived, and this is, perhaps, one of the greatest losses that history has to deplore. Nor have we, in its place, any other full account of the wars, nothing but a late and meagre epitome. In these circumstances, the pillar of Trajan is of the greatest value. It is possible, from the vivid illustrations whose meaning is generally clear, to supplement in many important particulars the one very deficient written record which we possess. Just as the Bayou tapestry helps the historian to understand the story of the Norman conquest of England, so the pillar of Trajan helps him to follow the Roman conquest of Dacia. It does not indeed throw light on the chronology and geography of the campaigns, as to which we are almost hopelessly in the dark, and it does not give a complete view of the war, for only those episodes are represented in which Trajan himself took part. Its value, perhaps, is ethnographical rather than strictly historical. It teaches us what the bearded Dacians were like, with their long hair, loose drawers, and long-sleeved jerkins. We see them fighting under their dragons, the Dacian standard. We see the Sarmatian archers on horseback, clad in complete mail. The various events of the march, as well as battle scenes and sieges, pass before us. We see the Roman soldiers following their standard-bearer across the bridge of boats at Viminacium, and the river god, the Danube, rising from his bed to behold them. Then we see the emperor performing sacrifices in front of the camp, the cutting down of trees, the construction of camps, the making of bridges, the emperor addressing the troops, are all represented. We see Dacian spies dragged by the hair into Trajan's presence, Soldiers displaying to the emperor the bloody heads of enemies they have slain, the Dacians carrying their wounded into a wood. A village built on stakes in a lake is set on fire. The women and children implore mercy. The houses of the barbarians are round with pointed roofs. Here is portrayed the distribution of distinctions to brave soldiers. There, the tortures which Dacian women inflict on Roman captives. In the sculptures of the Second War, we have a view of the capital city of the Cebulus, his palace, and probably the temple of Zalmoxis. We see the Dacian chiefs sitting in a circle and emptying the bowl of poison in front of the burning town. Then we see the head of the Cebulus presented to Trajan on a dish. The sculptures are ranged in a spiral band round the column, which supported a colossal statue of the Imperator. End of sections 3 and 4. Chapter 23, sections 5 and 6 of J. B. Beery's The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lenny. The Student's Roman Empire, Part Two, by John Baniel Bury, Chapter Twenty Three, Nerva and Trajan and the Conquest of Dacia, Ninety Six to One Hundred Seventeen A.D., Sections Five and Six. Section Five: Organization of Dacia. Dacia differed in one important respect from the other provinces of the empire. It was bounded on three sides by territory that was not Roman and thus resembled a peninsula of civilization jutting out into a barbarian sea. The land between the Danube and the Thais was left to the Jazyges, and never formed part of the empire, so that Dacia was thus separated from Pannonia. In fact, Dacia was an eccentric position thrown out from the natural Danube frontier. It is generally thought that Trajan was guilty of a political error in occupying it, but perhaps the error rather consisted in not going further. Certainly the annexation of Josygia seemed called for in order to complete a continuous line of frontier from the Rhine to the Pruth or Dniester. It is to be observed that the Dacian province did not extend as far east as the Pruth. It included Transylvania, the Banat, 
and western Wallachia. In eastern Wallachia and Moldavia there are no remains of Roman civilization, and while they were included in the Roman sphere of influence, they can hardly have belonged to the province. The remains of fortifications between the Pruv and the Dniester in modern Bessarabia have been discovered, but do not necessarily imply that the Dacian province extended so far. The native population of Dacia was exhausted by the wars, and the greater part of what remained was driven out by Trajan, probably into the eastern regions beyond the Eludus. One of the scenes on the pillar represents the fugitives going forth from their homes. A few were allowed to remain in Transylvania, but they were isolated and gradually disappeared. The land was repopulated by colonists from all parts of the Roman world, especially from Asia Minor, and thus the province of Dacia never represented a nationality. Dalmatians, skilled in mining operations, were settled in the northern districts in order to work the valuable gold mines, which were probably a considerable motive in inducing Trajan to conquer the country. They not only rendered Dacia self-supporting, but were a source of additional wealth to the fiscus. The province was placed under a legatus Augusti pro praetore. The first governor, D. Terentius Corianus, was remembered as the founder of the colony of Sarmizegethusa, under the name Ulpia Traiana. Apollum, however, further north, corresponding to the present Carlsberg, was more important than the capital of the Sibylus. It was the center of the road system of the province. Besides, these two cities, Nepeca in the north and Tierna on the Danube, received Ius Italicum. It is probable that Trajan left two legions as the garrison of his new province. Both Mysia and Pannonia were guarded more strongly than ever, eight legions being distributed between them. One of the great consequences of the Dacian War was the shifting of the military center of gravity in Europe from the Rhine to the Danube. The legions which were taken from the German provinces were not sent back, except first Minervia, but were kept in the Illyric provinces. Here Trajan made a new administrative arrangement. As the mission had divided Mysia, so he broke up Pannonia into an upper and lower province, each under a legatus. In lower Pannonia he established a military station at Acumincum, close to the confluence of the Thies and the Danube, in order to be a check on the Jesides. In connection with Trajan's reorganization of these provinces, some new towns were founded, for example, Martianopolis, called after his sister Marciana, and Nicopolis on the Danube. Many old towns were enlarged or improved, such as Poitovio in Pannonia, Ratiaria near Widen, Serdica, Sofia, Oescus. The stations of the army of Lower Mysia were now fixed at Norway and Durostorum, Silistria. The Dobrudja district at the mouth of the Danube seems to have been excluded by Trajan from the province, though it was included in the following reign. The remains of a threefold system of ramparts of earth and stone running eastward from the Danube below Durostorum to the sea near Tomai have been discovered, and there are reasons for attributing the fortification to Trajan. One of the most distinct results of the Dacian conquest was that it stifled all thoughts of insurrection among the Thracians, whose restless spirits were no longer fomented by free kinsmen in the north. Trajan made Thrace, hitherto, a procuratorial province dependent on Mysia, a province of the first rank under a legatus Augusti pro praetore. Section 6. Province of Arabia While the emperor was himself reducing the newly conquered client state of Dacia into the form of a province, the governor of Syria, Cornelius Palma, was also bringing under the direct rule of Rome the elder client state of the Nabataeans. Malchus, king of the Nabataeans, had supported Vespasian in the Jewish war, and was succeeded by his son Dabel, who was destined to be the last of the line. The change introduced, doubtless for commercial reasons, by Trajan, was really administrative, but was not accomplished without resistance on the part of the Arabs, and Palma was considered a conqueror of Arabia. 
Some outlying regions possessed by the Nabataean king were abandoned. Damascus was annexed to the province of Syria, and the rest of the kingdom was organized as an imperial province under a legatus augusti pro praetore. He commanded a legion which was stationed at Bostra. The province is often called Arabia Petraia, from the important city of Petra. The country was protected by military stations. A line of fortresses protected the road from Damascus to Palmyra. Under direct Roman rule, which by its permanent military strength ensured peace, Greek civilization began to penetrate into these regions on the border of the desert. Hitherto, Hellenism, opposed by Jewish influences, had made little way here. Trajan's innovations made a new epoch. It is significant that no Greek monument dating from the time before Trajan has been found within the limits of the Nabataean kingdom, while, on the other hand, there are no inscriptions in the native tongue after Trajan. The commercial importance of Bostra, the new Bostra of Trajan, as it was called, dates from the time when it became the center of the Roman province. Its good position made it the great market for the Syrian desert, the Arabian highlands, and Persia. It became the rival of Damascus. Buildings sprang up rapidly in this land under Roman rule. New towns arose, symmetrically built, adorned with palaces and temples, theaters and baths, aqueducts and triumphal arches. The architecture, owing to want of wood, developed some peculiar features, especially in the treatment of the stone arc and the dome, which give the buildings of this region a place of their own among Greek buildings of the imperial period. Another client state had ceased to exist a few years before. On the death of Agrippa the second in a hundred AD, the last remnant of the kingdom of Herod was annexed to the province of Syria. In consequence of this enlargement and the subsequent addition of Damascus, Syria reached under Trajan its widest limits as a province, and as the legatus exercised control over the secondary province of Judea, his sphere of government was a very large one. End of chapter twenty three, section six. Chapter twenty four, section one of J. B. Beery's The Student's Roman Empire, part two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lenny. The Student's Roman Empire, Part Two, by John Bunyell Beery, Chapter Twenty Four, Trajan's Principate Continued, ninety-eight to one hundred seventeen A.D., Section One, Trajan's Administration, Rome and Italy. Trajan ranks amongst the greatest emperors of Rome, but he stands alone. He boldly inaugurated a new policy of conquest but his successors refused to walk in the path which he marked out. His originality was fruitless. He did not influence the ages which succeeded him. The province of Dacia, his only work that was in any way abiding, ceased to be Roman before two centuries had elapsed. Trajan was, above all, a soldier, and his aggressive policy was largely due to this fact. His military undertakings were successful, but the reports of them, which have come down, are not sufficient to let us judge whether his strategy was original. He was robust in mind and body. He had a clear understanding, but one of a thoroughly practical turn, and he had no taste for literature. He was not averse to pleasures, but was careful not to indulge in them to the hurt of others. He was genial and popular in his manner, and used to play the part of a comrade to his soldiers. His chief foible was vanity. He was fond of naming places after himself and members of his family. He caused the title of Augusta to be conferred not only on his wife, Plotina, but on his sister, Marciana, and her daughter, Matidia. Trajan's personal appearance was noble and impressive. He was tall of stature, and his features were regular. He had an aquiline nose, a broad and low forehead, thick, straight-cut hair. He was the first emperor to whom a special name was given to designate 
his personal qualities. In 100 AD, the Senate conferred on him the name Optimus, which, however, he did not adopt as one of his titles until the later period, 114 AD. In his relations with the senators, Trajan was studiously moderate in language and demeanor. He was careful to maintain the fiction that the Senate was a free body, as in the days of the Republic. He proposed to be a princeps, not like Domitian, a dominus. You bid us be free, says Pliny. We will be free. He faithfully kept his oath never to take the life of a senator. When his friend Licinius Sura was secretly charged with a treasonable conspiracy, he sent for Sura's physician to anoint his eyes and let himself be shaved by Sura's barber. Next day he said, If my friend proposed to take my life, he might have compassed his design yesterday. Copernius Crosses, who had been pardoned by Nerva, afterwards conspired against Trajan and was put to death, not, however, by the emperor, but by his own senatorial colleagues. But while Trajan disarmed opposition and won golden opinions by outward respect for the fathers and by the observance of superficial forms, he avoided having to restore to the senate any real powers. He retained the substance of monarchy, and endeavored to render it palatable by a show of equality between the monarch and the other senators. He made no objection to the expression of republican sentiments, and allowed the followers of Thracia and Helvidius to indulge in their harmless hero-worship of Brutus and Cassius. Yet men like Pliny did not disguise from themselves that they were under the absolute rule of a single man, but they recognized that he worked for the public weal. Thus the policy of Trajan resembled that of Vespasian, except that Trajan was more affable and more tolerant. But he developed the monarchical principle in at least two ways. One, he did not assume a perpetual censorship like the mission, but he did what was more unconstitutional. He created new patricians without assuming the censorship at all. This was equivalent to claiming censorial power as part of the imperial prerogative. 2. He instituted an imperial control over the local administration of the towns of Italy, of the free cities in the imperial provinces, and of the cities which were subject to the administration of the Senate. These three classes of the community were hitherto exempt from the interference of the emperor, and the appointment of an imperial officer called Curator Republicae, with control over the affairs of such a community, was a distinct step in the growth of monarchy. The curator was of equestrian or senatorial rank, and was chosen from some neighboring community. He had control over the municipal administration, especially in regard to the public buildings and the town rent roll. In many cases, doubtless, and especially in the senatorial provinces, there had been financial mismanagement, and the intervention of the state was beneficial. But the political tendency of the measure was to increase the sphere of the emperor's influence on the one hand, and to level the distinction existing between the various communities of the empire on the other. The control of the emperor in Italy tended to reduce the mother country to the position of the subject lands, and the intervention of imperial officers to correct the state of the free communities seriously diminished the value of their privileges. Otherwise, Trajan's policy in domestic and civil administration was not marked by any particular tendency. He does not appear to have been guided much by general principles, but rather to have dealt with each question as it arose on its own merits. Many beneficial results in special departments of law were achieved by his legislation. Like Claudius, he used personally to deal out judgment in the tribunals of Rome, and used himself to try all cases of appeal to the imperial court. His spirit of moderation and equity is expressed in the sentiment, which is attributed to him, that it is better that the guilty should escape unpunished than that the innocent should be condemned. The state finances seem to have been managed by Trajan with discretion and success, for, notwithstanding the large expenses incurred by his wars and his buildings, 
no increase of taxation was found necessary. On the contrary, the duty on inheritances, vicesima hereditatum, was alleviated in certain cases. Trajan published a budget with the details of the public expenditure, a popular measure, but also a politic move, as showing how favorably his administration compared with that of his predecessors. He also established a special court to deal with fiscal lawsuits. The secret of Trajan's financial success lay partly in the strict economy of his court, but also in the large increase of revenue derived from the province of Dacia and its rich mines. One feature of his reign has received severe condemnation. He adopted from his predecessors the practice of giving congiaria to the people of Rome, but increased the amount of the donation to an extravagant height. His first congiarium, 99 AD, was probably no larger than that of Nerva, 75 denarii, 2 pounds 10 shillings a head. But his second and third distributions of money, after each Dacian war, amounted to 650 denarii a head, he thus introduced a precedent of extravagant charity which became a serious tax on his successors. Though it was the general tendency under the empire to alleviate the conditions of slavery, Trajan inclined in a contrary direction and passed some laws which made the discipline of servitude harder. By the existing legislation, when a master was assassinated, all his slaves were condemned to death. Trajan introduced a new regulation by which not only the testamentary freedmen, but those freedmen who had received their liberty during their master's life, and possessed either wholly or partly Roman citizenship, were subjected to torture. He also issued an edict that a freedman or a slave, who had obtained from the emperor Roman citizenship in its complete form, without the knowledge of his patron or master, and possessed thereby the right of freely disposing of his property, should retain the right during his lifetime, but should on his death be regarded as a freedman possessing only the use latinum, so that his fortune might revert to his patron. Trajan followed the example of Nerva in paying special attention to the welfare of Italy. The possibility of an invasion by the barbarians beyond the Danube which in Domitian's reign may have seemed near enough, may have awakened the minds of statesmen to the importance of maintaining the population and encouraging agriculture in Italy, if only for the purpose of strengthening her against a hostile attack. In four ways Trajan came to the rescue of Italy. In the first place, he carried on, extended and modified, the elementary institutions which Nerva had founded, this policy directly contributed to encourage marriage and raise the population. Secondly, the state further encouraged small proprietors by advancing loans at small interest. Thirdly, Trajan renewed the law of Tiberius that all provincials who became senators must invest a third of their property in Italian land. Fourthly, he tried to hinder emigration from Italy by an ordinance that no Italians should take part in the foundation of new colonies. This Italian policy involved the principle that the provinces were to contribute to the maintenance of the mother country. It was a principle which was not then disputed, but which was manifestly unfair, inasmuch as the legions which defended the provinces were no longer recruited from Italy. On the other hand, as we have seen, the institution of curatores tended to deprive Italy of political privileges. Trajan concerned himself with the improvement of Italian traffic, both by sea and land. He restored the harbors of Ostia and Centumcele, Civita Vecchia, on the west coast, and enlarged that of Ancona on the east. At Ostia, he excavated a very large hexagonal basin, still called the Lago Trajano, and connected it with the port of Claudius by two smaller basins. This new port was surrounded with quays and buildings for magazines. He constructed a road through the Pomptine marshes on the coast of Latium, and converted the mule path, which led directly from Beneventum to Brundisium, into a regular road called Via Traiana. Nor did he neglect the welfare of Rome. 
he improved the water supply by executing important repairs of the aquamarchia and the anionovus and conferred a great benefit on the inhabitants of the transtiberine quarter by building an aqueduct to supply them the aqua traiana this aqueduct derived its waters from the lacus sabatinus and is used at the present day under the name of the aqua paola trajan built two public baths the thermae traianae near the baths of titus intended exclusively for the use of women and the thermae surianae in memory of his friend licinius sura he arranged for a cheaper supply of bread in italy and rome by reorganizing the guild of bakers a considerable concession on trajan's part as he always manifested great jealousy of collegia and corporations the list of those who received corn was revised and five thousand poor children were placed among the recipients the great monuments of trajan in rome was his new forum which was confessed by posterity to be one of the most striking sights of the city it lay in a narrow valley which he formed by cutting off a spur between the Capitoline and the Quirinal hills, and was designed to form a connecting link between the other fora and the Campus marshes. It was in fact a northerly continuation of the Forum of Augustus. The execution of the design was entrusted to Apollodorus of Damascus, the skilful architect who built the bridge of the Danube at Turnus Severin. The western and eastern sides of the Forum were formed by semicircles hewn out of the hills in front of which were rectilineal porticos enclosing the area in the middle of the space was an equestrian statue of the emperor the southern side was occupied by a magnificent entrance and the northern by the basilica opiana a large edifice behind it was the pillar of trajan which has been already described in the centre of a small place whose sides were formed by two libraries, one of Latin, the other of Greek works. Beyond this space was a temple, completed after Trajan's death, and consecrated to him by his successor. End of section 1This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2, by John Bagnall Bury. Chapter 24. Trajan's Principate. Section 2. Administration of the Provinces. Correspondence of Pliny and Trajan. The corruption of the governors of the senatorial provinces is illustrated by the cases of Marius Priscus and Cecilius Classicus, which occurred at the beginning of Trajan's reign. Marius Priscus, who had been proconsul of Africa, was accused in 99 AD by the provincials and prosecuted by Pliny and the historian Tacitus. The case came before the Senate in the following year, Trajan as consul presiding. It was proved that Marius had indeed fleeced the Ephri. For a bribe of three hundred thousand sesterces, he had banished a knight and put to death seven of his friends. He flogged, sentenced to the mines, and finally strangled another knight for a bribe of seven hundred thousand. The sentence of the court was that the seven hundred thousand should be paid to the aerarium, and that Marius should be exiled from Italy. This was a poor compensation to the province for its sufferings. Soon after this, Pliny prosecuted Classicus, formerly governor of Bitica, at the instance of the inhabitants. His guilt was proved, but he died before the trial. In the administration of the provinces, Trajan's reign offers nothing noteworthy, except liberality in the construction of new roads, and the policy, already mentioned, of intervening in the affairs of free communities by means of a curator republicae, and sending special commissioners to senatorial provinces. Thus Sexus Quintilius Maximus was sent to Achaia, probably to supervise the affairs of the free states of Greece. In this policy Trajan did not aim at uniformity. He only adopted it in cases where special circumstances seemed to demand his intervention. The wretched condition to which the province of Bithynia had been reduced by the incompetent rule 
of the senatorial proconsuls, was a case which called for the emperor's interference, and he saw good to make it, temporarily, an imperial province. He probably made the loss good to the senate by assigning to it the province of Pamphylia instead. He appointed Pliny as legatus Augusti pro praetori, to restore order in the demoralized province. The provincials had instituted suits against corrupt proconsuls, and while the proceedings had dragged slowly on, the finances had fallen into disorder, the public buildings remained unfinished, and social life had been completely paralyzed. Pliny, who had had no previous experience of provincial government, referred to the emperor for instruction on every question which arose, and their correspondence has come down to us. It shows us that Trajan was averse to treating different cases in the same way, or applying a general rule, as Pliny suggested to do, to the whole province. He adopted the more equitable and more troublesome plan of paying regard to the local usages and special traditions of each community. It would be a great mistake to infer from the minute details with which the emperor concerned himself in the case of Bithynia that he devoted the same attention to the minor affairs of all the other provinces of the empire. On the contrary, he seems to have laid a great deal of responsibility on the shoulders of the governors. Bithynia was a special case. Its condition at this time is one among many pieces of evidence that the government of the imperial provinces was far better than that of the senatorial. The correspondence of Trajan and Pliny gives a most interesting glimpse of the questions and affairs which the emperor had to deal with in governing the provinces, and it is all the more valuable as our record of Trajan's reign is otherwise meagre. The following abbreviated extracts from the correspondence will serve to give an insight into some sides of Roman provincial government. They will also illustrate the practical judgment of Trajan, and the narrow limits within which Pliny was permitted to decide for himself. 1. Imperial Authorization of Public Works Pliny. May the people of Prusa be authorized to replace their bathhouse, which is old and dilapidated, with new termi? money will be forthcoming for the work. Trajan? Yes, if the construction will not be too great a burden for their strength or necessitate the imposition of a special tax. Pliny. Sinope lacks water. I have found a copious spring of good quality sixteen miles away, but the aqueduct will have to pass for a distance of about a mile over soft and uncertain ground. I can easily raise the money required. It only remains for me to secure your approval." Trajan, make this aqueduct, but first carefully examine whether the suspicious locality can bear it, and whether the expense does not exceed the ability of the town. Pliny, Nicomedia has expended over three million sesterces, twenty-four thousand pounds, on an aqueduct which has been abandoned and is now in ruins, two million, sixteen thousand pounds, on another which has also been abandoned. I have means for making a third which will stand if you will send an inspector of aqueducts or an architect. Trajan, supply Nicomedia with water, but investigate by whose fault so much money has been wasted. Pliny, Nicaea has expended ten million sesterces, eighty thousand pounds, on a theatre which is tottering, and great sums on a gymnasium which was burned and which they are rebuilding. At Claudiopolis they are excavating a bathhouse at the foot of a mountain, with the money which the decurions appointed by you pay for their admission to the curia. What am I to do with respect to all these works? Send me an architect to advise. Trajan, you are on the spot, decide. As for architects, we at Rome sent to Greece for them. You will therefore find them about you. Pliny, a mistress is infected by a sewer which ought to be covered. If you permit the work to be executed, I have the money required. Trajan, cover this infectious stream. Pliny, there is a great lake on the confines of the territory of Nicomedia, Lake Sophon, about ten miles east of that city. It would be highly advantageous to connect it with the sea by a canal. Send me an engineer. Trajan, take care that the lake, in uniting with the sea, does not run out entirely. I will send you from here men conversant with this kind of work. 2. Supervision of Municipal Finances Pliny The money due to towns of the province has been called in, and no borrowers at twelve percent are to be found. 
ought I to reduce the rate of interest, or, if that fails to attract borrowers, compel the decurions to borrow the money in equal shares on suitable security? Trajan, put the interest low enough to find borrowers, but do not force anyone to borrow against his will. Such a course would be inconsistent with the temper of our century. Pliny, in the free and fettered city of Amissus, which, thanks to you, is governed by its own laws, a request has been handed to me concerning societies for mutual aid, Rani. I mention the circumstance that you may consider how far they may be tolerated and how far they must be forbidden. Trajan, allow them their societies, which the Treaty of Federation gives them, especially if, instead of spending their contributions on illicit assemblies, they employ them to assist their poorer members. In the other towns which are subject to our dominion, it should not be permitted. Pliny, most of my predecessors have accorded to the towns of Pontus and Bithynia a priority of claim upon the property of their debtors. It would be well if some permanent regulation were made on this matter. Trajan, let it be decided according to the special laws of each town. If they have not a privilege over other creditors, I ought not to grant it to them at the expense of private individuals. Pliny, the inhabitants of the colony of Apemia request me to examine their accounts, despite their ancient privilege of administering their own affairs. Ought I to comply? Trajan, yes, since they themselves desire it. Assure them that your inspection is by my desire, and will not prejudice their privileges. Pliny, Julius Piso received forty thousand denarii twenty years ago as a public gift from Amissus. The public prosecutor, Acticus, claims this sum in accordance with your edicts, which forbid such acts of liberality. Piso urges the length of time that has elapsed, and professes that repayment would ruin him. Trajan, if the gift dates back more than twenty years, let it not be revoked, for we must regard the security of the individual citizens while taking care of the public funds. Pliny, I enclose a memorial of the Nicaeans. Trajan, they pretend to have received from Augustus the privilege of collecting the inheritance of all their fellow citizens who die intestate. Examine this affair in the presence of the parties, along with the procurators Gamelinus and my freedman Epimachus, and decide what may appear to you just. Pliny, I have been examining the expenses of the Byzantines. They spent annually twelve thousand sesterces, ninety-six pounds, on the travelling expenses of a legatus bearing to you a formal honorary decree, and three thousand, twenty-four pounds, in sending an envoy to salute the governor of Mysia. Have I done right in cutting down both expenses? Trajan, it is enough for them to forward to me through your hands their decree of homage. As for the governor of Mysia, he will pardon them if they make their court to him cheaper. 3. The Decurians Pliny, in certain towns of the province, the Decurians supranumerum are obliged, on their admission to the Curia, to subscribe some thousand, about thirty-five pounds, others two thousand denarii. It pertains to you, sire, to make a general law. Trajan, no, it is safest to follow the custom of each town, especially regarding those who are made decurions against their wish. Pliny, the law of Pompeius observed in Bithynia requires the age of thirty years for exercising the function of the magistracy and entering the senate. But an edict of Augustus permits the inferior magistracies to be held at the age of twenty-two. I have concluded that those who become magistrates under this edict ought to have seats in the municipal senate, although under thirty years of age. But what about those who, being of the prescribed age for holding magistracies, have not obtained them? Trajan, close the senate house to them. 4. Right of citizenship. Pliny, to obtain the right of citizenship in a Bithynian town, it is necessary, by the law of Pompeius, not to be a citizen of any other Bithynian community. Many of the decurions in every community are in this position. Should they be excluded from the Senate House? Trajan, no, but see to it that in future the law of Pompeius be better observed. 5. Protection for the Towns Pliny, Byzantium has a legionary centurion sent by the legatus of Lower Mysia, according to your directions, to watch over its privileges. Julio Polus, on the frontier of Bithynia, requests of you the same favour. Trajan, 
Byzantium is a great city, where a large number of strangers land. Its magistrates require some military assistance. But if I give such help to Juliopolis, all the small towns will want the same thing. It devolves upon you to watch that no injury be done to the cities under your government. 6. Religious Matters Pliny May a temple of Sibylle at Nicomedia be removed to a more convenient site? Trajan, yes, the proceeding cannot violate a lex dedicationis, as provincial soil is not capable of receiving consecrations according to Roman law. Pliny, I have been asked for permission to transfer some dead bodies from their present tombs. At Rome a decision of the pontiffs is required. What shall I do here? Trajan, Grant or refuse according to the merits of the case. It would be too hard to require provincials to come and consult the pontus at Rome in this matter. Pliny. I have found a ruined house suitable for the bath to be built at Prusa. The proprietor built a temple to Claudius in the Prestilium, but nothing is left of it. Is there any objection? Trojan. Put the bath in this house, unless the temple was actually completed, for even though it may have disappeared, the soil remains sacred to him. Pliny, it is said that a woman and her sons were buried in the same place where your statue is set up. The statue is in a library, the burial place is in a large court surrounded by a colonnade. I pray you to enlighten me as to the decision of this affair. Trajan, you should not have hesitated about such a question, for you know very well that I do not propose to make my name respected by terror and judgments of maestas. Dismiss the accusation. 7. Military Discipline Pliny, should the prisoners be guarded by soldiers, or, according to custom, by public slaves? I have stationed some of both. Trajan, it is better to adhere to usage, and the soldier must not be called away from his flag. Pliny, two slaves have been found among the recruits. What shall be done with them? Trajan, if they have been enlisted, the fault lies with the recruiting officer. If they have been furnished as substitutes, you must punish those whose places they fill. If, knowing their condition, they have come and offered themselves, execute them. 8. Civil Discipline Pliny, in many towns, persons condemned to the mines or to fight as gladiators are serving as public slaves and receiving wages. What is to be done? Trajan, execute the sentences, except where the condemnation dates back more than ten years, and, in the latter case, cause the convicts to be employed in such menial offices as are nearly penal, such as cleaning the public baths and the sewers. Pliny, a man who was sentenced to perpetual banishment by Bassus, proconsul of Bithynia in 98 AD, has remained in the province, though he has not made use of the right given him by the Senate, after the rescinding of the acts of Bassus, to claim within two years a new trial. Trajan, he has disobeyed the law, Send him in chains to my Praetorian prefects for a more rigorous punishment. Pliny. Those assuming the toga virilis, celebrating a marriage, inaugurating some public work, or entering on a magistracy, are accustomed to invite the decurions and many of the plebs, sometimes more than thousand persons, and to give each one a denarius or two. I am afraid that the numbers at these gatherings are excessive, though you have yourself allowed invitations on special occasions. Trajan. You are right, but I have made choice of your wisdom for the express purpose of reforming all the abuses of the province. Pliny, a great fire has devastated Nicomedia. Would it not be well to establish a society of 150 firemen? Trajan, no. Corporations, whatever the name they bear, are sure to become political associations. Supply the apparatus of buckets, warn the proprietors, and, in case of need, employ the populace. Section 3. The Christians. The letter of Pliny and the reply of his master, which have excited most interest and led to most discussion, are those concerning the punishment of Christians. Until Domitian's reign, the Christians had been regarded as a Jewish sect, and had been treated as Jews. Since the death of Gaius, the Jews had never been forced to take part in the divine worship of the emperors, and the Christians shared in this immunity as the state did not recognize their distinction from the Jews. But the fall of Jerusalem brought about a change in the position of Christianity, by emancipating it from its home in Palestine and leading to its wider propagation among the Gentiles. This propagation led to the recognition of the distinction between Jews and Christians. 
it was observed that the proselytizing efforts of the Jews proper were attended with unimportant results, whereas the Christian sect increased rapidly. The Roman government was only ready to tolerate the opposition of the Jews to the state religion, so long as there was no danger of Jewish doctrines spreading among subjects of other races. The question, therefore, was whether they should suppress the Jewish religion altogether, including Christianity as a species of Judaism, or should deal with the Christians separately. The mission chose the latter alternative towards the close of his reign. A refusal to worship the emperor's image was regarded as an act of sacrilege, and such worship was required from Christians, though not from Jews. A Christian named Antipas suffered death at Pergamum for refusing to comply with this requisition. At Rome, Flavius Clemens was put to death, and Domitilla banished on a charge of sacrilege, and it seems probable that they were Christian converts. The year 95 in which these things happened may be regarded as the date at which Christianity came into conflict with the state religion and was forbidden. As the Christian faith compelled those who professed it to set at naught the established religion, Christians were regarded by the law as sacrilegious, and to be suspected of Christianity was equivalent to being suspected of sacrilege. An important consequence followed. It was one of the duties of every provincial governor to seek out and punish all sacrilegious persons, brigands, robbers, and others who infested his province. As the Christians came under the head of sacrilegi, the governor was not only able, but was required, to deal with them according to his own discretion, without receiving any special imperial instructions. It was part of nervous reaction against the policy of demission that accusations of this kind of sacrilege were not encouraged, but the principle was not changed. Christians were still punishable, and this was an acknowledged fact when Pliny was governor of Bithynia. The wide diffusion of the forbidden religion in this province became known to Pliny in 112 A.D., when he issued Trajan's rescript forbidding societies. Heterie. The enemies of the Christians took the opportunity of pointing out that they were in the habit of holding illicit assemblies. Pliny describes his investigation of the question in his letter to Trajan, of which the tenor is in brief as follows. I have never been present at the resolutions taken concerning the Christians, Therefore I know not for what causes or how far they may be objects of punishment, and I have hesitated considerably in considering whether the difference of age should make any difference in our procedures. Are those who retract their belief to be pardoned? Must they be punished for the profession alone, although otherwise innocent? I have pursued the following method. I have asked them whether they were Christians, and to those who avowed the profession, I have put the same question a second and a third time, and have enforced it by threats of punishment. When they have persevered, I have ordered them to be led to execution. For whatever their confession might be, their audacious behaviour and immovable obstinacy undoubtedly demanded punishment. I have reserved some who shared in the same kind of madness, but were Roman citizens, to be sent to Rome." An anonymous information was put into my hands, containing a list of many persons, who deny that they are or ever were Christians. For, repeating the form of invocation after me, they called upon the gods, and offered incense and made libations to your image, and they uttered imprecations against Christ, to which no true Christian, as they affirm, can be compelled by any punishment whatever. I thought it best, therefore, to dismiss them. Others of them, said at first that they were Christians, and then immediately afterwards denied it, and said that they had entirely renounced the error several years before. All these worshipped your image and the images of the gods, and they even vented imprecations against Christ. They affirmed that the sum total of their fault or their error consisted in assembling upon a certain stated day before it was light to sing alternately among themselves hymns to Christ as to a god binding themselves by oath not to steal, nor to rob, not to commit adultery, nor break their faith when plighted, nor to deny the deposits in their hands whenever compelled to restore them. These ceremonies performed, they usually departed, and came together again to take a repast, the meat of which was innocent, and eaten promiscuously. But they had desisted from this custom since my edict, wherein by your commands I had prohibited all associations, heteriae. 
From these circumstances I thought it more necessary to try to gain the truth, even by torture, from two women who were said to officiate at their worship, but I could discover only an obstinate kind of superstition, carried to great excess. And therefore, postponing any resolution of my own, I have waited the result of your judgment. To me an affair of this sort seems worthy of your consideration, principally from the multitude involved in the danger. For many persons of all degrees, of all ages, of both sexes, are already, and will be, constantly brought into danger by these accusations. Nor is this superstitious contagion confined only to the cities. It spreads itself through the villages and the country. It is clear from this letter that Pliny had no doubt in his mind that Christianity was forbidden and punishable. It is also clear that, although this was recognized in principle, yet in practice Roman governors did not attempt to discover Christians and did not concern themselves with the prohibited faith, unless it was specially brought under their notice. On the first occasion on which Christians were accused before Pliny, he dealt with them as with persons guilty of sacrilege on his own responsibility. But on the second occasion, when an anonymous letter reached him containing a long list, he investigated the question more fully and made two discoveries. One, that the number of Christians was very large, and two, that they seemed to be innocent of the crimes of incest and Thaistian banquets which were popularly ascribed to them. Consequently, he hesitated to deal with the superstition as summarily as he had dealt with it before, and referred the matter to the emperor. In reply, Trajan refused to adopt any general measure. The Christians, he wrote, need not be sought out. If they are brought into your presence and convicted, they must be punished. But anonymous informations ought not to have the least weight in any charge whatever. Thus Trajan upheld the principle that Christianity, being a form of sacrilegium, was punishable. But, on the other hand, he prescribed that Christians were only to be punished when they were accused and convicted. They were not, like robbers or sacrilegious persons of other kinds, to be sought after or hunted down. This was an inconsistent position. It was hardly logical to leave in peace the Christian whom no one happened to accuse, and condemn to death the Christian against whom an ill-wisher brought the charge of belonging to the forbidden sect. But the great significance of Trajan's rescript is that it affirmed clearly the attitude of the Roman government to Christianity, and laid down a principle which set Christians outside the pale of the law. This principle formed the basis of the religious policy of the emperors for the two following centuries. It is important to observe that the crime for which a Christian was punished, according to this rescript, was not that of belonging to an illegal association, a transgression which would have come under the head of Maestas. Nor was the Christian punished because he had hitherto abstained from taking part in the worship of the emperor or the gods. When a man was accused of Christianity, his judge required him to make a supplication to the emperor's image, and if he refused, punishment was inflicted for this refusal, which was accounted sacrilege. End of chapter 24, sections 2 and 3《ラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラブラ His death. Ever since Tiridates had received the Armenian diadem from the hands of Nero, peace had subsisted between Rome and Parthia. The relations between the Flavian emperors and the Arsacids had hardly been troubled by a single cloud, but under Trajan they became less friendly. King Pacorus did not decline to negotiate with Decebalus, the enemy of Rome. This negotiation, however, was not followed by any action on the part of Parthia. And did not lead to hostilities. But under Chosros, the brother and successor of Pacorus, the crucial question of Armenia came up once more. The Armenian throne having become vacant, Trajan bestowed it upon Axidares, a son of Pacorus, 
but Chosros deposed Axidares, and set up Parthamasiris, another son of Pacorus, on the ground that Axidares was incapable of governing. This action of Chosros was a direct violation of the treaty existing between the two states, and Trajan was not a man to pass this over. He declared war immediately, and left Rome for the east at the end of 113 AD. When he reached Athens, he was met by a Parthian embassy, sent to divert him from his purpose, for Chosros was not prepared for war. At this time Parthia was distracted by internal dissensions, and several rival kings were ruling in different parts of the realm. The ambassadors declared that Parthamosiris was prepared to acknowledge himself the client of Rome, and receive the diadem from Trajan, as Tiridates had received it from Nero. But the emperor refused to recognize one who had been set up in defiance of his authority. He dismissed the embassy, saying shortly that he looked for deeds and not for words. Another emperor would probably have been satisfied with the compromise, and Trajan, if he had intended to follow the eastern policy of his predecessors, would not have dismissed the Parthian envoys as he did. But he had come to the conclusion that the settlement of the Armenian question which had been come to in the reign of Nero was no settlement at all, and he determined to make the position of Armenia clear by converting it into a Roman province. This step, which previous emperors had declined to take, would remove once for all every pretext for Parthian interference in Armenia, and put an end to the unsatisfactory combination of nominal Roman sway and real Parthian influence. The resolve of Trajan was quite in accordance with his previous policy in the case of Dacia and Arabia. The conversion of client states into provinces is a feature of his reign but his purpose went even further than the annexation of Armenia. He decided to carry out an idea which had been in the air for more than a hundred years, and subdue the realm of Parthia, as he had subdued the realm of Decebalus. It was a project which Julius Caesar might have attempted if he had lived. It was an inspiration of Roman poets, from Horace, who dreams of Rome giving laws to the vanquished Medes, to Stadius, who, in addressing Domitian on his seventeenth consulate, reminds him that Bactra and Babylon still remain to be curbed by a new tribute. From Athens, Trajan proceeded to Antioch, and found that the Syrian army had degenerated in discipline and vigor owing to the long peace, so that his first task was to restore the efficiency of the troops. There were seven legions in the east available for the Parthian war, four in Syria, one in Judea, and two in Cappadocia, in addition to which Trajan summoned some Pannonian reinforcements, but it is uncertain how he apportioned his forces. Hostilities had already commenced, and the advantage was on the side of the Parthians, who had taken Samosata. Before Trajan took the field in spring 115 AD, he received a letter from the pretender Parthamasiris, of which he took no notice, because the writer styled himself king. The first event of the campaign was the recovery of Samosata. Thence Trajan marched to Satala in Little Armenia, intending to make that country the basis of his operations. At Satala, he was met by the kings of various Caucasian countries, who came to assure him of their devotion and obedience, such as the Iberians, Albanians, and Absilians. Among others, Anchialus, king of the Heniochi and Machalones, was distinguished with marks of favor by the emperor, to whom the attitude of these northern barbarians was a matter of importance for the success of his further operations. Here, too, another message was received from Parthamasiris, couched in far humbler terms than the previous one, and begging for an interview with M. Junius, the governor of Cappadocia. Trajan sent the son of Junius to treat with the pretender, and himself, returning on his steps, proceeded with the army in the direction of Artaxata, and halted at Elegia, near Erzororum, a locality well adapted for concentrating forces. Here Parthamasiris was permitted to wait upon the emperor, who took his seat on a suggestus in the presence of his troops. The Parthian prince, taking the diadem from his head, laid it at the feet of Trajan, in order that the ceremonial of investiture might be performed but the soldiers, misunderstanding his attitude, and thinking that he was renouncing Armenia, conceived that this country was won for Rome without a blow, 
and saluted Trajan as imperator. Frightened by the cries of the soldiers, Parthamasiris made as if he would flee, but he was surrounded and could not escape. He then begged for a private interview with the emperor, and was led into the imperial tent. But Trajan's mind was made up, and the Parthian's offer was rejected. After a few minutes they issued from the tent. Trajan resumed his seat on the Segestus, and commanded Parthamasiris to declare his demands clearly before the army, in order that the words which passed between them might never be falsely reported. The soldiers pressed round, but Parthamasiris, in this dangerous situation, did not lose his self-possession. He said simply that Armenia rightly belonged to him on condition of receiving the diadem from Trajan's hands, that he had come of his own accord for this purpose, and not as a defeated or captured enemy, and that he expected to suffer no injury. The emperor, in reply, shortly announced that Armenia belonged to Rome, and should henceforth be ruled by a Roman governor. Parthamasiris, with his Parthian retinue, was then permitted to depart under an escort of Roman horse, to prevent them from holding communications with any one until they were beyond the frontiers of Armenia. The Armenians who had accompanied him were sent back to their own homes. Soon after he had left the camp, Parthamasiris was slain by his escort. It is unknown whether this act was committed in cold blood by the orders of Trajan, or whether the Parthian prince made an attempt to escape from his conductors. Armenia submitted to its fate without a struggle, and became a Roman province. The Caucasian kingdoms now stood to Rome in the same relation in which Armenia stood before. Meanwhile, the Moorish captain, Lucius Quietus, who had distinguished himself in the Dacian War, had hastened eastward with a part of the army, crossed the Araxes, and occupied Atropatine, or Media. He surprised the strong and important fortress of Singara, whose possession was a great advantage for an invader of Parthia. As soon as Trajan had occupied Armenia, he marched into Mesopotamia, where he met with little resistance. Batane and Nisibis were taken without difficulty, and the fortress of Thabitha, between Nisibis and Singara, secured a line of communication between the main army and the detachment of Lucius Quietus. Abgar, king of Osroene, had long ago volunteered to desert his allegiance to Parthia, and became a Roman vassal. At Edessa, he publicly offered his submission to the conqueror, and other phylarchs and satraps followed his example. Civil war among the Parthians hindered them from taking any steps to oppose the conquest of the land between the Euphrates and Tigris. The king Chosores was overthrown by a pretender of Arab race, named Manasares, who now sent a message to Trajan, proposing to divide the spoils of the Arsacid. Trajan refused to entertain the proposal, or admit the envoys to a conference, and Manasares allied himself with another Arab king, Manus, and prepared to oppose the advance of the Romans. But Trajan did not intend to cross the Tigris until the following year, as the season was already far advanced. He organized Mesopotamia as a Roman province, and retired to Antioch for the winter. His stay there was marked by a terrible earthquake, December 13, 115 A.D., which cost many lives, and demolished a large part of the city, and Trajan himself narrowly escaped destruction. The winter was employed with the construction of a fleet on the Euphrates, which was to operate in the next campaign along with the army. Trajan, ennobled by the name of Parthicus, which the Senate had decreed to him, proceeded to Nisibis in spring, 116 A.D., and thence led his army to the upper Tigris, where it flows through the district of Corduin. The passage of the river was made on boats, which had been built in the woods of Nisibis, and transported thence on wagons. The army crossed with difficulty, for the Carduchians of the adjacent mountains lined the opposite shore, but at length, seeing that the numbers of the Romans rendered resistance hopeless, the barbarians retired. The whole country of the Adiabene was occupied by Trajan with little opposition, and was made into a third Roman province under the name of Assyria. Recrossing the Tigris, Trajan joined his fleet on the Euphrates, and reviewed his troops at Osagardana, near the Bitumen Springs which supplied the Babylonians with building cement. 
Babylon, nearly deserted by its inhabitants on account of the civil wars, fell an easy prey to the Romans, who then proceeded to attack Stesiphon, the Parthian capital. The two rivers were connected by the Nahar Malcha, or Royal Canal, which joined the Tigris at Stesiphon, and this canal was used by Trajan to transport his ships from the Euphrates to the Tigris. His plans for the siege of Stesiphon rendered it necessary to disembark his troops on the left bank of the Tigris at a distance from the city, and accordingly a new canal was dug connecting the Nahar Malcha with the river at a point above Stesiphon. The Romans soon captured the capital of the Arasids. Chosros himself escaped, but his daughter was captured, and the golden throne of the Parthian kings was taken and reserved for the triumph of Trajan. With this success, the soldiers regarded Parthia as conquered, or at least its conquest as assured, and Parthia capta was inscribed on coins. The emperor then descended the Tigris with fifty ships, as far as Cherax Spazinu near its mouth. This place was in the territory of Atembelos, king of Messene, who submitted to the Roman conqueror and became his tributary. Old as Trajan was, his imagination was excited by this proximity to the Indian Sea. At Cherax, seeing a vessel bound for the Indies, he expressed regret that he was not young enough to visit them himself. He was the first western conqueror since Alexander the Great, who had penetrated so far, and he may have dreamed of rivaling Alexander by still more extensive conquests. But he was speedily aroused from his dreams by the news that the lands which he had won so easily, Babylonia and Mesopotamia, had revolted. A legion under the general Maximus was cut to pieces by the insurgents. Nisibis, Seleucia, and Edessa slew or drove out the Roman garrisons, and shut their gates. This rebellion, in which the Jews played a prominent part, was suppressed, but not without difficulty. The important cities which had revolted were treated severely. In Babylonia, Seleucia was taken by Erusius Clarus and Julius Alexander, and burnt to the ground. The recovery of Mesopotamia, where the Jewish populations were the leaders of the revolt, was entrusted to the gallant Moor, Lucius Quietus. He besieged and reduced both Nisibius and Edessa, and the city of Abgar, who had doubtless fallen a victim to the rebels, was burnt down like Seleucia. This revolt forced Trajan to be content for the present with the three new provinces which he had added to the empire by his two campaigns, and to desist from further conquests, especially as the Parthians were rallying forces and preparing to make an attempt to wrest Armenia from its new lord. Trajan prevented their projects by a stroke of diplomacy. Although he had not penetrated further than the western borders of the great eastern realm, he regarded Parthia as a conquered country, and at Stesiphon bestowed a crown upon Parthamasbades, son of Chosros, who accepted it as a client of Rome. Thus a king was given to the Parthians, Rex Parthius Datus, as coins record, and thus Parthia itself came to hold nominally the same position towards Rome as formerly Armenia. The Roman army then returned to Syria. On the way, an attempt was made to take Hatra, a small but strongly fortified city in the Mesopotamian desert, on the way from Stesiphon to Singara. The nature of the country and the parching sun rendered a long siege impossible, and the inhabitants were brave. Though a breach was made in the walls, the soldiers could not enter. Trajan himself, approaching with a small body of horse, and conspicuous by his white hair and majestic form, was the mark for the arrows of the garrison, but he escaped injury, though a horseman at his side was slain. A thunderstorm compelled the Romans to retreat, and the sufferings that they endured from the heat, noxious insects, and want of water and pasture, saved Hatra from further assaults. The emperor returned to Antioch about April 117 A.D. The attempt of Mesopotamia to throw off the yoke of Rome was closely connected with another more widespread movement of rebellion in the eastern provinces of the empire. Fifty years had not fully elapsed since the great Jewish war which ended in the destruction of Jerusalem, and now the Jews made another desperate attempt to break free from the rule of their Roman masters. Their hope was to drive both Greeks and Romans out of those countries 
in which there was a considerable Jewish population. Cyprus, the Cyrenaica, Egypt, Mesopotamia, and Palestine, and form an independent Jewish state. They chose the moment when the emperor was in the Far East. Wherever the insurgents succeeded, they exterminated their enemies with relentless fury. In Cyprus, which had long been the refuge of Jews from Palestine and Syria, it is said that 240,000 were slain. When the revolt was afterwards put down, the Jews were forbidden thenceforth to set foot on the island. In Cyrenaica, a senatorial province, unprotected by a military garrison, the Jewish population outnumbered the natives, and under a chief named Andrew or Lucuus, who assumed the title of king, obtained rapid successes. Here 220,000 natives were slain with great barbarity. In Egypt, the prefect, Rutilius Lupus, unprepared for the emergency, was compelled to shut himself up in Alexandria. The Jews in the city, though numerous, were in a minority, and were massacred by the Greeks. Trajan sent Q. Marcius Turbo, with an army and fleet, to restore order in Egypt and Cyrene, and the rebels were soon crushed by the trained troops. The Jews of Egypt were almost exterminated. The suppression of the movement in Mesopotamia by Lucius Quietus has already been narrated. Not only the Jews took advantage of the absence of the emperor in the far east, but the enemies of Rome in other quarters also seized the opportunity to rebel or invade. The Danubian provinces were threatened by the Sarmatians. Africa was harried by the Moors. A revolt broke out in Britain. Thus Trajan's presence was earnestly demanded in the west, and the Senate urged his return. The Eastern War was regarded as finished, and preparations were made at Rome for a brilliant triumph. But, like Alexander whom he emulated, he was not destined to reach home. His journey was interrupted at Selinus in Cilicia, by an illness to which he succumbed. He died on August 8, 117 A.D. The triumph over the Parthians was celebrated in his name after his death, and was the only case in which a dead emperor obtained that honor. The consecrated conqueror, Divus Trajanus Parthicus, as he was designated, was represented by a statue in the triumphal car. His ashes, placed in a golden urn, were buried at the foot of his own pillar in his own forum, and he is the only one of the emperors whose remains were permitted to rest within the limits of the city. Trajan must have been well aware that his easily won successes in the east had been largely due to the internal divisions of Parthia, and that his conquests would be endangered as soon as unity should be restored. The institution of a dependent Parthian kingdom cannot have been more than a temporary device for the purpose of avoiding an immediate difficulty. Or at least, if Trajan intended it to be permanent, he must have known well that it would need more fighting and bloodshed to establish a lasting overlordship over Parthia. Alexander's conquests had been won at Issus and Arbella, but Trajan's had been almost bloodless. It is probable that Trajan intended to return to the east after his triumph and renew the war for the purpose of reducing the power of the Parthians and securing more firmly the frontiers of his new provinces. He had made the Tigris, instead of the Euphrates, the eastern boundary of the empire, and it was a boundary perhaps more easy to defend. It is rash and unjust to condemn this extension of the empire as a mistake into which Trajan was misled by mere ambition, for his conduct can be explained and defended on political grounds. Once he condemned the Armenian policy of his predecessors, and it certainly was not unassailable, and decided to annex Armenia, the annexation of Mesopotamia was a logical consequence. The province of Assyria was an advanced position beyond the Tigris, somewhat as the province of Dacia beyond the Danube. The new acquisitions should have been a great commercial advantage for Rome by bringing into her hands command of a whole line of traffic from Syria to the Persian Gulf. But owing to Trajan's inopportune death and the different policy of his successor, the empire was not permitted to test the consequences of an eastward extension of its borders. End of chapter 24, section 4
of J. B. Beery's The Student's Roman Empire, Part Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lini. The Student's Roman Empire, Part Two, by John Bunyel Beery, Chapter Twenty Five. Literature from the Death of Tiberius to Trajan, thirty seven to one hundred seventeen AD, Section One. Literature under Claudius and Nero. After the lull during the reign of Tiberius, literary activity was awakened again under his successors. But it has no longer the freshness of inspiration which characterized the epoch of Augustus. The golden age has passed, the silver age has begun. There is no doubt that the political events at Rome exercised an unfavorable influence on literature. The despotism of Tiberius in his later years, the wild career of Caligula, the vicissitudes under the rule of the wives and freedmen of Claudius, the follies of Nero, did not constitute a genial atmosphere for the development of successors to Virgil, Horace, and Livy. The contemporaries of Augustus had witnessed order arisen out of disorder, and the world set to rights. But to Romans under Claudius and Nero, the world seemed to have gone mad. The men who write are no longer proud of their age or confident of the future. They regard the government with distrust, knowing not what a day may bring forth. They look upon the Caesar's palace as a scene of intrigues, guile, and violence. There is nothing in public life to inspire them. Literature retreats into itself. Most of the works produced during this period are either of a reflective character, or concerned with scientific subjects, or mere imitations of older literature. In both poetry and history, the great Augustan writers are regarded as the models to be followed, and earlier authors are looked down upon as vastly inferior. All kinds of composition are marked by rhetoric, the result being that the prose is poetical and the poetry prosaic. It has been already mentioned that Claudius and Nero were themselves authors, Claudius an historian, Nero a poet. Claudius was incited in his youth to historical studies by Livy himself. None of his compositions remain, with the exception of part of the speech which he delivered in the Senate in 48 AD for the admission of the Gallic nobility to the Roman magistracies. The memoirs of the Empress Agrippina were an important source for the secret history of the court of Claudius, but they have also been lost, as well as other contemporary records of their own experiences by prominent men of the day. Thus Domitius Carbolo wrote an account of his exploits in the Armenian Wars. Suetonius Paulinus, whose name we chiefly associate with Britain, described his deeds in Mauritania, and Lucius Antistius Vitus wrote a work on his experiences as commander in Germany in 58 AD. All these works, whatever their literary value, would have had great historical interest if they had been preserved. The only historian of this age whose work has reached us is Quintus Curtius Rufus, of whose life we know nothing. He wrote a history of Alexander the Great in ten books, of which the two first are lost. He derived his information from Greek writers, but displayed no critical faculty in using his sources. His style is modeled on that of Livy, but is unconsciously influenced by the mannerisms of his own age. He strives ever antithetic sentences and poetical expressions. He hardly appreciates the political greatness of Alexander, but regards his eastern expedition as a brilliant adventure. He has an eye for the more telling episodes, and hurries rapidly over all that is less striking, though perhaps more important. Seneca is the most characteristic and interesting literary figure of this age. All the great Augustan writers were Roman or Italian, but Seneca was a Spaniard of Cordoba. We have already met his father, the rhetorician, a man of some literary note. The provinces are now beginning to play a prominent part in Roman literature, or rather, Spain is setting the example to the other subject lands. Two other conspicuous authors at this time were of Spanish origin, Seneca's nephew, Lucan, and Columella of Gades. 
The writings of Seneca reflect in many ways the spirit of the age. He wrote on a variety of subjects, but his most important works are philosophical and contemplative. His philosophy was popular in style as well as in matter. He desired the applause of his contemporaries, literary vanity was a feature of the time, and did not write with a view to the judgment of posterity. His style was suitable to the taste of his age. He had a wide range of knowledge, a nice faculty of psychological observation, and was by no means pedantic, but his philosophy was neither original nor deep. He is always ready to sacrifice the thought to a verbal antithesis. He wrote too much, and was not sufficiently diligent in philosophy. He is often tediously diffuse, and the same sentiment meets the reader again and again, disguised in a new dress. An excellent Roman critic censures his style as vitiated by agreeable faults, such as captivate boys. It is possible that ambition was his chief motive in writing. He may have aimed at obtaining political influence by winning literary reputation. But it would be unjust to deny him a genuine interest in philosophy, especially in its practical aspect, although from a higher point of view, philosophy can only regard him, like Cicero, as a dabbler. Most of his philosophical works, composed at various times, are collected in twelve books under the title of Dialogues. They treat of the following subjects. 1. If there is a providence, why do good men meet with troubles? 5. Leisure. Both of these treatises were written after his retirement from public life. 3. Anger, in three books. 4. The Happy Life. 6. Tranquility of Mind. 7. Brevity of Life. 2. The wise man receives neither injury nor insult. Also, three works of consolation. 8. To a lady on the death of her son. 9. To Polybius the freedman on the loss of a brother. And 10. To his mother Helvia on his own banishment. Beyond these dialogues, there are extant the treatise On Clemency, written after Nero's accession, and seven books De Beneficis. Seneca also wrote a work in seven or eight books on questions of natural history, Naturales Questiones, which he dedicated to his young friend Lucilius, procurator of Sicily. We possess further a collection of letters addressed to the same Lucilius, and written with the intention of publication. They do not possess in any degree the interest which belongs to the letters of Cicero and Pliny. Seneca's satire on Claudius has been noticed already in another connection. Seneca wrote verse as well as prose. Nine tragedies have been preserved, all dealing with subjects of Greek mythology and founded on Greek originals. They are Hercules Furens, Troades or Hecuba, Phoenicae or Thebais, Medea, Phaedra or Hippolytus, Oedipus, Agamemnon, Thyestes, and Hercules Oitaeus. In the case of most of these plays, we possess the Greek originals and can judge of the deplorable taste of the Neronian age by the manner in which Seneca has spoiled the works of the great masters, omitting all the finer touches and smothering the action with declamation. The purpose of the characters in Seneca is to declaim. The action and the plot are of subordinate importance. It has been a disputed question whether these tragedies were meant for representation on the stage, and although they are in every way unsuitable for acting, it is nevertheless not impossible that in that age they may have been acted with applause. But it is probable that Seneca, in composing them, had the recitation of separate scenes before select audiences chiefly in view. The versification of these plays is very strict, and conforms to the rules of the Augustan poets. Besides the iambic trimeters and anapests, sapphic, glyconic, and asclepiad measures are also introduced, with little regard, however, to harmony of meter and subject. More interesting, historically, is the Fabula Praetexta, or tragedy with Roman characters, entitled Octavia, which used to be attributed to Seneca, and is always included among his works. The subject of this drama is the tragic fate of Nero's wife. 
and Seneca himself is one of the characters. He cannot, however, have been the author, as there is an allusion to the fall of Nero. It seems probable that the work was composed under the Flavian emperors, before the end of the first century, but even this cannot be regarded as certain. Seneca's contemporary and countryman, Lucius Junius Modratus Columella of Gades, devoted himself to the subject of agriculture and tried to revive an interest in it, somewhat as Virgil had done nearly a century before. His uncle, a learned man, was an extensive farmer in Betica, and so he had an opportunity of studying his subject practically. He wrote two prose treatises on agriculture, De Re Rustica, the second much more elaborate than the first. Of the first we possess one book, on trees, but the second, in twelve books, has been preserved entire. One of these books, the tenth, is composed in excellent examiner verses. The author made this variation because horticulture, the subject of this book, had been omitted by Virgil. He intended it as a sort of supplement to the Georgics, the precepts, as he says, of the sidereal bard. Here may be mentioned other books on special subjects, such as the treatise on medicaments by Scribonius Largus, and the work De Chorographia in three books by the geographer Pomponius Mella of Tingentera in Spain. Quintus Esconius Pedianus composed his commentary on the speeches of Cicero about 55 AD. This highly important work has been preserved in fragmentary form. The language is pure, the comments acute. He also wrote a work against the detractors of Virgil, but it has not survived. Grammatical investigation was represented by Marcus Valerius Probus of Beritus, who made eminent Latin writers the subject of criticism and explanations, in the same way that the Alexandrian scholars treated classical Greek authors. He issued annotated editions of Virgil, Horace, and Lucretius, and he wrote and lectured on Old Latin. He enjoyed a high reputation with later workers in the same subject, as an illustrious grammarian and an acute critic. The most important writers on jurisprudence were Proculus, who gave his name to the Proculian school, and Cassius Longinus, who was banished by Nero to Sardinia and recalled by Vespasian. It is possible that some of Seneca's tragedies were composed in the reign of Claudius, but the only poetical work which we can set down as probably belonging to his age is a panegyric in examiners on the consul Piso by an unknown youthful author supposed by some to be Calpurnius. The poem is full of reminiscences of the Augustan poets with whom the author was well acquainted. The versification is strict and elegant. There are only two allusions in the whole poem. Of Nero's effusions, only a few odd lines have been preserved, but they seem to have been read and well known long after his death. The two most important poets of his reign were Perseus and Lucan, who resembled each other in their stoic doctrines, their somewhat precocious talents, and in their early deaths. Perseus Flaccus was born in 34 AD at Volatere in Etruria, and died at the age of 28, in 62 AD. He studied at Rome under the Stoic philosopher Aeneas Cornutus, for whom he entertained an affectionate regard, to which he has given expression in his writings. Having read Lucilius, he was stimulated to write poetical satires, and he was also much under the literary influence of Horace. His six satires have come down to us, but only one of them, the first, is a satire in our sense of the word. In it, he ridicules the poets of the day and the prevailing public taste. But the others are merely tirades or sermons on stoic texts, embroidered with some burlesque dramatic scenes. The persons introduced are generally borrowed, from Lucilius or Horace, and the verses are full of phrases, beginnings and ends of lines, taken directly or in a modified form from these poets, especially from Horace. But in both style and spirit, the satires of Perseus are vastly different from those of his master. The Augustan poet was a genial Epicurean who laughed good-humouredly at the follies of mankind. The Neronian verse-writer was a stoic preacher who aspired to amend the world. The youthful Perseus takes upon himself to instruct mankind, the more mature Horace is content to amuse. It is to be remarked 
that Perseus does not deal at all with contemporary politics. He does not regret the republic or condemn the empire. In point of style, it is unfortunate that Perseus did not profit more by his study of Horace. He could not manage the examiner with ease. His thoughts were poor, and he labored to express them with the utmost possible obscurity. His intentions were pure, but he had no originality and no poetical gift, and he tried to cover this defect by mannerism and affectation. A friend of Perseus, Cesius Bassus, may be mentioned as the chief representative of lyric poetry in Nero's reign. We do not possess any of his poetical works, but remains of his treatise on metric have been preserved. Epic poetry was very popular. Virgil was the model, and national subjects were in vogue. Nero entertained the project of writing an epos on the history of Rome. The Pharsalia of Lucan, 39 to 65 AD, whom we have already met as one of the sufferers in connection with the conspiracy of Piso, is a poem on the civil wars in ten books left unfinished at the author's death. Lucan was brought up in a cultivated family. His grandfather was Seneca the Rhetor, his uncle Seneca the philosopher. In his early years he was a great friend of Nero, who, afterwards, however, became jealous of his literary reputation and forbade him to compose poetry. The Pharsalia was begun before the breach with the emperor, for the introductory verses contain a glowing panegyric on him. Lucan's epic must be considered a remarkable feat in its way, when it is remembered that the author died at the age of twenty-six, but it has not a spark of genius. The practice, which was then in fashion, of reciting literary works before private audiences had a specially unfortunate effect on epic poetry. A poet, thinking of these recitations, was tempted to sacrifice the unity of the whole to the effectiveness of special scenes, which might be read aloud to applauding hearers. And for the same reason, poetry became rhetorical. The reciter wanted stuff to declaim. The Pharsalia is versified oratory, not poetry. Lucan is to be imitated, says Quintilian, hitting as usual the nail on the head, by orators rather than by poets. The choice of subject was very natural to a stoic, breathing the atmosphere of Thracia and Helvidius, and reared up with a deep veneration for the Senate, but from a literary point of view it was unfortunate. Pompey is the hero, but the miserable part which he played in the civil wars make the poem ridiculous. Cato is a sort of second hero, though perhaps, as has been cleverly said, the true hero is neither Pompey nor Cato, but the Senate. The cause of Caesar is denounced as crime. His victory is regarded not only as the death blow to freedom, but as the destruction of Rome's greatness. The work is full of stoical doctrine, pretentious phrases, sounding commonplaces, tedious speeches. The language is often difficult on account of its affectations, and the introduction of out-of-the-way geographical and mythological learning renders some parts of the work repulsive. But there are episodes which show considerable power of imagination, and there are many well-turned phrases, such as the epigram on Cato. Victrix causa deis placuit sed victa catoni. And the famous words on Pompeius Magnus, stat magni nomini sumbra. If Virgil's epic inspired Lucan, and his Georgics Columella, his bucolics found an imitator in Colpernius Siculus. It is uncertain whether Siculus designates the actual home of the poet, or was assumed on account of the Sicilian associations of Theocritus. He was a poor man, and begged some patron, whom he calls Melibius, perhaps Seneca or Calpurnius Piso, to bring his productions under the emperor's notice. Seven eclogues are preserved. They are metrically exact, like the rest of the poetry of the age, but devoid of all originality, being copied from Virgil and the Greek pastoral writers. Nero, spoken of in court style as a god, is described as inaugurating a new period of freedom and clemency, and the seventh echo contains an account of magnificent games which he exhibited. The didactic poem entitled Etna illustrates the tendency of the age to put the most unpromising subjects into verse. 
it discusses the scientific causes of volcanic phenomena and combats the popular views diffused by the poets the authorship is uncertain but the most probable view ascribes the poem to lucilius the friend of seneca the same to whom the philosopher addressed his epistles lucilius was for a considerable time procurator in sicily and had an opportunity of studying the mountain the poem contains echoes of lucretius but the author has none of lucretius power in investing a dry subject with poetic attraction he rises higher when he is contrasting the pleasure of observing nature with the pettiness of human life the poem ends with the story of two brothers who rescue their old parents in an eruption of the volcano it is probable that to this age also belongs the homerus latinus a short latin version of the story of the iliad in some parts almost a translation of homer this was intended for use in schools and has no merit except its scrupulously exact meter perhaps the most interesting work of nero's age was the satirical work of petronius arbiter in twenty books it may be considered almost certain that this petronius was the same as the aesthetic voluptuary whose death by nero's orders in sixty six a d has been described in a foregoing chapter his work entitled satirae or satiricon recounted all sorts of imaginary adventures in which he satirized the manners and weaknesses of his age unluckily only fragments of the book remain of which the largest is the banquet of trimalchio describing a feast given by a wealthy uneducated upstart in a greek town of campania probably cumae the person who tells the tale is a freedman named encolpius who recounts his travelling experiences in company with Asiltus, another freedman, and Giton, a slave, in the last years of Claudius or the early years of Nero. The work is wonderfully clever and artistic, full of wit, humor, and delicate irony, displaying wide knowledge of the world and great dramatic power in making the persons introduced speak in character. The motive which united the various parts of the composition was probably the anger of the god Priapus, who may have played a part meant to travesty that of Poseidon in the Odyssey. The work is quite devoid of any moral tendency. The author shows a fine appreciation of Greek art, and satirizes pointedly the literary taste of the day. One of the characters is a vain poet named Eumolpus, who recites two poems of considerable length, the Troiae Halosis, or Capture of Troy, in iambic trimeters, and the Bellum Quile, in hexameters. But the prose narrative sometimes passes into verse and all sorts of meters in the style of the Menippean satire. The former is clearly allusive to the poem of Nero on the same subject, and the Bellum Quile might be a parody of the Pharsalia. End of chapter 25, section 1. Chapter 25, Section 2 of J. B. Beery's The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linny. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2 by John Bunyel Beery. Chapter 25. Literature from the Death of Tiberius to Trajan, Section 2. Literature under the Flavian Emperors All the Flavian emperors patronized literature, although none of them was so devoted to it as either Claudius or Nero. Vespasian was not unskilled, even in Greek eloquence, and he wrote memoirs. We hear of Titus writing a poem on the appearance of a comet, and the mission was devoted to poetry in his youth. But Vespasian also actively encouraged literary talent. He was the first who endowed Latin and Greek rhetoricians with a yearly allowance, a hundred thousand sesterces, from the fisc. He gave rich rewards to distinguished poets, and encouraged art in the same way. The mission promoted poetical activity by the Capitoline and Alban contests. The effect of Domitian's despotism on literature may be easily exaggerated. His rule, though absolute, 
was not despotic until the later years of his reign, and it was only a small class of people who had anything to fear from his suspicion or jealousy. There is no question that men were not free to criticize the government or write republican tirades, which were really an attack on the imperial system, but there were many other subjects for poets or prose writers to choose if they wished. The writing of contemporary history is the only branch of literature which must necessarily suffer under such a rule as that of Domitian. Gaius Plinius Secundus, A.D. 23-79, to of Comum in Cisalpine Gaul, generally called the Elder Pliny to distinguish him from his nephew, was perhaps the most learned man of his time. His death, in the great eruption of Vesuvius, has already been mentioned. He had filled the office of procurator in various provinces, and had found time, amid his official activities, to pursue studies of the most varied and comprehensive character, and to write a great number of books. Besides lesser works, he wrote a history in twenty books, of all the wars that Rome ever waged with the Germans, a work entitled Studiosi, being a sort of introduction to rhetoric with examples, a grammatical treatise dealing with doubtful forms in declension and conjugation, a contemporary history in thirty-one books, probably reaching from the fall of Gaius to the year 71 AD, and a natural history. Pliny's nephew gives us an interesting account of the manner in which his uncle disposed of his time, so as to be able to get through an amount of literary work which another man, with all his time to himself, could hardly accomplish. Before dawn he used to attend on the Emperor Vespasian, in his capacity of Procurator Caesaris, and then proceed to the execution of his official business, which was thus finished early. On returning home, he devoted the rest of his time to study. After food, he read a book, making notes and extracts, for he read nothing without making extracts from it. In the bath, he either dictated or listened to something read out. In traveling, he always had at his side a secretary with book and notebook, whose hands in winter were protected by gloves. He deemed all time lost, that was not spent on study. As he wrote so much, Pliny could attend little to the form or style of his writing, and his works are memorable rather for the quantity of matter which he put together than for the quality of the composition or the discretion of his criticism. The only one of his works which has been preserved is his Naturalis Historia, dedicated to the Emperor Titus in 77 AD. It consisted, according to the design of the author, of thirty-six books, to which was prefixed a list of the contents and an account of the sources which he used. This prefatory matter was afterwards issued, probably by his nephew, as the first book, so that the work in its present form consists of thirty-seven books. It gives an encyclopedic account of the results of natural science, and deals with physics, geography, zoology, anthropology, botany, and mineralogy. Pliny was conscious of the dryness of his work, which sometimes becomes a mere enumeration of details, and he endeavored to enliven it by introducing occasional descriptions in the rhetoric style, which was then in fashion. He introduces the different subjects of which he treats by general remarks, often in a moralizing tone, and very concisely expressed. Like Seneca and Columella, he frequently deplores the degeneracy of the age. In religion, he is hostile to the popular creed, but is not a follower of any particular philosophical system. His view of the universe is pantheistic. He inclines to the belief that the sun is the spirit and mind of the world, the chief ruler and deity of nature. The most eminent historians under Vespasian were Marcus Clavius Rufus, an orator of consular rank, and Vipstanus Messala, also an orator and a friend of Tacitus in his youth. The work of Rufus embraced the reign of Nero and the events of the year of the four emperors. He took an unfavorable view of Seneca, whereas another historical writer of the time, 
Fabius Rusticus, praised Seneca's political career. Messala, who had taken part as a military tribune in the events of 69 A.D., wrote memoirs of his own experiences. Under Domitian, Vibius Maximus wrote a universal history. None of these works have survived. Of orators, M. Upper was one of the most distinguished. Of jurists, the Sabinian, Cilius Sabinus, a man of great influence under Vespasian, and the Proculian, Pegasus, reported to have been an incorruptible interpreter of the laws. More eminent than Upper and the other pleaders of the day was the teacher and scientific student of rhetoric, Marcus Fabius Quintilianus, who increases the goodly role of Spaniards distinguished in literature. Born at Caligaris about 35 AD, he came to Rome in the train of Galba, soon gained a reputation for his eloquence, and became the glory of the Roman toga. Like his countryman Seneca, he was entrusted with the education of the imperial princes, the grandnephews of the mission. He was the first to hold the professorial chair of rhetoric at Rome, founded by Vespasian. He was very successful as a teacher and acquired wealth. His great work, entitled Institutio Oratoria, The Training of an Orator, consists of twelve books intended to be a complete guide to a man's education for a public career from childhood. He has a high ideal of the duties and rights of an orator. His treatise is not so superficial as those of Cicero on the same subject, but it is more popular than the technical handbooks on rhetoric. He has a sober, independent judgment and remarkable insight in literary criticism. He is not blinded by great reputations or misled by the current ideas of his age. On the contrary, he is remarkable for his depreciation of Seneca's style and for his opposition to contemporary prejudices, especially in his admiration of Cicero, whom it was the fashion to underrate as an orator, but whom he regards as a model. In his critical estimates, he is more inclined to be too lenient than too severe. Quintilian recognized clearly and condemned judicially the faults of taste, the mannerisms, the affectations, the marks of decadence which characterize the literature of his own age. The inspiration of nature, the natural expression of a simple feeling, was regarded as a baseness, a defect of art. Nothing was considered worth reading, or, at least, worthy of admiration, that was not far-fetched or that did not glitter with figures and phrases. Almost all our speech is metaphor. The antique, the remote, the unexpected were the fashion of the day. Quintilian frequently uses the word lasciwia, wantonness, to describe the nature of the modern style of writing. But, in spite of the protests of Quintilian and some others like him, the modern style was victorious. Men would not go back to the simple uncombed antiquity, even when, after the first impulse of reaction, they came to admire its excellences. We have already met Sextus Julius Frontinus as conqueror of the Ciliars in Britain, and afterwards as assisting the mission in establishing strategic posts beyond the Rhine. He was clearly an able man, Tacitus even describes him as a great man who would have approved himself great if he had not been hindered by the jealousy of Domitian. Here he has to be spoken of as a writer on technical subjects. Two of his treatises have been preserved, and fragments of a third. The Strategemata consists of three books illustrating the artifices of strategy by examples chiefly taken from Roman history. Some later writer added a fourth book to the genuine work of Frontinus. The De Aquis Urbis Romae, composed in 97 AD, in which year he held the post of Curator Aquarum, and published after Nerva's death, furnishes us with a most valuable account of the aqueducts of Rome, their construction and administration. Frontinus also wrote a book on field measurement, Gromatica, of which only some extracts are extant. He died about the year 103 AD. Whenever he was not holding a public office, 
he lived a retired life on the Campanian coast. His modesty seems to have been equal to his merits. He forbade a monument to be erected to his memory. The expense, he said, is unnecessary. Our memory will endure if we have deserved it by our life. Another technical writer of the mission's time deserves mention, the grammarian Emilius Asper, best known for his commentary on Virgil, which seems to have been a valuable work, but unfortunately only extracts remain. Epic poetry was diligently cultivated in the Flavian age, and we possess no less than four heroic poems, three of considerable length. Gaius Valerius Flaccus began his Argonautica, in the reign of Vespasian, whom he invokes in the opening verses. The composition of the work went on during the following reign, until the poet died before the year 90 AD, leaving his poem unfinished in eight books. The death of Medea's brother, Absyrtus, and the return of the Argonauts to Greece were still to be told, and it seems probable that Valerius intended the whole work to consist of twelve books, on the model of the Aeneid. Valerius made the Argonautica of the Alexandrine poet Apollonius of Rhodes the basis of his composition, but took care not to borrow the tedious erudition of the Greek. He aims more than his model at sentimental and pathetic effects, and takes pains with the psychological development of his characters. He formed his style closely on that of Virgil, whom he imitates and echoes on every page, somewhat as Perseus imitated Horace and, like Perseus, he is often difficult and obscure by reason of his artificiality. In versification he is as strict as Ovid. Another epic writer under Vespasian was Salaeus Bassus, but none of his works are preserved. It is related that Vespasian bestowed upon him a liberal present in recognition of his poetry, and Tacitus calls him a most perfect poet. In the same reign, Cariacius Maternus wrote tragedies on Roman subjects, and a Greek play on Thyestes. Titus Cassius Silius Italicus, 25 to 101 AD, chose, after the example of Lucan, an episode of Roman history as subject of an epic poem. He chose the Second Punic War, and his work entitled Punica, in seventeen books, has come down to us. Silius went through the usual stages of an official career, which was respectable, but not distinguished. He held the consulship in the year of Nero's death, and was afterwards proconsul of Asia. As a senator, he was respected, but had no political influence. On the other hand, he made no enemies. After his proconsulship, he retired from public life, and devoted himself to the service of the muses. Now, says his friend Marshall, Helican is his forum. Proque suo celebrat nunc helicona foro. Silius suffered from an incurable tumor, and it finally became so irksome to him that he determined to put an end to his life, and starved himself to death in his villa at Naples. Silius wrote his punica in the reign of Domitian, whom he addresses in the usual tone of courtly flattery. Thou, he cries, O Germanicus, will transcend the deeds of thy kinsmen, Vespasian and Titus. And he celebrates the emperor as a greater bar than Orpheus. The poem was judged by a contemporary writer to display greater diligence than talent, a judgment which might be extended to most of the writers of the age. To a modern reader, the work is irredeemably dull. It abounds in imitations from Virgil, in incident as well as in language, and is not marked by the least originality of any kind. Silius was an enthusiastic admirer of the poet of the Aeneid, used to celebrate his birthday with religious solemnity, especially when he was at Naples, and used to visit the tomb of Virgil as if it were a temple. He has by no means the same skill as his contemporary Valerius Flaccus in introducing Virgilian echoes. The Punica ends with Scipio's triumph after the Battle of Zama, and, like the Aeneid, is national in sentiment. But while Virgil's national sentiment is a genuine inspiration, 
that of Silius is a cold and correct reflection of the Virgilian spirit. Hannibal plays the part of Turnus. Like Turnus, too, Hannibal fights with a phantom, and Juno plays the same anti-Roman part in the poem of Silius that she had played in the poem of Virgil. The usual epic paraphernalia are duly worked in, the catalogue, the nechia, the games, the description of a shield, the dream god, the battle on a river's bank. A tendency to stoicism can be distinctly traced in the poem, but, unlike Lucan, Silius never touches upon politics. He neither reflects on the present nor regrets the past. To him the warriors of the old republic are no longer the men of the forum and the capital, such as he sees before his own eyes. They have passed into the twilight of myths and demigods. To him, Scipio is a second Hercules, the achiever of labors, the tamer of monsters, the umpire of the divinities of pleasure and virtue. Hannibal is an ogre or giant of romance, who seems to vanish at the catastrophe of the story in a tempest of flame and cloud. This contrast with Lucan is an instructive indication of the change in spirit which took place at Rome even in Stoic circles during the last forty years of the first century. In the technical construction of his verses, Silius is excessively strict, like all his contemporaries. Publius Papinius Stasius of Naples, 45 to 96 AD, also composed epic poems in the reign of Domitian. He had inherited a taste for poetry from his father, who had celebrated in verse the burning of the Capitol in 69 AD, and was about to compose a work on the eruption of Vesuvius when he died. The younger Stasius won the olive wreath at the Alban contest in poetry, instituted by that emperor three times, but he was defeated in the Capitoline competition. His circumstances were comfortable, and he possessed a country place at Alba, which was perhaps a gift of the emperor. He enjoyed the patronage of a nobleman named Metius Seller. At the beginning of Domitian's reign, he composed a mime, entitled Agawi. He promised, and perhaps began to write an epic, celebrating the German expedition of the emperor, but, if begun, it was never finished. Three works of Stasius have been preserved, of which the longest and most ambitious is the Thebaid, which occupied him for twelve years. The subject of the poem is the war between Eteocles and Polynices, the sons of Oedipus, and it is treated very unequally. The first ten books are devoted to the preparations and are lengthened out with digressions and prolix speeches, while all the important events to which these preparations lead up, including the combat of the brothers and the story of Antigone, are compressed in the last two books. Books 5 and 6 are occupied with the episode of Hypsipyl and Archimerus. This want of artistic proportion is to some extent compensated for by careful finish in the detail, but there is little psychological skill in portraying the characters and little poetical imagination. Like Valerius and Silius, he regards Virgil as the epic mode. It is probable that he drew his material from the Thebaid, from the Greek poet Antimachus. Of another epic poem, dealing with the life of Achilles, only a small part was written, and this has come down to us. The first book of the Achillade tells how Thetis hid her son among the daughters of Lycomedes at Cyrus, how the distinguished hero made love to Deidamia and was discovered by Ulysses. Of the second book, only a short fragment remains. The style is less crabbed than in the Thebaid. The Silwai is a collection of occasional poems arranged in five books, and is the most interesting of the works of Stasius. Each poem was composed separately, and a number, from five to nine, afterwards collected in a book, which was published with a prose preface. The greater number of these pieces are in hexameter meter, but some are in hendecasyllabic, alcaic, and sapphic meters. They were almost all written in the last six years of Domitian's reign. The first book is dedicated to the poet Stella, and one of the poems included in it is an epithalamium on the occasion of the marriage between Stella and Violentilla. Deaths and births, the handsome villas, 
the rich baths or the beautiful statues belonging to wealthy friends, form the subjects of other pieces. There is a lament composed on the death of the poet's father, in an eclogue, really a sort of familiar epistle, to his wife Claudia. One poem celebrates the birthday of the poet Lucan, whom he extols with enthusiasm, and the circumstance that he praises Cato and speaks sympathetically of the spirit of Lucan's poem shows that the mission censorship of the press cannot have been as severe as it is sometimes made out to be. Sachs, however, regarded Lucan entirely from a literary point of view. He was a court poet, and was ready to purchase the favor of Domitian by adulation, both of the emperor himself and of his favorites. In celebrating the occasion of Domitian's seventeenth consulship, he adopted a tone of hyperbolic flattery. He composed a special poem to thank the emperor for an invitation to dine at the imperial table. He wrote lines on the locks of the boy Irinus, a favorite of Domitian. In the poems of Sacius, we observe a tendency to epigrammatic writing and an anxious care in the coinage of phrases. Skill in epigram is indeed the characteristic of the age, and Marshall is the characteristic poet. The verses of Marshall, it has been said, are the quintessence of the Flavian poetry. Marcus Valerius Martialis, about 40 to 102 A.D., was born at Bilbilis in Spain, and thus makes the fourth Spaniard of the first century who holds a very distinguished place in literature. He lived for thirty-four years in Rome, and returned to his native country at the end of his life, 98 A.D. He was poor, and seems to have had no fixed employment. He possessed a small house in Rome, and a small country place at Nomenton, in the Sabine territory. Both Titus and Domitian conferred upon him, in recognition of his poems, the privileges which the law gave to those who were the fathers of three children, ius trium liberorum. And he was made a military tribune, which gave him the standing of a knight. His flattery to Domitian is even more extravagant than that of Stasius. He was a more needy and more eager bidder for court favor. Among his patrons were Irianus, Crispinus, and Parthenius. As an example of his glorification of the emperor, may be quoted the verses in which he cries, Under what leader was martial Rome fairer and greater? Under what princeps did we enjoy such great liberty? Marshall can be convicted of being a time-server out of his own mouth, for, after the death of Domitian, he confesses that the reign of terror is over. It is conceivable, however, that here too he spoke less from conviction than from a desire to be agreeable to the new government. His epigrams were collected in fourteen books, of which each contains about a hundred epigrams. Most of the books are introduced by a preface, either in prose, like the Silvae of Stasius, or in verse. The thirteenth and fourteenth books, entitled respectively Xenia and Apoporeta, consist altogether of distichs on presents suitable for the Saturnalian festival, epigrams in the original sense of the word. The other books contain epigrams in the later sense of the word, short and often with a fine point. Besides these, there is an unnumbered book, known as the Liber Spectaculorum, consisting of poems which refer to the public spectacles at Rome. In the art of epigram, Marshall regarded Catullus and Domitius Marsus as his models. A large number of his verses turn on filthy subjects, but he is careful to tell us that, if his page is wanton, his life is honest. Lasciva est nobis pagina, vita proba est. He was, however, a man of no character. He prostituted his muse to the taste of the punlis. But he was a writer of the greatest talent, and his best verses are very good, indeed. His works give a most valuable picture of the Roman life of his time, especially, perhaps, its shady sides, and we meet many notable literary persons in his pages, such as the younger Pliny, Silius, and Stella. It is remarkable that he does not mention either Stasius or Tacitus. In his stinging epigrams, he always used fictitious names, such as Ponticus, Tuca, Tongilianus, 
He mentions living persons by their true names only when he praises or says something indifferent. Arantius Stella of Patavium, the friend of Stasius and Marshall, composed love poems which were inspired by Violentilla, who afterwards became his wife. He celebrated her under the fictitious name of Asterius, but in the pages of Marshall she appears as Ionthus, a Greek rendering of her true name. The death of her pet dove is the subject of one of Marshall's epigrams. Another writer of erotic poems was Sulpicia, the wife of Calenus. Her verses were remarkable for their wantonness. Turnus, a distinguished satiric poet, also deserves mention. Many other verse writers in various styles, whose works have perished, are mentioned by Marshall, Stasius, and Pliny, but they are now nothing more than names. End of chapter 25, section 2. Chapter 25, section 3 of J. B. Beery's The Student's Roman Empire, part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ligny. The Student's Roman Empire, part 2, by John Bunyell Beery. Chapter 25, Literature from the Death of Tiberius to Trajan. Section 3. Literature under Trajan. After the death of Domitian, there was, according to contemporary writers, a revival of literature. This revival has probably been exaggerated, but it is certain that history, at least, and oratory regained their freedom. Nerva would doubtless have been a patron of men of letters, but his reign was too short to affect literature. Trajan was not a man of culture, and did little directly to further learning, but he was certainly not against it. He showed special favor to the Greek rhetorician Dion Chrysostom, and he wrote himself memories of the Dacian War. His answers to Pliny's letters are brief and to the point. The private recitations of literary compositions, which had been a marked feature in the reign of Domitian, are now less conspicuous. This may be partly due to the greater liberty which orators enjoyed under Trajan. Decimus Junius Juvenalis was born at Aquinum, probably about 55 A.D. He busied himself in his youth with rhetorical studies and served in the army. In the year 81 A.D., he served under Agricola in Britain as the tribune or prefect of a Dalmatian cohort. He lived far into the reign of Hadrian, by whom he seems to have been banished to Egypt in the year 135 A.D., at the age of 80. But the question of the banishment is very difficult. There is some evidence for supposing that the populace declaimed certain offensive verses of Juvenal in the theatre in the emperor's presence, and that Hadrian, unable to punish the people, punished the innocent poet. Juvenal's sixteen satires were published in five books at different times, like the Silvae of Statius. The exact date at which they appeared are not certain. He states that indignation at crime and folly drove him to write satire. Si natura negat facit indignatio versum. And he paints in vivid and dark colors, often with revolting realism, the social vices of his age. The persons whom he introduces have either fictitious names or belong to the past, especially to the reigns of Nero and Domitian. His verses are forcible and pointed, and the standard of morality which he sets up has been so much admired in modern times that some churchmen have thought that he must have owed something to the inspiration of Christianity. But his morality was really the stock virtue of the rhetorical schools, well and eloquently expressed. We cannot take too seriously the declamatory invectives and biting epigrams which he launches against his contemporaries. He was not concerned to give a true picture of his times. He wrote his satires at once to make an effect and gratify his spleen. Their value for us lies in the accessory parts of the pictures. They enable us to realize more vividly than we could otherwise do life and manners at Rome under Domitian, Trajan, and Hadrian. 
the first satire gives a general description of the follies and vices of the day and forms a general introduction to the satires the poet defines his subject as the whole of human life men's passions pleasures and business quid quidagunt homines votum timor ira voluptas gaudia discursus nostri farago libelli est it may be dangerous to attack the living but he may at all events show up the sins of the dead whose ashes are interred on the flaminian and latin ways Experiar quid concedatur in illos quorum flaminia tegi turcinis atque latina the second deals with gross vices practiced by hypocritical philosophers and hidden under a cloak of austerity the third with the dangers and vexations of life in rome the fourth contains the travesty of domitian's concilium of which a brief account has been given in a previous chapter the fifth describes the wretched life of a parasite and the rebuffs and scorn which he endures for the sake of a poor dinner the sixth which is the most powerful of all paints in heightened colors the fashions follies and vices of contemporary women the seventh portrays the struggles and poverty of men of letters the eighth holds up to ridicule pride in long pedigrees it were better to be the son of thersites and able to wield the arms of achilles than to have achilles for sire and be a thersites oneself malo pater tibi si tersites dumodo tu sis aiaque dai similis vulcaniaque arma capesas quam te tersitai similem producat achilles the ninth treats of vices common in the time of juvenal the theme of the tenth is the vanity of human wishes it is shown that what seems to be best is often worst and that men know not what is really best for them they are often ruined if the gods take them at their word evertere domos totas optantibus ipsis di facilis nocitura toga nocitura petuntur militia the eleventh in the form of an invitation to a friend to a simple dinner holds up to ridicule the prevalent luxury at table the twelfth celebrates the safe return of a friend from a voyage and describes the perils of the ocean it also satirizes fortune hunters captatores who pay court to the rich and childless the thirteenth a consolation to a certain calvinus who had been cheated of ten sestertia eighty pounds is full of stoic doctrines epigrammatically expressed Calvinus is admonished that such crimes are the order of the day. Perjury is general, and it would be absurd to raise an outcry for such a trifle. Besides, only small minds desire revenge. It is a feminine weakness. Qui minuti semper et infirimi est animi exiguique voluptas ultio. Continuo si colige quod vindicta, nemo magis gaudet quam femina. Calvinus is bidden to leave his false friend to his own devices, for he is not likely to stop at the first crime, and will probably sooner or later come to a bad end. The fourteenth enlarges on the theme that children learn vice, and especially avarice, from the example of their parents. The fifteenth describes a quarrel between Ombi, cum Ombu, and Tentera, Dendera, in Upper Egypt, at a religious feast held by the Ombites and interrupted by the Tentrites. The latter were put to flight, and one of them was caught and devoured by the Ombites. The sixteenth sketches the advantages of a soldier's life. The seventh satire is interesting and important for literary history, and deserves special notice in this place. The bulk of it seems to have been written under Trajan, but the introduction to have been added in the reign of Hadrian, under whose auspices poetry and other studies are described as reviving. It spes et ratio studiorum in caesare tantum. Hitherto, men of letters have been forced, in order to support life, to engage in the meanest pursuits. The poets have had no Messinas to patronize them. The most a rich man who pretends to have a taste for poetry will do is to lend a dusty and inconvenient room for the poet to give a recitation and send his freedmen to applaud the best poets like stasius had to write verses to order for the stage in order to get a living the historians are worse off than the poets their task is more laborious and they get less 
who will give an historian as much as one would give to the actuarius who reads aloud the daily chronicle quis dabit historico quantum daret acta legenti the rhetoricians were miserably paid too the profession of a music master was far more lucrative rich quintilian was quite an exception the fact that so little encouragement was given to poetry by trajan may have been partly the cause why there was no distinguished poets in his reign with the exception of juvenal himself there were a few of less note and known to us only by name caninius who set himself to the task of an epic on the dacian war of trajan and pacenus paulus who wrote elegies figuratively in the house of propertius may be mentioned the most striking literary figure of trajan's principate and one of the greatest historians of the world was cornelius tacitus in a history of the early empire he and his works claim special attention because his writings so far as they have been preserved to us are our chief authority we have to thank him for most of the details which we know about the reigns of tiberius claudius and nero and about the civil wars which followed nero's death if his works had been entirely preserved he would have been our main guide from the death of augustus to the death of domitian it is because large portions of his writings have been lost that we are so ill informed about the history of caligula and that of the flavian emperors of the life of tacitus we know little he was born about fifty four a d and in his early years studied jurisprudence and rhetoric he went through the ordinary senatorial career beginning as a military tribune under vespasian becoming quaestor under titus aedile or tribune and then praetor in eighty eight a d under domitian while praetor he was also one of the quindecimviri to whom the care of the sibylline books was entrusted we have already seen that he married a daughter of agricola after the return of agricola to rome tacitus probably in the year ninety obtained a post in the provinces either as legatus of a legion in lower germany or as governor of belgica and was absent from rome for four years during which his father-in-law died under nerva in ninety eight a d he was promoted to the consulship of the rest of his life we only know that he was occupied with his great historical works it seems possible that his death took place in the first years of hadrian the works of tacitus which have come down to us wholly or partially are five in number one his earliest work a consequence of his rhetorical studies was the dialogus de oratoribus which perhaps appeared soon after eighty a d the dialogue is supposed to have taken place in the sixth year of aspasian seventy five a d and the speakers are the most celebrated rhetoricians and men of letters of that time including curiatus maternus vipstanus messala upper and julius secundus the object of the work is to trace and explain the decline of oratory under the empire the causes which he assigns are both political and social and in the earliest work the republican sympathies and anti-imperial bias of the author can be seen plainly it also exhibits the same psychological acuteness and the same skill in saying sharp things which are distinguishing marks of his historical works in point of style he is under the influence of cicero two the next composition of tacitus the life and character of julius agricola his father-in-law has been already noticed in connection with agricola's work in britain it was written at the beginning of trajan's reign the influence of sallust is conspicuous and the very form of the work as a historical monograph resembles the catiline and jugurtha the same influence is also evident in three the germania which appeared in the same year and of which some account has already been given it was a result of the researches which the author had been making for some years back with a view to a large historical work but which he now published in a separate form a propos of the work of trajan on the rhine in describing the manners and institutions of german communities tacitus cannot resist pointing comparisons between the simplicity of the barbarians and the corruption of roman civilization he remarks for example 
that good manners are of more avail there than good laws elsewhere, and that there no man laughs at vices. But it is absurd to suppose, as some have done, that the book was written merely as a hit at Rome. 4. The Historiae, consisting of about twelve or fourteen books, was written under Trajan, and embraced the period from the elevation of Galba to the death of Domitian. Unluckily, only the first four books and part of the fifth have come down. These are taken up with the events of 69 and 70 A.D. Owing to the loss of the later books, our knowledge of the reign of the Flavian emperors is very fragmentary, and this loss is especially to be regretted, as the author was a contemporary of the events about which he wrote. The Annals, entitled From the Death of the Divine Augustus, was likewise written under Trajan, and was published between 115 and 117 A.D. It embraced the period between Augustus and Galba, 14 to 68 A.D., and, as the material is arranged chronologically, all the various events of each year being, with few exceptions, grouped together, the work is designated by the author himself as Annales. The first six books, which contain the reign of Tiberius, are extant, with the exception of the greater part of Book V. The next books, 7 to 10, and a portion of 11, which comprise the reign of Gaius and the first year of Claudius, are lost. Books 12 to 15 and a part of 16, bringing us down to the year 66 A.D., are preserved. But the end is lost, and it is not certain of how many books the work originally consisted. Tacitus had made further plans for historical work, but they were not carried out. He intended, if he had lived, to lead up to his annals by a work on the Principate of Augustus, and also, at the other extremity, to continue his histories by a work on the Principates of Minerva and Trajan. If these designs had been executed, he would have covered the whole imperial period down to the death of Trajan. The political sympathies of Tacitus penetrate his whole work, and while they give it much of its literary flavor, they also diminish its historical value. He was an aristocrat in his views, sympathized with the Senate of the Republic, and disliked the imperial constitution. Although his common sense obliged him to confess that the empire was a necessity, it was a necessity against which his heart revolted in which the events which he saw with his own eyes in the last years of Domitian render it still more odious to him. It was a calamity, he thought, due to the anger of the gods against the Roman state. His historical works are written to arraign the empire, and he sees everything in the worst light, even if he does not intend to misrepresent. We have already seen how he sets up Germanicus as a foil to Tiberius, and Corbulo as a foil to Nero. The aggressions of the emperors on the functions of the Senate are crimes in his eyes, and he regards the Roman world as in a state of servitude. Yet, on the other hand, he despised the vain talk about liberty by which such men as Helvidius Priscus courted martyrdom, and he laid down the principle that, seeing monarchy to be a necessity, we should pray for good emperors and put up with whatever kind we get. Connected with his prejudice in favor of the Senate is his prejudice in favor of Rome and Italy. He tolerates the provinces, but takes no interest in them, and has not the slightest conception that their needs justify the empire. In estimating the work of an emperor, the character of his provincial administration would have small weight with Tacitus, who thinks far more of a disturbance in Rome than of distant events affecting a whole country. With these narrow and old-fashioned views, he was unable to see the true significance of the empire on which he pondered so much, and on which he has made many acute observations. His lack of interest in provincial matters affects his history in another way which is much more irritating. It makes him indifferent to geographical details, and thus it is often hopeless to follow on the map his vague descriptions of warfare in Britain, Germany, Armenia, or Thrace. Like Livy, he cared little for historical research, and was far more concerned with the form than with the matter of his work. 
the military parts of his history are generally judged to be untrustworthy. Yet, in spite of these faults, Tacitus is always regarded as one of the greatest historians. This is mainly due to his excellence as an artist in style. He wrote for effect, and he was ready to sacrifice facts to art. His picture of Tiberius is a great literary achievement, but at the expense of historical truth. His work abounds in telling epigrams and in acute and cynical observations which show great psychological insight. Many of his phrases have become familiar quotations, such as Omne ignotum promirifico, maior ex longinquo reverentia. His style is concise, but always dignified and cold, never passionate or declamatory. His points of contact with his contemporaries should be observed. In bitterness, in his view of the degeneracy of society, in writing for effect, he resembles juvenile, while in his taste for pointed epigram he shows that he belongs to the same age as the court poet Marshall. Pliny the Younger belonged originally to the family of the Sicilii, which was settled at Comum, Como, in Transpadan, Italy. His father was Lucius Sicilius Silo, and his own name before adoption was probably Plinius Sicilius Secundus. He was eighteen years old at the time of the eruption of Vesuvius, 79 A.D., so that he must have been born about 61 A.D. During his boyhood there was no school at Comum, but he was taught well and wrote a Greek tragedy at the age of fourteen. On his father's death he was placed under the guardianship of Virginius Rufus and was presently sent to Rome to finish his education, where he attended the lectures of Quintilian in rhetoric. But it was the young man's uncle on the mother's side, Gaius Plinius Secundus, whom we have already met, who exercised most influence on his studies and his future career. He and his mother were staying with his uncle at Misenum when the fatal eruption of Vesuvius took place, which caused his uncle's death. The young Sicilius was adopted by his uncle's will into the Plinian family, and henceforward his name was Gaius Plinius Sicilius Secundus. A year later, Pliny pleaded his first cause before the court of the Centumviri in the Basilica Julia. Soon after this, he was appointed one of the Decemviris Litibus Judicandis, who, by a regulation of Augustus, presided over the Centumviral court, under the general control of a praetor. He next became a military tribune of the Legion III, Gallica, which was stationed in Syria, 82-83 A.D. On returning to Rome, he was appointed a sewir of the Roman Knights, and held this office until he became quaestor, probably in 83 A.D. His next step was the tribunate of the plebs, 10th of December 91 A.D., and he was promoted to be praetor in 93 A.D., the emperor having dispensed him from the interval fixed by the Lex Annalis. In this rapid advancement in the senatorial career, Pliny was supported by his former guardian, Virginius Rufus. About this time, he successfully aided in the prosecution of a proconsul of Bedica, but this action seems to have injured him in the favor of Domitian. The death of the tyrant was a relief to him. He had been already appointed prefect of the Aerarium Militare. Nerva promoted him to be prefect of the Aerarium Saturni likewise. These duties so much engrossed his time that he renounced pleading in the courts, and it was with much difficulty that he was persuaded, in 100 A.D., to plead the cause of the provincials of Africa against the extortionate proconsul Marius Priscus. The accusers were successful. Marius was condemned. In the same year, Pliny was advanced by Trajan to the consulship, which he held in September and October. It devolved upon him to thank the emperor on the first day of this office, and he did so in a panegyric which has been preserved, and which, though not interesting from a literary point of view, is of great historical value, as it gives an account of the acts of Trajan in the first years of his reign. In the following year, Pliny was again induced to act as the advocate of provincials against an oppressive governor. He undertook the cause of Bedica against Classicus. Some time after this, he received the honor of an augurship. 
he had given up his treasury appointment and returned to his occupation as a pleader. He was also appointed curator aue tiberis et riparum et cloacarum urbis. Two important cases occurred in 104 and 106 A.D. in connection with Bithynia and were successfully conducted by Pliny. This led to his appointment, in 111 A.D. probably, as a special legatus in that province, as we have already seen. The date of his death is unknown, but was probably before 115 A.D. He was married three times, but had no children. Trajan granted him, however, the use trium liberorum. The career of Pliny is interesting, as it illustrates how citizens belonging to an Italian or provincial municipium rose to the highest offices in the state. His letters are interesting as illustrating the life, opinions, and feelings of an enlightened and generous Roman gentleman. But he was neither a great writer nor a great statesman. He could discharge meritoriously the ordinary duties of a senator. He was an ardent reader, a careful and pleasant writer, but had no ideas. He was rich and liberal. We find him giving pecuniary help to Quintilian and Marshall. He remedied the want of a school at Comum by paying one-third of the salary of a teacher. He also gave his native town a public library at the cost of a million sesterces, eight thousand pounds, and granted half a million more for the maintenance of poor children. His letters prove that he was a warm friend, a loving husband, a kind master to his slaves, and that he always honestly wished to do the right thing. The letters of Pliny consist of 1. Nine books of letters, dating from 97 to 109 A.D., and 2. The correspondence with Trajan, chiefly from the Bithynian period, of which specimens were given in the preceding chapter. They concern all sorts of subjects, and show the character of the author and his relations with his friends in the most favorable light. He is very vain, but then he is very candid. The letters were written with a view to publication, and therefore they have not the freshness and directness of the letters of Cicero, who was Pliny's model, as he tells us himself. He owns that his great desire is to be remembered by posterity. There is consequently a great deal of self-consciousness in the epistles. Tacitus and Pliny were intimate friends. In one of his letters, Pliny tells a story how at the Circensian Games, Tacitus sat next an unknown person, who entered into learned conversation with him, and after some time asked, Are you an Italian or a provincial? You know me, said Tacitus, from your reading. Are you Tacitus or Pliny? asked the stranger. Besides the panegyric of Pliny, which is a specimen of the style of rhetoric then in fashion, we have a fragment of a dialogue on the theme, Was Virgil an orator or a poet? Virgilius Orator an Poeta, by P. Anius Flores. An African by birth, he had competed under Domitian at the Capitoline Agon, and, unfairly, according to himself, had not been crowned. Leaving Rome, he traveled about and finally settled as a man of letters at Turaco, where he lived under Trajan. At a later time, he returned to Rome and interchanged light verses with the Emperor Hadrian for he was also a verse writer, and some small fragments of verse under the name of Flores have come down. The work of Hyginus on the jurisprudence of field measurement, of which fragment have come down to us, the treatise of Siculus Flaccus, De Conditionibus Agrorum, the works on orthography of Capper and Villius Longus, which belong to this period, can only be mentioned. End of chapter 25, section 3. Chapter 25, Section 4 of J. B. Bury's The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lenny. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2 by John Baniel Bury. Chapter 25 Literature from the Death of Tiberius to Trajan. Section 4. Greek Literature 
The growing importance of the Jews in the Hellenic world is illustrated by the circumstances that two of the most important Greek writers of the first century A.D., whose work have come down to us, belonged to the Hebrew race. These were the historian Josephus and the philosopher Philo. We have already met Flavius Josephus in the tale of the Jewish rebellion under Nero and Vespasian. Born about 37 A.D., he belonged to a distinguished sacerdotal family, and on the mother's side to the royal house of the Maccabees. In religion he inclined to the sect of the Pharisees. He first visited Rome in 63 A.D. to defend some of his countrymen, and succeeded in his object through the influence of Popea. The part which he played in the last struggle of the Jews for independence has been already told. Received into favor by Vespasian, he lived henceforward at Rome and wrote his historical works there. His purpose in writing was to make the Greeks acquainted with the history and character of his own people. The best known and most interesting of his writings is the story of the Jewish war in seven books, which has all the value of a contemporary witness who had taken part in it himself and been present at the most striking scenes, and a witness who, although a Jew, was able to see the Roman as well as the Jewish side of the question. He wrote this work in Hebrew, and then got it translated into Greek. His Jewish archaeology in twenty books, reaching from the creation to Nero, is a much larger work. The later books are very valuable for the history of the first Roman emperors, and in Book 18 occurs the earliest notice in literature of the founder of Christianity. Josephus also wrote his own autobiography, Life of Flavius Josephus, and two books against Appian, an Alexandrian grammarian who, on occasion of the Jewish embassy to Caligula, had attacked the Jews, and a treatise on the sovereignty of reason. Like Josephus, Philo of Alexandria also appears in political as well as in literary history. We met him as one of that embassy of Alexandrian Jews which waited on the Emperor Gaius in 39 AD, and of which he wrote an account. As a philosopher, he was one of the earliest who attempted to combine Greek and Jewish ideas into a philosophical system. On the one hand, he makes Moses speak with the lips of Socrates, on the other, he derives the views of Plato, Heraclitus, and other Greek philosophers from Mosaic sources. He interprets the Old Testament allegorically, but his chief inspiration is drawn from Plato. In his treatment of Plato, in whose writings he finds more than Plato ever dreamed of, he is a precursor of the Neoplatonists. Plutarch was born at Chironea, about 46 A.D., and educated at the University of Athens. Under Vespasian, he visited Rome as an envoy from his native place, and seems to have won some influence at the imperial court. Trajan granted him consular rank, and directed the governor of Achaea to avail himself of his counsels. But the favor which he enjoyed at Rome did not induce him to quit his home, where he lived a happy domestic life, and died at an advanced age. His attachment to Boeotia was a feature of his character. Hesiod and Pindar, as the two great Boeotian poets, had always a special charm for him. He seems to have occupied himself with informal teaching and lecturing, as well as with writing his historical and philosophical works. His historical work consists of the Parallel Lives, a series of forty-six biographies of great Greek and Roman statesmen, grouped in pairs. In every case, except in that of the Gracchi, a Greek is compared with a Roman. This way of setting Greek and Roman history side by side was natural enough in a Greek under the empire, recognizing the greatness of his conquerors, as well as that of his own nation. The example of such parallels had been set by Cornelius Nepus. In some cases, such as Demosthenes and Cicero, Alexander and Caesar, the comparisons are obvious. In others, such as Pyrrhus and Marius, less striking. In most cases, Plutarch appends to the pair of lives a formal statement of the points of likeness and contrast. 
Besides these parallel lives, there are four single biographies of Artaxerxes, Aratus, Galba, and Otho. In compiling this historical gallery, Plutarch thought far less of finding out and relating what actually occurred than of edifying his readers and promoting virtue. He has no idea of historical criticism. He is much more at home in ethical disquisition. He loved anecdotes which point a moral. The consequence is that perhaps no ancient history has been more popular down to the present day than his lives. His other works consist of numerous essays and treatises on various subjects, chiefly ethical, and generally grouped together under the title of Moralia. Among them may be mentioned the Platonic Questions, controversial pamphlets against the Stoics and the Epicureans, and against superstition, an attempt to explain the myth of Isis and Osiris, a large number of sermons on moral subjects, such as Virtue is Teachable, Fortune, Cheerfulness, a physical treatise on the face in the moon, a discussion of the question, should an old man take part in public life? Literary questions are considered in The Malice of Herodotus and A Comparison of Aristophanes and Menander. His dialogue on music is very important for the history of ancient music and meter. Perhaps the most attractive of all Plutarch's works is the Symposiaca, in nine books, containing discussions on all sorts of subjects in the form of table talk. The scene constantly changes. The symposia are sometimes at Athens, sometimes at Rome, sometimes at the author's house. As examples of the questions discussed may be mentioned the number of the muses, the grafting of trees, the most suitable form of entertainment at table, the abstinence of Jews from pork. Another Greek essayist, contemporary with Plutarch, was Dion of Prusa in Bithynia, surnamed Chrysostomus, gold-mouthed, from his eloquence. He had come to Rome under Vespasian, but fell under suspicion with the mission, and, banished from Italy, retired to the north shore of the Black Sea. Of the old-fashioned life at Olbia on the Borysthenes, of the enthusiasm for Homer, which prevailed in that remote Greek colony, and of the dangers which constantly threatened Greek civilization in those regions from the Scythians, he has given an interesting account in his Borysthenic Discourse. Under Nerva he was recalled to Rome, and when he afterwards returned to his native town Prusa, he obtained some privileges for it by his influence with Trajan. Although Dion is counted among the sophists, and went about as a rhetorician, it must be said to his honor that he was by no means a typical specimen. He did not, like the ordinary sophist, sacrifice thought to expression. He was a deeper thinker, inclined to stoicism, than most of his class, and he sometimes makes a hit at the vapid sophistic style. Of his discourses or essays, seventy-nine are extant, and many of them are most interesting. In the Alexandrina, he invades against the extravagant luxury of life in Alexandria. In the Olympica, he places in the mouth of Phidias a description and explanation of that sculpture's great statue of Zeus at Olympia. In his four discourses on monarchy, he sketches, for the benefit of Trajan, the rule of an ideal sovereign. One of the most pleasing essays is the Euboica, in which an idyllic description is given of the life of two rustic families in a desolate part of Obia, and a counter-picture is drawn of life in the town. Dion aimed at writing pure Attic. His chief models were Plato and Xenophon. End of chapter 25, section 4「Chapter 26, Section 1 and 2 of J. B. Bury's The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Caron. The Student's Roman Empire, Part 2. By John Bagnell Bury. Chapter 26. 
The Principate of Hadrian, Section 1 and 2. Section 1. The Accession of Hadrian and the Character of His Reign. Notwithstanding his advanced age, Trajan had gone forth on his great eastern expedition, without having taken the precaution of settling the succession to the Principate by adopting a son. He had indeed made it clear enough by various marks of favor that he designed P. Milus Hydronius, his relative, to be his successor, perhaps confident that he had still many years to live. He wished to postpone as long as possible the act of adoption. I did not care for the notion of delegating to another any portion of the supreme power, or perhaps he may have thought that even without the usual measure of adoption, the succession of Hadrian was sufficiently assured, and may have been willing to leave the Senate to elect as princeps, without any apparent constraint, one who is not the son of an Augustus or a Caesar. There is certainly little reason to suppose that he had not himself decided on his successor, and that he looked forward to testing the merits of possible candidates. In the Parthian expedition, he had already shown such favor to Hadrian that to have preferred another would have inevitably led to civil war, and Trajan could not have failed to foresee the result. In any case, he found himself in the presence of death before he had formally declared Miss Will on this important question. Plotina, who was a warm supporter of Hadrian's interests, seemed to have induced the dying emperor to sign at the last moment a letter of adoption or at least a signify his consent was a fiction contrived by plotina whether genuine or not the letter reached hadrian at antioch on august ninth two days before the news of trahan's death arrived and there can be little doubt that it represented trahan's real wishes the family c f hadrian belonged originally to hadria a municipality of Pisnum, but had settled in the Roman colony of Italioa. His father, Hadrianus Afrer, was a first cousin of Trajan. He entered early Euxum, the usual official career, and after the Vigintivirate, became a legendary tribune. Under Trajan, he was promoted to be quaestor, 101 A.D., and tribune of the people, 105 A.D., while he impressed plotina showed marked favor to him and through her influence permitted to contract a marriage with julia sabina the granddaughter of marciana trahan's sister as trahan had no children this alliance was naturally to be significant in the second dacian war hadrian commanded a legion and in recognition of his services the emperor presented him with a diamond ring which he had himself received from nerva he became praetor in due course of time, and in 108 A.D. was elected as a suffect consul. About the same time he was appointed to Legatus of Lower Pannonia. After the death of Licinus Sura, his influence with Trajan doubtless increased. He took part in the eastern expedition, and in 117 A.D. was appointed to Legatus of Syria with an extraordinary military command during the emperor's absence and in the same year was a second time consul. On receiving the news of Trajan's death, Hadrian was proclaimed imperator by the soldiers, having secured their allegiance by promising them a donative of double the usual amount. He then wrote a modest letter to the Senate, asking, as the adopted son of Trajan, for their recognition and excusing the unconstitutional action of the soldiers, and acknowledging him as emperor before he had been elected by the senate although there were many members of the senate adverse to hadrian no opposition was organized against his claim his respectful letter produced a favorable impression and the various powers which belonged to the princeps were duly conferred on him hadrian had received as a boy an education in greek letters perhaps at athens and he showed such a decided leaning to greek life and thought that he was jestingly called the Greekling. But his interest in things, not Roman, went further than Greece. He was attracted by the antiquities, the mysteries, and the romance of the East, and studied Oriental philosophies. 
and religions with curiosity. He was, in fact, a cosmopolitan, and liked to place himself in touch with all the various races and creeds and institutions which had been gathered together in the complex of the Roman Empire. He was eminently susceptible of new ideas, and must have been impatient of the narrow prejudices of the aristocracy of home. It may be readily imagined that such a man could not win the sympathy of the Senate, and though the nobles had to cloak their feelings during his lifetime, their antipathy expressed itself after his death in detraction and calumny. The note of his character was a certain restless curiosity. He desired to see all that was to be seen, to know all that was to be known, to do all that was to be done. He visited all the provinces of the empire, and in each province he was as much a sightseer as an administrator. He wrote poetry, attempted painting, acquainted himself with all the systems of philosophy. It accorded with his character that he had an extravagant passion for the excitement of the chase. The personality of this searcher out of all curiosities is indicated in his countenance, as we see it, in his numerous busts. The head is bent a little, as if to catch every sound. The eyes and mouth suggest the quickness and liveliness of an intellect determined that nothing shall escape it. The type of face is neither Roman nor yet Greek. In the gallery of imperial busts, his is the first marked by a beard. Whether he wore it, as some said, to disguise a scar, or whether it was characteristic of the Greekling, it may be regarded as an outward sign of a new type of emperor. Hadrian had his faults, and Forbiles qualities, although he took wide views as a statesman and a thinker. He was not above petty ambitions, although he was eminently tolerant. He was not superior to feeling jealousy at the merits of men who followed as their special calling pursuits in which he engaged as a diligente. He was suspicious and distrustful of those who surrounded him, and naturally was not able to awaken their confidence or engage their affection. The rhetorican Fronto says that he regarded Hadrian rather as a god to be propitiated than as a man to be loved. Hadrian was a statesman of great ability, but by no means of transcendent genius. Indeed, at this time, there was little scope for a man of genius. What makes him so remarkable, aid his reign so unique, is the circumstance that he embodied and represented in his own person the tendency of the period and revealed and developed those tendencies in his policy. It rarely happens that the most typical man of an age is selected by destiny to be a sovereign. It happened in the case of Hadrian, and his reign derives much of its peculiar interest from this coincidence. He was not a military monarch, and here, conspicuously, he was in touch with this age. The Roman world wanted peace and rest. Men did not yearn for conquest, and the military policy of Trahan however plausible it may have seemed from a theoretical point of view, however necessary it may have been up to a certain point, was not in harmony with the spirit of his time. In this respect, Hadrian marked his position clearly at the outset. The first important act of his reign was the surrender of the three new eastern provinces, which Trahan had annexed, Armenia, Mesopotamia, and Assyria. The new emperor thus declared that he regarded Trahan's oriental expedition as a huge mistake, that he definitely abandoned the project of extending the empire eastward, and that he recurred to the policy of Augustus. He may be questioned whether it might not have been wiser to retain Armenia. While abandoning Mesopotamia and Assyria, dislike of Trahan's war policy as a whole may have carried Hadrian too far in his reaction. It is even said that have he contemplated the surrender of Dacia, but if so, he was wise enough to abandon the idea. Dacia, in which a large number of Roman colonists had taken up their abode, was in quite a different position from the annexations beyond the Euphrates, where no Roman settlements had yet been made. Of resigning Arabia, Trahan's other new province, there was no question this first act of Hadrian struck the keynote of his reign, and inaugurated that remarkable period of nearly half a century, 
in which the Roman world enjoyed a measure of peace and happiness, which it had never enjoyed before, and was never to enjoy again. The thought was beginning to force itself on people, more or less consciously, that men were not made for the state, but that the state was made for men. And Hadrian's policy expressed and realized this thought. Trahans had been tempted to make the extension of the empire and military glory ends in themselves. Hadrian regarded the defense of the frontiers and the maintenance of the army merely as means to the prosperity of his subjects. He fully recognized the necessity of maintaining a strong military force and of being prepared to fight in case of need, and he devoted himself to the reform of the military service, closely connected with this view of the state, and at the same time characteristic of his cosmopolitan temper was Hadrian's interest in the provinces. The importance of the welfare of the provinces had been recognized by Julius Caesar, and had been always a political principle under the empire, but Hadrian sympathized with the provincials more thoroughly than any of his predecessors, and really felt that the provinces were not made merely to serve home in Italy. Lie was himself less at home in Rome than in any part of his empire, and hardly a third part of his reign of twenty-one years was spent on Italian soil. He saw that personal acquaintance on the part of the ruler with the affairs of each province was requisite for a sound administration, and his journeys through the provinces are a unique and striking feature of his reign. His other great work was the creation of a civil service. He must not fail to note that in the period of peace and prosperity, which was inaugurated by Hadrian and continued by his two next successors, a great social and spiritual change of deep significance for the future of the empire and also for the future of the world was being accomplished. The process was reliant and almost escapes our observation, but the results are clear. The principle of humanity, as opposed to Roman exclusiveness, was becoming widely recognized and a spirit of cosmopolitanism was taking possession of the world. The way was being prepared for the diffusion of Christianity. This new spirit was injurious to the power of Rome, but advantageous for the future development of Europe. It helped on the decline of the empire, but it was also the beginning of the transformation of the ancient into the modern world. Hadrian is the first great representative of this new spirit. The last months of the year, 117 A.D., were occupied with ordering the affairs of the East. The Parthian question was settled, as has been already said, by unveiling Trahan's conquests, abandoning the cause of Parthamatis and recognizing King Krosos. In order to retain the new conquests, it would have been necessary to increase the army, and the financial condition of the empire would not have admitted such a step without an increase of taxation. Moreover, under Trahan's military reign, too little attention had been paid to eternal administration. These considerations alone were sufficient to move Hurion to adopt a totally different policy from that of his predecessor. The danger of extending the frontier may have also been brought home to him by the reports which arrived of disturbances breaking out in remote corners of the realm. The Britons in the far north, the Samaritans on the Danube, the Moors in the west, were all saving signs of rebellion, while the rising of the Jews in Palestine and Libya, not yet completely arrayed, was in itself an adverse comment on Oriental expeditions. Hadrian probably visited Palestine and Egypt himself to hasten the suppression of the Jewish revolt, which was carried out by his able officer Q. Martinus Turbo, he apologized Catilius Severus to the post of Legatus of Syria, which he had occupied himself before his elevation to the Principate. He removed Lucius Quietus from the governorship of Judea and sent him to his native land, Mauritania, apparently in order to quell a revolt which was breaking out among his countrymen. But Lucius, who was by no means well disposed to the new emperor and disliked the change of policy, showed no energy in crushing the movement or perhaps encouraged it. At all events, Hadrian found it necessary to send Turbo, who had already suppressed the Jews, to suppress the Moors also. 
and we are told that he disarmed Lucius Quietus. Hadrian traveled by way of Illyrium to Rome, which he reached early in 118 AD. He was favorably received by the Senate, to which he now renewed in person the respectful overtures which he had already made by letter. The title, Pater Patrix, was offered to him, but he refused it, on the ground that Augustus had received it at a late period of his reign, and did not accept it until 128 AD. He celebrated the Parthian triumph of Trajan, the image of the dead emperor being born in the triumphal car. Hadrian was not long at Rome before he had to hurry away to the Danube Bay to meet a Samaritan invasion, and during his absence his throne was threatened by a con piracy in which four men of great distinctly were implicated. The leader was a consular named Avidus Nijinus, whom the empire seems to have regarded with special favor, and perhaps intended to choose as his successor in the Principate, besides another consular, Panibulus Celsus, two officers of high military reputation, Cornelius Palma, the conqueror of Arabi, and Lucius Quietus, who had ere eighty displayed a disloyal spirit, in Maretta Ia, took part in the plot. The implication of these two generals suggests that dissatisfaction was felt in military circles at the peace policy of the new emperor. The intention of the conspirators was to kill Hadrian when he was either hunting or performing a sacrifice, be it in the plot, was discovered, and the senate showed their zeal and loyalty by ordering the four conspirators to be put to death. When the news of the affair reached Hadrian, he paced the conduct of affairs on the Danube frontier in the hands of his trusted officer, Marcius Turbo, had hastened back to Rome, August. He regretted the execution of the culprits, which was an unpopular act, and although the Senate had acted without consulting him, he was blamed for it to dissipate the feelings of alarm which the occurrence had caused, and to show that terrorism was not to be the policy of his reign. He voluntarily took an oath never to pass sentence of death on a senator, as Trajan had done before him. During the next years, Hadrian seems to have devoted himself to internal reforms in Rome and Italy. In 119 AD, he was consul for the third and last time, and in the same year he undertook a journey through the southern Italy in 121 AD, having laid the foundation stone of the Temple of Rome and Venus, April 21st. He started on his first great journey through the provinces, as he intended to be absent for a considerable time. It was necessary to leave the control of Rome in trustworthy hands. The safety of the city lay with the commanders of the Praetorian Guards. Hadrian had not full confidence in Atanius and Similis, the two prefects who were in office at his accession. Atanius had given him support at the critical moment when his installation as princeps was doubtful, and on that account might have proved presumptuous, while Simulus was a man of independent ideas. Accordingly, they were removed, and Q. Martius Turbo, along with C. Septicius Clarus, appointed in their stead. Hadrian undertook two great journeys through the provinces. The first began in spring 121 A.D., and ended with his return to Rome at the end of 126 A.D. The second began in spring 129 A.D. and ended with his return to Rome early in 134 A.D. On the first occasion, he visited almost all the provinces of the empire, both western and eastern, but on the second occasion, he only visited the eastern. This was probably due to the outbreak of the Jewish rebellion, which recalled him to Judea, as he was in tracing his path to the west. 131 through 132 A.D., so that at this point his second long absence from home ceases to be a provincial tour. Besides these two great journeys, he undertook in the interval between them a lesser journey to the African provinces. 128 A.D., the exact route of his first journey, is not in all respects certain, but it seems to have been as follows. Having made a progress through eastern Gaul, and probably visited Lugundinum, he proceeded to the province of Upper Germany, and thence along the northern frontier, and Resetia, and Noricum, into Pandonia, returning doubtless by a different route 
through these provinces. He reached the Rhine again, proceeded the lower Germany, and passing through the laurel of the Batavians, crossed over to Britain, 122 A.D. Having remained there for some months, he returned to Gaul and traveled through the western regions of that country to Spain, where he visited Taraco. A revolt of the Moors induced him to visit Maritania, though this perhaps was not part of his program, and thence he went on to Africa, and possibly to Libya. Crossing over to Asia Minor, he first visited the cities on the coast, and then traveled through the interior to the Euphrates, 123 A.D., returning by the coast of the Exuine, he traversed Pontius and Berthiana and Bithynia, and crossed over to Cyrus. Once advancing through Macedonia, he received successively Epirus and Thessaly. In autumn, 125 A.D., he arrived at Athens, where he spent the winter and spring, and made a tour in the Peloponnesus in the following summer, whence he returned to Rome, taking Sicily on the way, 126 A.D. His second journey began by a second visit to Athens, where he spent another winter, 129 through 130 A.D., then he sailed to the south coast of Asia Minor, and landing in Syria or Lycia, traveled through Placidia and Cilicia into Syria, reaching Antioch by June. In the same summer, he visited Palmyria, Judea, and Arabia, and proceeded in autumn to Egypt, where he spent the greater part of the year. Returning to the latter part of 131 A.D. to Syria, whence he set out for the west, Phi has been recalled by the Jewish revolt, and spent two years on the scene of warfare. These imperial visits may in some cases have been burdensome and expensive to the provincials at the time, but there can be no doubt that they conduced to the prosperity of the subject lands. The emperor saw with his own eyes the condition and needs of each province, and also the exact importance of each in relation to the rest of the empire. We cannot trace all that he did in the correction of abuses, or in furthering the economical interests of the land which he visited, but we know how he tried to secure the indispensable condition of peaceful development, namely the satisfy of the emperor against invaders. Hadrian never lost sight of this end. His care in providing for it was exhibited in two ways. He introduced a number of vital reforms into the army and the military system. He developed, with more consistency than any emperor before him, the method of defending the frontiers by artificial means. The military reforms of Hadrian went into the minutest details, and he may be considered the originator of the military system of the later empire. His changes affected both tactics and discipline. His great reform in tactics was the introduction of the phalanx, not exactly the Macedonian phalanx, but an improved form. The necessity of superseding the old legionary battle array seems to have been proved in recent warfare. Hadrian directed all his officers to study carefully the tactics and the MS of the barbarians, Parthians and Armenians in the rest, Sarmatians beyond the Danube, Celts and Britain. He also introduced oriental armor and heavily armed cavalry. His Batavian squadrons were so well drilled that they could swim across rivers in panoply. Improvements were made in the military engines with a view to facilitating the rapid motion of the army. Hadrian found that the discipline of the camp had degenerated, and he spent the greatest pains in restoring it, and made it stricter than ever. He increased the number of centurions and only allowed those to be appointed who were of strong body and good character. He admitted none to the legionary tribunate who were not of mature age. Leaves of absence were rarely granted, and everything that, that could have an enervating effect on the soldiers was removed from the camps. But notwithstanding his strictness, he was very popular with the men, and there was not, not a oe mutiny throughout his peaceful reign. This was due to the fact that he shared with the soldiers their exercises and privations whenever he visited the camps and required of them to undergo no hardships, which he was not ready to undergo himself. His dress was severely simple. 
his repast consisted of the same plain food lard cheese and sour wine as that of the legionaries themselves on the march he used to walk or ride in full armor and bareheaded amid the snows of caledonia or beneath the hot sun of egypt and never made use of the vehicle he concerned himself with every detail of military life he used to visit the ambulances every day used to attend to the commissariat and inspect the arms dress and baggage of the soldiers on coins he is often represented as addressing his legions at lambasis in africa where he founded a new camp of which the presturium or general's quarters still stands a pedestal has been found on which is ascribed a speech which he delivered to legion the third augusta he praises the soldiers for their performance of the most difficult exercises for executing in a single day works which would employ others for a week for their sham battles and other achievements other no emperor was the army in more efficient condition than under hadrian in regard to the fleet hadrian introduced the regulation that all the marines should possess ius latinum thus no roman citizen whether italian or provincial could serve in the fleet the service was only open to those who possessed latin rights or those who possessed neither roman nor latin rights the latter received iva latinum on entering the service end of chapter twenty six sections one and two recording by chris caron ham lake minnesota